This story is one that my dad told us when we were younger. I think now, having read a lot of Reddit threads and posts and having done a lot of research, that his story is about a skinwalker. Either way, it's very interesting. This happened in central Wisconsin, when my dad was not even a teenager yet. Wisconsin was even more rural back then, and the area has since become more of a city. But anyway, to the story. My dad and his friend grew up country and always walked the woods and trails and swamplands, etc. Not much else to do, but my dad said that he and his friend were walking a path in one of these spots one day, and this black cat kept following them. Anytime they stopped to look, the cat stopped and looked at them. He said that they tried to use stones, etc., not to hurt it, just to scare it away, but it never got scared. And after a few minutes, they started walking faster, but the cat kept up. Apparently, they both got a very bad feeling, and they decided between themselves to not even look back anymore. As soon as they decided that, they started walking again. That's when they heard this dark, evil laughter. They turned around to see a man in super old school, all black attire, walking away laughing into the brush. So they freaked out, obviously, and ran away. This was the original story, but last year my dad told me something that I didn't know. My grandpa was friends with this other old guy who lived around the area, and I guess my dad knew him and would stop by. After this cat thing, my dad came by one time and started telling this story. Apparently, it freaked the guy out really badly. He said that he had been outside doing whatever one day, when all of a sudden this pure black dog came by and just started staring him down and then growling. The guy had a super uneasy feeling and started backing up to his door. Apparently, the moment he turned his back, he rushed in and slammed the door shut. In that instant, the dog had lunged at the door, barking and scratching like crazy for a minute, and then it all went silent. That's when this guy said that he heard this evil laughter and looked out the window to see the same guy that my dad had seen, all black old school clothes from like the 1800s walking away laughing and then disappearing. My dad swears to this day that he didn't make it up and he doesn't usually tell anybody. I know he hates me sharing it because he thinks it's so unbelievable. He doesn't like people ever thinking that he's dishonest, but I believe him. So I wanted to share his story. I have a story to tell from when I was a young kid. I'd say this occurred around 2006 to 2008. I haven't told many people about this because it's absolutely insane, but it did happen. So here goes. My mom and I went camping in the woods of northern Wisconsin. When we arrived to the campground, we were the only people there, which was weird by itself, sure. Everything went semi-normal until our tent filled to the brim with spiders and we ended up sleeping in the car. It was about two to three in the morning and I was wide awake because I was just restless, almost paranoid that somebody was out there in the woods. I looked out of the left rear window when I saw a large portal open. I don't know how else to describe it. I couldn't believe my eyes, so I pinched and kind of slapped myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I definitely wasn't. I could feel the pain. As I watched the portal, it got larger and wider, about seven to eight feet tall. It was bluish green, almost like Rick and Morty, ironically. Immediately after this, I woke up my mom to see if she could see what I was seeing. 
She did and freaked out a bit. I remember her saying, don't move and be quiet. I saw one humanoid figure come out with a lantern. He looked around and then gestured to the others to come out. I would say five to six people came out. They were all wearing what I would sort of describe as like Amish clothing, and they all had lanterns as well. They gathered around each other and seemed to talk. And then, one by one, they all entered the woods in a single file line. The first man to walk out of the portal was the one to go back into the portal. After he got in, it closed. My mom and I watched as these people walked into the woods until we couldn't see their light anymore. My mom immediately started the car and we left in complete silence. We were silent the entire car ride back to Illinois. Ever since then, both my mom and I have been avid believers of the paranormal and aliens. I'm wondering if anyone has ever seen anything like this before. I know it sounds absolutely insane, but I swear it happened. I might even doubt myself if it weren't for the fact that my mom saw it too. In any case, it was the weirdest thing I have ever seen. So I live in a city named Oshkosh in Wisconsin, and if you've never been to Oshkosh, there are a lot of older things that are still in use. This is especially true of the schools there, and by this I mean the middle and high schools. Now my mom is a teacher in the Oshkosh area school district, and currently teaches at a school named Merrill, which is both an elementary and a middle school, and is one of the oldest schools in the city. She has to go there on weekends in addition to the school week every once in a while to take care of extra grading, classroom management, and things like that. A few weeks ago, my sister and I joined her on one of her extra days on the weekend there. And my sister and I have already had some weird stuff happen to us there, such as hearing footsteps out in the hall when we know we're the only ones in the building. My sister had a balloon in the classroom once come down from the ceiling and basically chase her. So she and I are already aware of the paranormal tendencies of this place. Anyway, the three of us walk in with me being a six foot one, 160 pound male first, because apparently that makes me the expendable one. And we start walking up to her room, which is on the third floor. Now, it's necessary to mention that her school has limited access to each of its separate areas, so middle school teachers can't easily get into the elementary school and vice versa. It's necessary to mention that because as I walked up to her room, I was struck silent and motionless by a figure that I saw standing in front of me, walking away from me. The figure then turns down the next hall to the left. I turn back to my mom to show her where the figure had turned. She said, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's a dead end hallway. Anybody who went down that way would have quickly noticed this and turned around. Yet nobody did. We stood there for a short while to see if anybody came back. Nobody ever did. When I say figure, I don't mean some trick of the light. As a lover of the paranormal, I am also at the same time one of the most cold-hearted skeptics you can imagine, because when I experience something, I want to exercise the possibility of it being anything else before coming to the conclusion that it's paranormal. I have thought of everything, be it a trick of the light, a shadow, something passing over a nearby window, but nothing makes sense to me based on what I saw. The only light emitted in the area was by the overhead lights, which clearly showed a very tall, well-built figure 
of indeterminate gender or skin color walking away from me. There were no windows nearby to cause an illusion like a passing vehicle. The possibility that it was someone who needed something down a hallway or a janitor needing to clean the hallway had also crossed my mind. So I made my mom question everybody with access to that area during the weekend to see if anybody had been near that section of building, but nobody had. My sister also confirmed that she had seen that figure too, so it couldn't just have been my mind playing tricks on me. This experience sticks out in my mind, but the part that still brings tears to my eyes and raises goosebumps on my skin is the sound that we heard with it. It was like a wail like a cry, this scream almost. The thing about it is that it was a very windy day and there was wind whistling through the halls of this old building, but then the wind stopped and the screaming continued. It wasn't only the wind. My mom has been in that building a lot of times with wind and without, and she said she had never heard a sound like that before. This is a recollection of a campout I had a few summers ago. The exact details have started to become fuzzy, but I'll try to relay it as best I can. It was Boy Scout Camp, Northern Wisconsin. There's maybe a little over a dozen of us, some scout leaders too, all within a little clearing that makes up where one of many troops are set up. Two boys to each tent. My best friend and I from very early childhood are tent buddies. And on maybe the third night at this camp is when all of this happened. I remember falling asleep pretty normally. It was dark and I wasn't the last one to leave the campfire after dinner. My friend and I were both in our sleeping bags on opposite sides of the tent, our bags at our side and our hiking boots right by the door, carefully removed when we entered the tent. I woke up to strange sounds, hard breathing or maybe soft grunting. It was the dead of night, two to three AM must have been. I'm frozen and I look around at the walls of the tent, but nothing seems amiss, just this heavy, low, breathy sound. I see that my buddy is awake at this point and we're both frozen, terrified. He opened his mouth to say something but I put a finger to my lips, like the shh gesture. Behind his head, right where he's laying, something is brushing up against the tent wall, poking into the fabric, almost in the shape of an antler. My friend sees it and lets out a small gasp. Something pokes through the tent suddenly, sharp and black, not an antler. A loud exhale, and then whatever it was just steps back. We hear branches crunch and twigs snap, fading into the distance. We stayed awake for another hour, in hushed whispers trying to rationalize what just happened. I asked if we should check outside the tent. Neither of us remember falling asleep again, but we must have, because we woke up in the morning. The hole in the tent was still there, along with three to four similar ones on various sides of our tent. By the time the other boys in the camp were waking up, I had the courage to check around the tent to see if there were footprints or broken twigs, something, just to determine what had been outside of our tent. Well, I found something. Behind our tent, I kid you not, were bare human footprints. They circled around our tent several times, but they never led to or from the tent. Just three to four rings of human footprints in a loop. Whatever it was that happened, whatever it was that was there, 
My buddy and I talked about it a few more times on that trip, but ever since, we won't speak of it to each other. My fiancé and I had just left Ripley's Believe It or Not in Wisconsin Dells, and he was getting hungry. Being that I only survive on antiques and Advil, I wasn't in such a hurry to find him any sustenance. I popped open Chad Lewis's book entitled Paranormal Wisconsin Dells and Baraboo that I had just picked up from Ripley's, and I began to thumb through it in the parking lot eager to find the next stop on our New Year's Day adventure. I settled on the old Baraboo Inn. I'll let you do your own research about it, but I wanted to share my own personal encounter there. Because unless Mr. B.C. Farr is a master electrician with a trick kill switch behind the bar, and there isn't, I absolutely believe that we had a bona fide paranormal experience at Wisconsin's most haunted tavern. According to Google, OBI has a fantastic menu. Depending upon which reviews you read, the food is good too. We set off to Baraboo and found the beautiful stately building easily enough, located at 135 Walnut Street. We went inside and all was quiet. I immediately started looking around, taking in the scene and after a beat or two, we were greeted by an enormous black lab from the back room and a man's voice excitedly welcoming us in. Before I was able to pinpoint where the voice was coming from, a smartly dressed jovial man in probably his 50s popped out from a door behind the bar and asked how we were doing and what brought us in today. I told him we were looking for a drink and a menu and he informed me that they no longer keep a kitchen but he would be more than happy to make us a drink. He said, do you know where you are right now? I laughed and told him that yes, we picked this place out of a book to sightsee, and he proceeded to tell us that we were in the most haunted tavern in Wisconsin. As this conversation transpired, he had begun making our bourbon sours and the jukebox had queued up Hey Tonight by CCR. I was watching him generously pour our drinks and I could see both of his hands for the duration of our exchange. Just as he took his thumb off of the soda gun, the jukebox quit. Just stopped, dead silent in the middle of a song. We all looked over to the old row that was still all lit up, but the number display was flashing zeros. The bartender, who apparently was the owner as well, turned his full body toward it and exclaimed, now, what did you do that for? That was a good tune. He turned to me and said, you just got to talk to them. Welcome to my world. He went back to finishing my fiance's drink, handed it over to him and held mine for an extra second. He was eyeballing me, probably because I was still looking at the jukebox display. I'd never seen an older one like that just error out before and I found it unusual. He said, that's never happened before. Are you a sensitive? Pardon? I jolted out of the sinking feeling I was having at not fully understanding what had just happened and I hadn't realized he was talking to me. Are you a sensitive? He asked again. Do you believe in ghosts? I hesitated, not wanting to make a mark of myself and I responded, oh, um, uh, kind of. Well, don't matter. They believe in you, he said. I haven't heard not a peep out of them all day until just now. They're responding to you. Either you're a sensitive or you brought something in here with you. You got some kind of energy. With that, he handed me my drink, waved away my money, and whisked us all to the gangster back bar, as he called it, to watch the episode of Hometown Haunting, that just happened to have a feature on Baraboo and the old Baraboo Inn. It was a really neat experience and that place is certainly invaluable for its historical significance alone. But if you ask me, 
My final summation is that they don't serve food, but they certainly got some kind of energy. BC Far knows how to make a good stiff one. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82, the one right beside the nature trail at Jellystone Park in Lorry, Virginia. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until we had gotten home. As it turns out, my sister, who was eight at the time, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason, to find a tall man standing by the bed, with his arms crossed, and an angry look on his face. At first we thought the figure was my dad, and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then we realized we could see straight through the guy, to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see the man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was, and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, You don't belong here or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at cabin C82 is something we reminisce about often, but we've always been curious if anyone else has experienced anything similar. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Lori, Virginia and experienced something paranormal, we would love to hear your story. Bonus points if it happened in cabin C82. This experience happened to me a couple of years ago, and I never found an explanation for it. However, my dad recently found someone on Reddit with a very similar story to mine that happened around the same time and in the same area. I reached out to that person, and they said that I was the fifth person to reach out, saying that they had experienced something similar. So I figured I would share my story and see if this has happened to anyone else. Some friends and I had gone camping up in a canyon in Utah. This was in 2020. Some creepy stuff had happened earlier in the night before I made it to the campground. So we were trying to relax, wind down and have some fun like we had planned. We were in high school at this point. So we were doing stupid games like truth or dare and whatnot. It was four friends, our friend's dog, and me. There was only one other group somewhat close to us, a couple and their dog, who set up their tent a few yards away. They weren't close enough to interact with us at all, though. My friends and I were staying up and talking, laughing, etc. When at some point it sounded like somebody's car alarm went off, maybe five to ten miles up the canyon. The next campsite was pretty far away from ours. We didn't question the sound and went on talking until we noticed that the sound had gotten noticeably closer. It happened so gradually that we didn't notice it at first until it sounded like it was just a few yards away. The noisier we were, the closer it would get to us. As we whispered amongst ourselves about what could be making the sound, it came closer and closer. Finally, the noise was literally just outside our tent, mere inches away from us. None of us dared speak or move an inch in fear of compromising our safety. When we became quiet, so did the noise. After we were dead silent for a few minutes, 
the noise started up again and began to once again go farther away until it sounded like it was about 10 miles away again. This all happened in the span of 10 to 20 seconds. As the night went on, we heard the noise travel from campsite to campsite in almost no time at all. It didn't go away completely until about three o'clock in the morning. We tried to stay pretty quiet for the rest of the night. All in all, whatever had made this sound traveled the span of roughly five to 10 miles in the span of five to 10 minutes. After that one time when we quieted down, it started up again and then it went back to where it started. That was about 20 seconds of it. Either way, this thing was going like a mile per minute. It wasn't a vehicle because there was no engine sound along with it, no headlights. It wasn't human because there wasn't a single footstep or twig crunch, not even when it was right outside our tent. It made zero noise aside from the beeping. It didn't sound like any animal that any of us knew about and it traveled way too fast and was much too loud to be any animal, at least any we have around here. We originally thought that the sound was either a vehicle or a machine of some kind because of the consistent pattern of the beeping. However, when we stopped to listen to it for a while, there was a brief moment when the pattern got slightly off tempo, but it sounded accidental and then it quickly returned to the beat. This led us to believe that something was imitating the sound of a machine or a vehicle. We considered everything from weird nocturnal birds to pranksters with an air horn, but nothing added up. We ended up waking up the next morning at 5 a.m. to pack up and leave. The other campers who were sleeping a few yards away from us were already completely gone by the time we got up. This leads us to believe that whatever was messing with us that night had messed with them too. I wish we could have seen our friend's dog's reaction to what happened, but he had already fallen asleep by 8 or 9 p.m., long before the beeping started. It started at about 11 o'clock or midnight, and that dog can sleep through anything. I recently got together with those same friends and brought up what happened that night. One of my friends said that when the rest of us fell asleep, the same thing happened again. But instead of a car alarm, this time the sound was a crying baby, traveling at the same speed and distance as before. And according to her, it circled our tent a few times before fading off again. The people who were camping closest to us did not have a baby. Oh, and one other detail. We were less than 50 miles away from Skinwalker Ranch. My parents got divorced when I was 12 and my mom moved us into a small town in the Pennsylvania mountains. After a few months of living there, I went back to live with my dad in Texas. Ever since, though, I have heard the voices of people I know calling me into the woods. It's been almost eight years now. It's only when I'm alone, but every time I'm alone, and it seems to only happen in Texas. It's weird, but I never even considered that this was maybe something to be concerned about until recently. It was just something that happened. It was almost normal. I even followed the voice once and only thought it was kind of weird that I had heard my dad screaming at me when he hadn't actually called me at all because I got home later and I asked him about it. I don't know if this is related or not, but remembering this is what inspired me to tell this story. A few years ago, I was about a mile out into the woods in Pennsylvania when I kind of zoned out for a minute. I zoned back in and I heard a stick snap. I looked over to see a white tailed doe staring at me from about 10 feet away. 
It looked almost as though it had been trying to sneak closer to me when I looked at it. I just kind of backed away from it and went back down the mountain. If you're familiar with deer at all, you know this is very strange behavior. Usually, the deer are the ones that run. At the very least, they freeze, but they certainly don't try to sneak up on you. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this now, but looking back on all the times that I just sort of brushed off as normal, I'm starting to think maybe there was nothing normal about it. My husband at the time and I had been married about a year when one of his friends told us that they were buying a house. Their rental house would be available and the rent was very reasonable. His wife's parents knew the owner of the house and he was fine with us moving in. We said yes, since we were happy to leave our small apartment. My husband told me that the house was pretty nice. He and his friend's band practiced there all the time. Weird stuff started happening right away. I worked and went to school during the day, while my husband was a working musician, so he was gone until very late. I woke up in bed one night, and I heard the front screen door spring squeak open. Oh, my husband's home, I thought. He put the key in the lock, opened the door, and quietly let the screen door shut. I was still in bed as I heard him walking across the living room, so I called out hello to him and told him he doesn't need to be quiet because I'm awake. He didn't answer, so I called out again. The house was quiet. I looked at my cat, who was in bed with me, and she was on high alert, sitting straight up, eyes wide, staring at the bedroom door. I don't know how long we hid out in the bedroom, but some time later, the screen opened again, and it was all louder. The door unlocked, and it was my husband this time. These events happened quite a few times, but sometimes it was just footsteps. There were often crashing sounds in the house, like a broom handle hitting the floor. Cabinet doors would be opened, and small appliances would be turned on for no good reason. We started unplugging everything when we weren't using it to avoid this. Guests, and later roommates, also experienced the same things. The house had a reputation with the neighbors, who called it Tragedy House. Once, I was sitting at the table in the kitchen, and a tall black thing flew from the wall behind me on my left, through the kitchen, and out the outside wall. It happened in just a second, but I remember thinking it had to hit that wall. But it didn't, it just went straight through it. The house's owner, our landlord, told me that his wife had died while they were on vacation years earlier. She fell down some stairs, leaving him with three small children. He said that she loved this house. He would always say, I can still feel her here when I come in. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. I feel creeped out even typing this story. I'm staying at my friend's house in Tennessee over winter break, and tonight I helped her feed the neighbor's dogs because they were out of town. Her house is in a somewhat rural area. There are clusters of homes kind of spread across fields, forests, and lake areas, all very beautiful and full of lots of wildlife. It's about 9 p.m. and it's way past sunset. It's quite dark and we're walking the short distance from the neighbor's house back to hers. We are on a road but directly next to us is a small wooded area sloping down to the lake. I'm a little nervous about it, so I make a joke like, that forest is kind of creeping me out. 
Imagine if there's a skinwalker out there. She laughed and gobbled like a turkey loudly into the forest. Jokingly, I said, don't do that, it'll attract one. Not five seconds later, we hear an identical gobble back to us from the forest. It was definitely not an echo. There was no light out there, no paths, and it was very cold, like 30 degrees. I can't imagine anybody would just be hanging out in the woods on the off chance they could mock somebody. What's weirder is that it sounded like her. It sounded as though somebody had recorded her voice and played it back. I just remember saying, oh my God, and then sprinting as fast as I could back to the house. I don't think I've ever run so fast or with so much intention in all my life. I didn't turn back and I was so out of breath it hurt. My friend thought the whole thing was funny, but I didn't. It was so freaky. Did we see or encounter a skinwalker? Or was it something else? Back in the mid 80s, we were traveling through Tennessee on our way to visit friends in Texas. My mom was driving. I, a teenager at the time, was navigating by using a paper map. These were the days before cell phones and GPS. We made it past Nashville on I-40 pretty late at night. We're maybe an hour outside the city. I'm charting our progress, old school with pencil and paper. We pass an exit and I mark it. A minute later, a summer thunderstorm hit. Visibility dropped to nothing. All traffic slowed to a crawl and we decided to pull off at the next possible exit and just find a motel to spend the night because there was no way we were making any significant progress in this storm. Slow white knuckle driving ensued. An exit loomed up on the right. No signage that we could see in the downpour, but we took it. At the top of the exit ramp, we turned right toward a brilliantly lit up gas station. The left turn was onto an overpass crossing I-40, no lights from that side of the interstate. At this point, we were on a dinky little road. To our right, there was the gas station, which we were rapidly passing. To our left and back behind some trees was what looked like a motel, but you couldn't make out the sign very well in the rain. We drove past the gas station before we realized that the road just ended up ahead. The gas station was the only building on this side of the road. It went from one and a half lane paved to one lane gravel. We could only see a short way ahead. Tire track, dirt, and grass all over the space of maybe 20 yards. Now we were past the gas station. There was only one turnoff from this road and it was on our left. We took it and tried to back up and turn around to get back to the gas station. Unfortunately, the paved slope of that narrow driveway sized turnoff led steeply down into a huge mud pit. No backing up off of it. Mom put the car into low gear, turned hard, and headed back for the gravel road through the mud. We almost made it out, but we got mired. The front passenger tire caught on the corner of an exposed concrete storm drain, maybe three feet from the road. We got out of the car and into the rain and mud, and we walked to the gas station. The place was spotless, super bright, and had two young men behind the counter. What sounded like one of Elvis's songs was playing on the radio inside. The attendant's first words on seeing us walk in were, did you get stuck in the mud? And they said it super enthusiastically, like a way too happy greeting, like a Disney staffer welcoming you as you walked into the park for the very first time, that kind of happy to see you. Also, these night shift clerks were dressed in suits that looked about 30 years out of date. The whole place was kind of creepy. We admitted we had gotten stuck, and we asked if there was a tow truck company we could call. They pulled out a phone book, again this was before cell phones or the internet, 
and started talking to each other. It wasn't a Nashville phone book, though. Some little township. A population that couldn't have been more than a hundred from the handful of white pages. But the book had dozens of yellow pages of nothing but tow truck companies. If you're unfamiliar, white pages were people and yellow pages were companies. There were literally hundreds of tow truck companies for this town too small to appear on the map. The attendants had a friendly debate about whose turn it was to come get a car out of the mud. They decided to skip over the company who was theoretically next because there had been some sort of problem with them the last time they were called out for a tow. They made a decision about who to call and let mom use their phone. More weirdness, creepiness intensifies. It was still storming, though less now. The tow truck arrived maybe five minutes later. Brilliant white, not a speck of dirt or a drop of mud on it. I have seen vehicles in a new car lot that were dirtier than this thing. Two young men in the truck were also dressed like they had just stepped out of the 1950s. Freshly polished patent leather shoes without a drop of mud on them. Starched white shirts, paper hats, bow ties. We hiked across the street and next door to the mud pit where our car was stuck. The tow truck guys were horrified. They almost got out of the mud, they said to each other repeatedly. The subtext from their shocked tone was clear. No one must ever, ever escape the mud pit on their own. These people would have to take some sort of action to make sure no one else got as close as we did to escaping. They towed our car out. Easy peasy. We all went back to the gas station and paid the tow truck drivers for their service. The drivers let the gas station attendants know that my mom and I almost made it out of the mud on our own. The attendants were horrified and shocked by this. By now, we were getting really big Uncanny Valley vibes from all four of these men. And not just them. The whole place was too clean, too brightly lit, too strangely out of date. It was a surprisingly good facsimile of a small town rest stop populated by real humans, just in the wrong decade. Almost perfect, in fact. We were definitely in creepy town. If these guys were human, there was something seriously off about them. If they weren't, they almost had their ordinary human act down pat. The tow truck drivers went off and the attendants turned all super friendly again and asked my mom and I if we were going to stay the night in the hotel across the road. They got so excited that we might spend the night here. They talked about how great it was. Mom and I made non-committal noises and returned to the car. On our way back, I said, we are not staying here tonight. She agreed wholeheartedly. The rain is finally letting up, so we were really excited to get back out on the road. We drove straight back out onto the interstate. Didn't pass go, didn't collect $200, didn't even go near the Creepy Towns Motel parking lot. We drove down I-40 to the very next exit. It was maybe five miles. We pulled off and spent the night in a kind of crappy but refreshingly ordinary motel. At least it's not the Bates Motel, we joked. The rest of the trip went really well. Several days later, on the way home, my mom and I decided we really wanted to see this creepy town in the light of day. I mean, it couldn't have been that weird, could it? Heading back up I-40, we passed the exit where we actually did spend the night on the way down. We could see the hotel, the exit number matched the notes, everything. Then we started looking for the next exit. The exit to Creepy Town. Should have been about five miles along with an overpass. Five miles pass. No exit, no overpass. Five more miles later before we find the next exit off of I-40. It's the one I had marked as being right before the storm first hit. In short, Creepy Town doesn't exist. The exit doesn't exist. The gas station doesn't exist. I've traveled I-40 many times since, often remarking, hey, there's that non-existent exit where the weird storm hit and we went to Creepy Town. And then there's the exit where we actually did spend the night. To this day, and we've looked multiple times, 
we have never found Creepy Town Exit. In fact, we've never found a single exit between those two points ever again. I have no explanation. During my childhood, I had family who lived in Saudi Daisy, near Chattanooga, Tennessee. One of them told me a story of how, as a girl in the 1930s, she had seen the famed Black Track Ghost. When I asked her about it, she told me the story. In the early part of the last century, a beautiful young lady was forced to choose between the pampered life of a well-to-do daughter in Chattanooga and the dirty, boring life at a Saudi Daisy coal mine. She is known as a Black Track Ghost, which is so named based on the scattered coal that's found over the train tracks in the area of the mines. The young lady, who was the daughter of a local Chattanooga doctor, decided to marry a handsome clerk at the Saudi Daisy mining office. Outraged at the mismatch, the irate doctor disinherited his headstrong daughter. After a few weeks of marriage, though, the young bride apparently grew bored with life with her shantytown clerk and was instead attracted to a rough-and-tumble miner. One night, the mining office was robbed and the clerk was brutally murdered. The unfaithful bride and her miner disappeared and weren't heard from again, at least not in the usual sense. Sometime later, the body of a young, unidentified woman was discovered in a lake in an adjacent county, apparently the victim of murder herself. No connection was ever made to the runaway bride, until her image began to plague the Saudi Daisy miners. The first encounter was reported by a hardened coal miner, walking home on a bitterly cold winter's night. As the crippled man struggled up the deserted street, he became aware of somebody quickly approaching him on his right. His silent companion, with hair dripping wet and dressed only in a thin white slip, glided past him. Even though he recognized the specter, she stepped by without acknowledging him. The miner was mesmerized, noting that his breath was like a fog in the cold, dark night, while her rigid lips emitted nothing. The black track ghost visits became a common occurrence in Saudi Daisy. When she wore a long flowing white gown, local residents believed she was just wandering. But if she appeared in her gray slip, which was apparently her death shroud, she foretold doom. If she stood outside somebody's window, a fatal tragedy would befall the unfortunate homeowner. Although the Black Track Ghost is best known in Saudi Daisy, her spirit continued to echo her desire to exist in two worlds. Her father's home was near Walden's, the old Civil War hospital, located near East 8th Street and what is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. The friend that I knew said that she lived in that area as a little girl. The child witnessed the Black Track Ghost many times as she stood and looked sadly into a nearby doctor's home. When the little girl spoke of it, she was slapped and told not to tell lies, but she said that she was only telling the truth. She was just observing the sad shade of a woman who was visiting the comfort and luxury of her father's domain with the knowledge that she could never return home again. Another haunting that went hand in hand with this and occurred simultaneously happened to those living near the coal mining town. They experienced something unique. A pair of glowing eyes would appear in several of the local houses on a fairly regular basis. After a while, nobody was even alarmed. It just became accepted. A young bride got the life scared out of her after waking up to see the ghost roaming her bedroom. Folks just laughed like it was nothing out of the norm. The haunting stopped sometime around the mid-50s, though, and nobody's heard from the ghost since, and nobody really knows why.
not dear. For my college screenwriting class, we were split into groups, four students each for a group project. The assignment was to select a myth or legend to base a 10 to 15 page screenplay on. My group thought it would be interesting to choose a cryptid for the project rather than a well-known historical myth or legend. Our teacher cleared us for the idea and we started brainstorming. Of course, we didn't want to do the most well-known cryptids, like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, so we started looking up some lesser-known ones. One of the ones that somebody pitched was known as the Knot Deer, in some cases the Night Deer. According to people's stories, it looked almost exactly like a large deer, but something felt horribly off. Only when they drove away did they realize what was specifically wrong about it. Still, even before they understood exactly what was going on, every story mentioned the overwhelming sense of wrongness. Quoting someone else's personal account, quote, it was a deer in the way that a graveyard is a playground. You can treat it as such, I guess, but it won't feel the same, end quote. Lo and behold, after a bit of research, I found out it was located in North Carolina. Not only that, but it was just over an hour away. Just about every written or publicized story of the Knot Deer supposedly took place in Boone, North Carolina and its surrounding areas. I informed the group of what I had discovered and, being spontaneous as I am, told them I would be driving out to the location that very night. I figured I probably wouldn't come across anything, even though I was legitimately curious. At the very least, it was something interesting to do, and I'd be able to accurately describe the location and ambience of the area to the main screenwriter. I wasn't able to convince the other three members of my group to go with me. They all had their legitimate reasons, and since I made the decision to go so suddenly, I understood why none of them wanted to go with me on the trip. Still, I had nothing else to do that night, and I had been itching for more travel ever since the entire pandemic started. I filled my roommate in on everything and asked if he wanted to go with me. At first, he told me that he would just consider it, but as I was getting ready to go, he told me that he had decided to tag along. One of his main reasons for doing so was that he felt like he had to go with me. I shrugged it off, not thinking much of what he said. After filling up my car with some extra gas and buying a couple of snacks for the road, I plugged Boone, North Carolina into my GPS and I headed out. My roommate and I were pretty relaxed for the majority of the ride there. We joked around, listened to all sorts of music through the radio and CD player, and had some of whatever snacks we had bought earlier. Eventually, we got close to Boone. That's when we started to feel like something was off. It wasn't a feeling strong enough to make us want to turn around, but it was worth mentioning to each other. When we got into the city, it was just about what we imagined. Gas stations, car dealerships, dollar stores, and small cafes. All of them were closed at the time, with our arrival in Boone being at around 9.10 p.m. But all of them were well lit and unintimidating. My roommate told me that we should probably head back at about 9.30 and that he would let me know when that time came around. I agreed with him since I didn't want to spend too long searching for an experience. Needless to say, when we didn't come across anything by 9.30, he decided to let us keep going for another half hour. The clock in my car's dash had been broken for a while now, and I couldn't look at my phone while I was driving, so I was totally reliant on him for the time. Had I known that we were going to be driving in the area past 9.30, I probably would have mentioned it and turned around sooner. Had I done that, I would have completely missed the experience we ended up having. I'm still unsure whether or not that would have been a good thing. We ended up in Tennessee by 9.50. That's when things started to get really bad. At this point, we rarely came across any other cars on the highway, 
We took the first exit we saw and ended up driving along more mountainous, forested roads. This meant that there were lots of tall, dark trees, almost no streetlights, and twisting roads that forced you to slow down. My roommate said he started to feel bad about the whole situation, and I agreed wholeheartedly. Still, there was nowhere to turn, so we continued going straight, since that was really the only option for the time being. A few different times, we got a serious sense of dread, but usually that feeling disappeared by the time we got onto the next section of the road. There were a couple of times that the both of us had started to tear up, not because we were sad or upset, but because it felt so wrong to be there, like it was somewhere we were not supposed to be. The feeling of dread was very particular too. It wasn't feeling bad in the sense of depression or anxiety. The best way to describe it is just that sense of wrongness. It came in waves, not sticking around for a long time, but not going away entirely either. By this point, my GPS had stopped working entirely. Both my roommate's phone and my phone said that they had full bars, but mine simply refused to connect to anything. Luckily, his GPS still worked fine, so he plugged in the directions for home. It continued taking us down that road for a while longer. The area started to become much more forested as we went on, and the road started to twist and turn much more than it had before. Basically, we had come across the exact area where you would expect a monster to be. We started to feel really, really bad. I don't think I can express the feeling well enough with words, but it was the worst we had felt so far. But we knew something wasn't right. We both felt like we just weren't supposed to be there, and we felt like we had to get out. Since my roommate started getting truly spooked, that put me on edge even more, since he never gets scared by anything. There wasn't much we could do about it, though. The GPS still wanted us to follow the road, so we both awaited its next directions, eager to get on the highway back home. The sense of dread still came and went with every other segment of road that we crossed. Eventually, the GPS wanted us to turn. My roommate told me to turn right on that road. I knew he meant to turn right onto the road and follow it straight ahead, but for some reason I figured we should just turn around and backtrack. I started slowing down, and we both started to feel the absolute worst we'd ever felt. Like, things are very wrong and something was about to happen. My roommate said that my eyes were glazed over, and I kept saying something along the lines of, I just need to turn around right here, over and over. The more I said it, the quieter I got, until it was just, I just need to turn around right here. Keep in mind that I am normally a fairly loud person, and I had been loud the entire drive up until this point. I pulled off onto a gravel dip on the side of the road. Along the gravel dip was a thin chicken wire fence, shiny and silver. Back on the road behind us was a wall of dirt and rock. We were surrounded by tall, dark trees that blocked most of the night sky. Even with the headlights on, it was very difficult to see far ahead. He said very forcefully that we couldn't stop and we needed to keep going because he felt really bad, but I wasn't listening to him. I wasn't quite processing what he was saying, and for some reason I was having a difficult time hearing him at all. After he realized he wasn't getting through to me, he broke into a literal shout and told me that we had to get out of there. We could not stop, and we could not go back that way. It took him using his road rage voice to snap me out of it and get me to speed down the road. The only word I can use to describe what I felt in that moment was absolute terror. Even as I was slowing down, I felt it get worse and worse until it was almost overwhelming. I only realized that after we had gotten out of the area and back onto the highway. As we passed through the area and started getting into the city again, the looming sense of dread started to fade away. By the time we got onto the main highway, we felt safe again. 
but in the moment that I pulled off onto the gravel dip on the road, where I had almost stopped the car entirely, that was the most terrifying experience I've ever had in my life. I would bet my life savings that had we turned around, we would have seen something that we never wanted to. Both of us admitted to tearing up as we drove off from that spot. I was much more shaken up than my roommate was, and it took me a little while to fully process what had actually happened. I think it's safe to say that even though I didn't explicitly see anything for myself, I found exactly what I was looking for. East Tennessee is known for its ghost stories and storytelling in general, as is common in Appalachian culture. The Cherokee felt connected to the region spiritually, and the Europeans that replaced them have too. Just look up the legend of the Wampus Cat sometime. Here's my own set of stories, all in relation to Johnson City, as I am originally from that area. In college, before any of my friend group could drink, we got wild hairs and decided to go ghost busting, as we called it. This usually involved us loading up into a vehicle and cruising through the hollows and hills of East Tennessee. We had done our research, be it on the internet or in local ghost story books, and found quite a few places to explore. The first of which I'll mention is the Exit 27 ramp off of I-26 near Irwin. Legend has it that a group of high schoolers were killed by a driver while coming off the ramp one night, many decades ago, after prom. Now their spirits watch the ramp, pushing vehicles back up the ramp and away from the bisecting road. I can personally attest to this experience. If you go at night, and there usually isn't any other traffic, you can stop your car on the bottom of the ramp and put it in neutral. Doing so will make your car roll back up the ramp. The second place is also near Irwin. It's called Bumpus Cove. From what I can remember, there were several stories about this place, including a Confederate cemetery with ghosts. We could never find it, and the GPS kept taking us to a house. Those poor people. We did, however, find a family cemetery with a paved road around it. Legend had it that if you drove around this cemetery on a full moon three times, a ghost jeep would chase you down the mountain. This cemetery was very isolated and near the Cherokee National Forest. I don't think we ever managed to do this on a full moon. We still got scared, though. Since the cemetery sat on a hill, we would see illuminated crosses poking up around the graves. Under a night sky, it's pretty horrifying, even if it's not overtly paranormal. The third story I will share is of the Job Cemetery in downtown Irwin. The cemetery is located in town, but sinks down into a creek and heavily forested area. I believe at the back end there's a large, or once was a large, railroad yard. Well, legend has it that the ghost of a murderous homeless person, who apparently was killed in a brawl in Irwin, haunts the cemetery. We explored the cemetery numerous times, but never saw much once again. It was very creepy and unsettling to go back down into the back of the cemetery, so close yet so far away from the living world. Another story we found was about an abandoned old house called Gwendolyn's House, which sits off Bristol Highway between Piney Flats and Elizabethan. This house was allegedly haunted and tales of it can be found, or could be found when we looked years ago, on topics. I don't really know the backstory, but we went to it on several occasions and got scared out of our minds. The house sat on a one-lane road, possibly called Kuntz Road or something, and was literally falling in. Two people in our group were brave enough to check it out, but another guy and I stayed in the car. The one in the car with me was a friend who boasted about believing in ration and logic and obviously didn't believe in ghosts. Well, he ended up having a panic attack in the car and swore he was seeing an old lady in the upper story window, rocking in a chair, looking and pointing right at him. 
I think the most infamous ghost story of East Tennessee is the Sense of Awe Tunnel, which last I checked was closed off to the public. Much information can be found about this online, and people can tell it better than me, so it's worth reading the backstory. The tunnel is haunted by the ghost of a person who abducted and drowned a child in the creek running through the tunnel about a hundred years ago. You can hear a baby cry in the tunnel, which we believe strongly we did on numerous occasions. An omen for death, at least in those parts, is a black dog. There was also a legend that we came across of a black dog roaming the highways. Well, one night after visiting the tunnel, we were driving out of the old back road that the tunnel was on, and I almost hit a black dog. This was a narrow, one-lane road, and it sat near the Holston River. The mist was up, and I couldn't see the dog until the last second. Luckily, it didn't get hit. It must have jumped out of the way at the last moment, or simply disappeared into thin air. But either way, East Tennessee is creepy. Today I went to the same place I've been twice before. I mean exactly the same place, identical in every way. The thing is, every time I've been there, it's in a different state. The first time I was in Alabama, off Highway 10, between the state line and Mobile in 2012. The second time was off Highway 55 in Mississippi, north of Batesville in 2015. This time it was in Tennessee, off Highway 65 near Spring Hill. I have moved around a bit, and I've definitely gotten a sense of deja vu before, but that's not what this was. I mean this place is the same in every single way. The same long curving exit off of three different highways, a left turn at a desolate three-way stop, leading to a small single-story building on the right side of the road. The building doesn't look that old. Definitely a newer construction, but there's nothing really else around it other than trees and farmland. The lobby is the same. The furniture and its layout are the same. When brought back to an office, it feels like it wasn't really meant to be an office because there are three doors. The one we enter through, and then two behind me leading to other parts of the building that I can't really see much of. Maybe a copy room and a break room or something. On the desk, there's the same pink stapler on the corner. The same garbage can that looks out of place along the wall between the two doors. The only thing that's ever different are the people. The first time in Alabama, it was a staffing company that I was interviewing with. It stood out because it felt so out of place. I had never been in that area before. I was 100% sure I was lost and about to be the main character of a true crime show. The second time, in Mississippi, it was an occupational therapist that I was sent to see because of a work-related disability. It felt very eerie, but I chalked up all the similarities to coincidence. I mean, how else do you rationalize that? Today was the third time, in Tennessee, and it was a legal office. I had an appointment with a lawyer for a consultation over some financial matters. As soon as I walked in the door, I was ready to leave. This was no longer just a coincidence. I knew I had been there before. For the third time, everything was exactly the same. Only the people were different. I have never been more uncomfortable in my life. The whole thing felt wrong in every way. I got the meeting over with as soon as possible, and I will never go back there again. But who knows when I might walk into that building once more. Just somewhere else. Has anyone ever experienced this? Is it some kind of a glitch? I'd really love some answers. When I was a kid, 
I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both parents worked full time, so I was often sent over to stay with my grandparents, who had a plot of land in the vicinity of, but not right in, Mossheim, near Greenville. Both of them had been in East Tennessee for their whole lives, and that area for a good many years. They had been established at their home for some decades before this story and remained there a good time after. Recently, I had reason to return to that area in Tennessee after having spent the majority of my adult life in Minnesota. Being in and around the area, driving the same roads, made me reminiscent about my lazy summer days tucked away at my grandparents, learning to shoot on the same 22 with which grandpa had taught mom, feeding fish at a neighbor's stocked pond, or spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the back porch. When I relayed this to my mom, she in turn told me a story about a time that I scared my grandpa half to death, then lied about hanging out with Bigfoot. At first I had no idea what she was on about. Then I remembered exactly what actually happened with startling clarity. New context given by the experience adulthood provides. And no, this is not about Bigfoot or a cryptid. Before we start, some information about my grandparents' land. Their house was on a small hill surrounded by a grass lawn. The lawn gave way to a smallish hay field and then the wood line. Those woods lasted for a good half mile to either side of the home and a good several miles to the back. I hated the hay field because it was too pokey to play in, but I liked to hang out in a creek that ran behind it. To get there, I would walk to the edge of the property, just in the wood line, to avoid the hay. While at my grandparents, the only rules were that I stayed where I could see the house, so the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere that I went. I didn't take the whistle, seeing it as a badge of my regrettably young age, and the best part of the creek was out of sight of the house, that was the only stretch where it got deeper than my knees, and thus the only part where I could swim. Naturally, I spent much of my time in that water splashing around, skipping stones, and being a kid. One day, I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone. It was a man, a stranger, on the bank watching me. He had long hair, a beard, and pale skin so dirty that it was stained. I couldn't tell his age and simply thought of him as old. I have no better guess now, as he clearly went through long years of hard living. He wore no shirt, no pants, only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist that I thought of at the time as a Moses dress, thanks to some illustrated Bible stories. Around his neck, there were multiple necklaces made from knotted tatters of cloth, fiber, and string. In those knots were various pieces of bones, flowers, a bit of dark glass, things like that. When I first saw him there by the creek, I was terrified, terrified, frozen still. The man, however, was smiling. He gestured from his squat with an outstretched arm, fingers down, in kind of a wave. I didn't react, startled and reeling. Then he splashed at me, still smiling. He did it again. I splashed back, and soon we were playing. We both threw water at each other. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw rocks into the water, and so did I. I pushed him, he pushed me back. We carried on for some minutes, until my grandma called for me. With her voice, a switch had turned off. The man stopped in his tracks, gaze fixed back toward the house. Then, as my grandma kept on hollering, he looked to me. He crept back to his side of the creek, barely disturbing the water, then slid into the brush, completely silent the whole way, holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight, I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone, and I said no. She became very tense, asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer. I didn't know how. 
Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, grip like iron the whole time. At the house, the real inquisition began. I didn't really have new words, the event and this reaction overwhelming my ability to explain. Such silence further irked my grandma and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting patriarchal judgment. Around an hour later, my grandpa came home from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again with talking. I told him about the man, hairy and old, dressed like Moses, about how we played and he disappeared. I remember that they digested this for a few minutes before sending me to my room and I was happy to go and happier still that grandpa didn't yell like he usually did when I misbehaved. Later, I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with grandma, but grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench, looking out over the hayfield turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and put them next to his shotgun. I knew that that was odd for the gun to be out of the closet. Previously, we had used it to shoot bottles. Some I would throw into the air like they were clay pigeons. These escapades were accompanied with speeches about how the gun was dangerous and only for adults to use. He went through my story again, his tone deadly serious. Eventually, he asked me how hairy the man was really. I told him very, thinking that this was the right answer. He asked where, and I told him everywhere, like a bear. He ruminated on this, and I grew more nervous worried that I was in trouble or causing trouble, just wanting the trouble, whatever it was, to end. So when he finally asked me to swear, in the name of Christ and on my mother, that I was telling the truth about everything, I said that I had been joking. He finally yelled then and sent me back to my room. The family memory became that I had hid by the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time, everybody was upset with me, and I was forbidden from going back to the creek or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, was lackluster. Even so, for a time, I didn't go there. In my memory, I stayed away for a very long time, but I'm sure it was only a few days. That hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary-aged self. When I did start going back to the creek, I took a bucket of toys and a thick stick plucked from the woodlands on the way. I think I was conflicted about what to do if the man came back, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him, or both in turn. When he did show back up, he appeared next to me as I dozed under a tree on my side of the creek. I was once again gripped with terror. He was not smiling, his face expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long before I smelled him. I scrambled away, leaving behind my stick and toys. Coming to my feet a yard out, I stood in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. Eventually, he crouched and started to look through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys one by one, only to toss them into the dirt. It became too much and I started to lecture the man, telling him how he got me in trouble and he was a weirdo and he stank. At some point, he stopped looking through my things and calmly watched my tirade. Face still neutral, eyes analytic. Once I had concluded my lecture, I sat back under the tree to pout. I remember the man made a noise, a grinding kind of snort. And when I looked over at him, he was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my bucket. I wanted to laugh too, but I was more determined to stay sullen. Once everything was out of the bucket, he put one figure, Ghidorah, back into the bucket. He then stood to his hunched fullest, took the bucket by its handle, and began to make his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree until he turned, said something, not a word that I knew then or know now, and gestured with a forward sweep of his hand. At first, I didn't comply, despite knowing that he wanted me to follow. 
After a few moments, he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again more emphatically. With this further prompt, I did get up and come along, the man making approving noises and putting on his smile again. We went into the woods. The man led, but he was naturally quicker and quieter, making it hard for me to keep up. Eventually, he would stop where he lost me, knocking on trees with sticks and whistling arrhythmically so that I might find him in the vegetation. He never came back for me, opting instead to guide me forward with the noises. I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place behind me. After some time, maybe 15 minutes, we came to a bald. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground, before going into the tree line alone. He returned from a different direction, pulling a sled. It was made from half of a discarded plastic drum and lined with small pelts and smooth bark. On the back half, there rested the fly-covered carcasses of squirrels, possums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. On the pulling end, woven pouches were tied into place on it by the same eclectic cordage that made the man's necklace. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Ghidorah in a pouch. He then called me closer with a glottal noise and a beckoning wave. I saw the sled's pouches held many odds and ends, dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, glass fragments. From one, the man pulled a square made from bound together sticks just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another, he pulled a piece of fool's gold and a small shard of geode crusted with a bit of purple crystal. These he handed to me with an air of busyness and a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the ground for me to sit again. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding that we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at recess. I did not much miss Ghidorah anyway, as he was a bad guy. The bucket was a loss. In retrospect, I think Ghidorah was chosen because its dull gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its obvious ability to hold things. The man came back lapping his thigh. I did this readily. During the hike back, I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times. I did notice that our path was not straight. The man led me one way and then another, making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually came out by the creek, but from a different approach than we had left it. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up on the hill, from far out in the field. The man would not cross the creek, but pushed me to do so. I did, but not to go to my grandma. Instead, I crept back to the house and around the opposite side. There, I laid in the shrubs by our front door, pretending to sleep when I was found. I swore that I had been there the whole time. When I was sent back to my room, I placed my fool's gold, crystal, and charm in my bedside table for safekeeping. The next day, I went back into the creek to pick up my toys. The man was not there. However, throughout that summer, he did visit me again, to sit under the tree or throw rocks at the water or yammer softly to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share, and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat, which I ought not to have eaten, or honeysuckle blossoms, which I would still eat, taken from my old bucket. He seldom visited long and never splashed and whooped like the first time he did on that first meeting. At this point, you might be wondering why I've posted this to Backwoods Creepy and not Backwoods Weird But Wholesome, I guess. Well, that's because there are two more occasions that I want to tell you about. One gruesome, one awful. The eventful one occurred near the 4th of July. I had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek. The man was initially wary of the little fireworks, but quickly came to appreciate their miniature pyrotechnics. He took the box I gave him gratefully, even taking the empty box, likely for the wood shavings, which are excellent tinder. During the use of the bang snaps, I had scared a turtle into the water and to the opposite bank. 
It sat there watching us from the far shore. If you're squeamish about animal stuff, this is probably a part you should skip. The man, after stowing the bang snaps in the bucket, noticed the turtle. With little thought, he scooped up a smooth stone and threw it with force and accuracy into the turtle. He then waded over to retrieve the slider, which struggled meekly in his grasp, one leg knocked off clean. On my side of the river, he took from the bucket a new piece of stone. One side was rounded and fit in his hand. The other came to a flinty cutting edge. Working with deft experience, the man began chopping the live turtle above its neck, pulling up on the shell top. I'll spare you the rest of the details, but the thing struggled and it was horrible to witness. The man rinsed the shell in the river and offered it to me. In wordless horror, I ran. That evening, I came back to shuffle the dead turtle into the flowering waters of the creek. The shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did not deter me from going to the creek or the man from visiting again. However, sometimes he would try to call me away from the creek with thumps and whistles. I would tell him I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions, he would join me. On others, he would leave. The last time we met, we were sitting under the tree sharing cowtails. From the woods, there came whistling and the staccato knocking of a woodpecker. The man looked up and whistled back. There were a few more such exchanges before he stood, collected his bucket, and beckoned for me to follow. I was curious and I felt comfortable with the man as a guide so I did as I was asked. He took me to the bald, a direct path this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to the other in the woods. Waiting for us at the bald was a woman and a child. The woman was dressed the same as the man, topless and wrapped around the waist. She was dirty with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in a similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground and the woman joined him, sitting in his lap but leaning forward so that her elbows rested on her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed to me. The other child would not look up. I didn't know what to do and I didn't speak. The other kid lifted their sack to wipe at their nose. The man made a noise and drummed on the woman's back. The kid looked at them, still hanging her head, hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at what I now figured was a girl lazily, the man echoing her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene, the girl stumbled toward me, stopping close enough that I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin but not emaciated and slightly taller than me should she have straightened up. The man and woman fussed some more and the girl leaned close and pressed her cheek to mine. Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all, only pressing limply against me and breathing so loud that it was all I could hear. During this time, the woman had approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand and delivered a flurry of slaps to the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair into one hand, using the other to sweep back her bangs. The girl was then made to look at me, face bare. One side of her jaw was bulged out, smooth skin over a lemon-shaped bump. Her mouth was twisted by this deformity, her nose faced to one side as if affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye was bulged and roomy, the other, startlingly regular. It looked at me, blank and dark brown. The woman gave the girl's head a little shake, spat off to the side and then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. I fled. There was commotion behind me. I think the girl was pushed to the ground. I did not look back and they did not pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house, my absence unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what had happened, wanting to forget and not wanting to get into trouble again. 
not thinking about the girl, the couple, and what might have been intended for me. I spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents. I begged not to be taken, claiming that it was boring and lonely. Sometimes when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of a bird call on the wind or the distant tapping of wood and hurry inside. My grandma could tell something was wrong and made an effort to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in his errands as he never had before. Eventually, school started. Classes and friends eased me away from the thoughts of the dirty man and the people in the clearing. Time did the rest. I think now that all of the people in the clearing were a family, but their features, white skin, brown eyes, brown hair, are common enough that they all could have been unrelated. They knew each other's signs and signals. They used their own words. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people, wild men, and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways in unlikely places, and that those real people call others kin. And that, through the chain of human connection, even a recluse living in a rundown shack is someone's somebody. I guess I'm asking if the people in my story are somebody, someone too, or if they're known, if their behavior rings any bells, belies any known intention. I figure that wherever this tale goes, maybe somebody will know who they are, and hopefully you won't discount this tale out of hand. Either way, now that I've remembered everything about that time period, I doubt I'll ever forget it again. So this story might be a bit long, but it sure was a fun one. For me personally, anyway, as I rather enjoy these kinds of things. I come from a very religious family, and a lot of us have had paranormal encounters. My grandmother's house was haunted by someone who apparently hung themselves in the backyard many years before they even built the house. To this day, they frequently have priests come in and bless every room in the house. So many of my family members have been able to see things that the regular eye cannot, including me from a young age, when I used to see things in my house which once even drove me to run into a locked door hard enough to get a concussion. That's another story for another day. Anyway, this story takes place around late October of last year. I am a student at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, so most of my friends lived in their own flats around campus, and my one friend, Bianca, had lived in a small one-person flat that was really quiet and small basically a long hallway of a room leading onto a balcony. So we all used to hang out in her room while listening to music, playing Uno, drinking beer, and getting really stoned until early in the morning, as all good students do. We had this game that we called the Universe Game, where you basically just ask the universe a question, and she had this mega playlist of songs, so she would put it on Ultimate Shuffle, and whatever song would play after the question, would be the universe's answer, whatever interpretation you took from it and worked for you. So there had been a couple of nights where we'd been hanging out and the lights would just start to flicker in weird beats. Now, my friends didn't know at the time that I could feel these kinds of things coming before and as they happened. So they just dismissed it as the switch just freaking out a little bit, but this kept on happening more and more each day. Until one night, we were all playing the game again, and when the answer came, the lights acted up again. This time, we looked over to the light switch and saw a faded white hand at the switch, just the hand, flicking the switch. It just disappeared, and the lights went back to normal. At this point, everyone was freaking out, but I was really just kind of excited by it, for some reason, it just didn't feel like a threatening presence. It was oddly playful to me. 
I kept this to myself and just played along with everyone else's reactions. So one night a few weeks after that, my friends were all out of town, and I had a key to my friend's place. I decided I would go over there and stay for a few nights, just to hang out and draw on my favorite couch. It all went smoothly, and I was actually getting some nice work done. I had been playing the universe game a lot throughout this time, and this one night close to 3 a.m., I was drawing and playing the game. I decided to go onto YouTube to find a random playlist to mix things up, because I don't know, I'm a rebel like that. So I find one. I ask a couple of questions and things go smoothly, and as I'm drawing, I suddenly just get a weird surge of energy through me, and at the same time the lights start going bananas. I look down at my phone, and the song playing is called Ghost. I had not smoked nearly enough to make that up, or to see that. Anyway, I jumped up and looked around to see whatever was going on, but as usual, it ended as soon as it started. I must say that this was one of the more pleasant experiences I had ever had in this line of things, and I'm not even getting into my sleep paralysis and night terrors. I've experienced a lot of strange things, but like I said, this one was actually pretty cool and I thought I would share. In a small town in South Africa named Pilgrim's Rest, ghost stories are ever prominent amongst the locals. One school holiday, I went to visit some family who had an old gable house on the outskirts of town. Being gifted with the ability to speak with the dead, I loved going there. I would sit in the fields or near the old railway, as they would show me flashbacks of the town's early days. But that holiday, something terrible was shown to me. Terrible to the point that I have never returned to the town. Not because I don't want to, but more because I'm not wanted. See, I discovered a dark secret of that town, and what I saw left a scar. I was out on my usual night walk through the old children's cemetery which was established during a plague. Most of the graves remained unmarked, but all the years of death say 1886. I loved watching the kids play under the full moon, but then I saw them, the miners. They were walking from a part of the forest that I was told was off limits, but they looked sad. They looked as if they were forgotten. The next day I went into that part of the forest, and eventually after about a two hour hike, I found the miners again. Approaching slowly, I made them aware that I could see them, and that's when they told me the story of their gruesome death. Back in those days, witchcraft and curses still scared people, and the founding families had been brainwashed into believing that the reason the plague hit the town so hard was because they were mining on sacred ground. But instead of following the right procedures to stop mining, they just decided to collapse the mine right on top of all 50 miners. They claimed that it was an accident, and then proceeded to leave the miners buried under the rubble and erased from history. The Girl from Catholic School My story happened in 2013. For some context, I was staying in my grandparents' home, which was over a hundred years old in South Africa. I had experienced other unexplainable occurrences, like waking up one night to have my rosary wrapped around my neck, choking me. This event had left ligature marks around my neck. The strange part is that I had slept in a rosary for years, and I had never had anything like this happen. Other strange things that went on were doors opening on their own, the kind of doors that have handles that require twisting to open. 
The story I'm telling you today centers around this old house. My grandparents decided to sell it, as they were both in their 70s. In 2013, I was alone at home with our housekeeper, as I was studying. The real estate agent showed up to the house unannounced. I opened up for her and out stepped an older Muslim woman. With this woman were two little girls dressed in uniforms that matched the Catholic primary school I had attended many years prior. The one girl had the same fair complexion as her mother. The other girl was definitely Indian and not Arabic. I found this kind of strange, but I figured she was probably just a school friend. I welcomed them into the house and they looked around. As the agent and the guests made their way upstairs, the little girl who appeared to be Indian stared at me as her hand trailed along the banister. Then I went to go unlock the other home on the property where my uncle stayed with his family. Right behind me were the two little girls. They rushed into the house and made their way into my cousin's bedroom. The Indian girl was sitting on the bed, petting the cat who was fast asleep, and the other girl was looking around at some toys in the room. I told the girl on the bed that the cat usually doesn't really like people touching her and that she's lucky. The girl just smiled at me. Finally, the parent and the agent arrived at the flat on the property where we were, so I stepped outside to give them some space. Once they had finished, they thanked me, and the agent, the mother, and the lighter-skinned girl, who I had assumed was her daughter, had stepped outside. I paused for a moment, and eventually asked the real estate agent if she could please call the other girl to come outside so that I could lock up. The mother and the agent looked at me, puzzled. What other girl? They asked. The mom said, I only brought my daughter. I laughed at them and told them that I don't really have time to joke around because I really did need to study for my final exams. Their faces fell. I could now see that they were not kidding. I rushed into my cousin's bedroom, only to find it empty, apart from the cat still sound asleep on the bed. I tried to compose myself as I said goodbye to the real estate agent and the prospective buyer. After they left, I asked the housekeeper if she had seen who got out of the car. She responded that it was just two women and a little girl. I know that I did not imagine this, because I clearly saw her. She had thick black hair cut into a bob, and she had a blue Alice band. The way she smiled at me. This experience still haunts me to this day. I don't know if it was an apparition that followed the little girl from school, and maybe knew that I also attended that school. Maybe that's why she showed herself to me. I really don't know. I have never come up with a good explanation for what that was. I am not new to the paranormal, and strange things happen to me from time to time. I'm an empath, so I think that makes me more open than most. My earliest experience that I can remember took place when I was about 10 years old. A bit of backstory. When I was 8 years old, we moved from Cheshire, England to Secunda in South Africa. It was during the time of apartheid in South Africa in the early 80s. The way of life there was very different to what I had grown up with in rural England. My dad had always wanted to live in the sunshine and he landed a job at Sassel. The company he was working for in Cheshire was laying people off at an ever-increasing pace, as were many other local factories, and I think he was worried about being next. We had been living in Secunda for two years when we moved to Van Nykirk Street a lovely big house that my mother fell in love with. It was the first house we had owned since moving to South Africa. So we packed our meager belongings collected over the last two years and moved from the smaller house Sassel had provided us closer to the center of town. We had a lovely lady who was our nanny and maid named Julie. She had started to work for us about two weeks after we arrived in South Africa and she stayed with us for many years. 
In those days, it was normal to have help in the house. The houses even came with small bedrooms and a toilet in the back garden, known as a kaya. These rooms were not connected to the main house, so the worker could come and go and have privacy. Many of the local house workers lived in the more rural areas, so they lived in town during the week. Julie moved with us to the new house. She was also thrilled at the move, as her room at the new house was bigger and had a bath with a shower. Julie at this point had worked for us for a few years and took care of myself and my little sister while my mother worked full time at a local hotel. Julie was Zulu. The Zulu tribe are a very superstitious people and to this day make use of a sangoma or a witch doctor to cure illnesses and curse people, paying the sangoma for the privilege. Julie used to tell my sister and I about the bad spirits she believed in and the stories of the tokoloshi, the evil dwarf devil that used to climb onto young women's beds and have his way with them, making them have kids and then leaving them to raise the spawn. Lovely. To prevent herself from becoming a victim to this creature, she had her bed up on bricks so that he couldn't climb onto it. Most young women of childbearing age did this, at least if they believed in this thing. One morning, she walked into the kitchen looking very shaken. My mother sat her down and gave her a mug of sweet tea and asked her what was wrong. She blurted out that she had had no sleep that night and that evil spirits were haunting this house. My mother pressed her and once she had calmed down, she told my mother the story. The previous night before bed, she was writing a letter to her family by candlelight. Julie always had candles burning, and my mother was very conscious that one day she would burn down the kaya. While she was writing, her candle went out. She assumed it was a breeze, so she got up and put a spare blanket across the bottom of the door. The kaya did not have any windows, and it was made of solid breeze block so the crack under the door would be the only source for the breeze. She decided to leave the big light on to finish her letter. It was then that she was startled by the flushing of the toilet. It just flushed all by itself. She didn't dare go into the bathroom, but apparently the toilet flushed at least twice an hour all night until about 6 a.m. when it finally stopped. My mother said she would call a plumber to look at the toilet told Julie to take the day off and just sleep. Julie went off to the neighbor's maid's kaya as she did not want to go back to sleep in her own bed. My mother had an emergency plumber out later that day who said there was absolutely nothing wrong with the toilet. He said he had no clue how it was even possible that it had flushed by itself. Over the next few days, Julie calmed down enough to move back to her room. The toilet still flushed and now and then the taps on the bath would turn on by themselves. My mother told Julie that it was probably a plumbing issue and that it wasn't an ancestor or an angry or evil spirit. All was calm until Julie woke up one morning to find her room wrecked. Her clothes were scattered around, ornaments broken. She had slept through all of it. At first, she suspected her room had been broken into while she slept, but when she went to the door, it was still locked and bolted from the inside. Julie refused to stay there after that and moved a few things into her friend's kaya next door. About a week later, a large crack appeared in the wall of the main house. My father was concerned that the house would fall on us with the speed that it appeared and called the surveyor to come out and take a look. He determined that the foundations of the house were faulty and that they needed to be stabilized. Basically, a trench was to be dug all the way around the house and concrete poured in to reinforce the house. The work was urgent, so it started the following week. This was when things started to happen in the main house. Shoes would go missing and appear outside, in a trench, as would keys. The fridge blew up, followed closely by the washing machine our two dogs would bark at thin air, the hairs on their backs up. The toilet in the main house started flushing by itself too. It was then that my dad joked that we had a ghost with the runs. We heard voices in the garden and would go outside and see nothing. 
As the trenches were dug deeper, the reason for all the problems came to light. Out of the holes, the workers hauled broken bits of headstone and human bones. In fear, the workers refused to dig more and left the site. The headstones that were pulled up were shiny, smashed, large pieces of marble, not pitted as you would expect them to look having been underground for a while. I personally don't remember there being any writing on them. I remember thinking that they would have been great for tap dancing on until my mother caught me and told me off. The police were called and our house was officially declared a crime scene. The bones were taken away to be tested. The local press heard about the story and it made the front page of the local paper. My sister and I, posing with a large piece of the gravestone near the trenches, graced the covers. The police sent a team to dig up the rest of the garden and locate all that they could. My mother told me that they found pieces of several skeletons. About a month later, we were given the all clear to fill in the foundation trenches and all the gravestones and all of the bones were taken away by the council. The local police chief told us that Secunda was built over three farms. It was built by the factory for the employees. In those days, farms had family burial plots on them, and the generations of the families who ran the farm were buried there. When the farms were purchased, they apparently collected up all the graves and buried them in one hole. Our house was built on top of it. The police assured us that the remains they collected were relocated to consecrated ground and buried with respect, and that headstones stating the family names of the original owners of the farms would be put there. After that, the strange happening stopped. I hope those souls found rest in the end. We stayed in the house another year after that, but Julie never did come back to the house. Instead, she left and started her own business with the help of my mother. When we moved, she came back to live with us again, her bed still on bricks. I'm a game ranger in South Africa, Mpumalanga, 80 kilometers away from the nearest town in the dense bush. I was off duty that night, the night it all happened, and I went to bed early. My room was surrounded by an electric fence, so any harmful animal wouldn't easily get to me, unless it happened to break through the fence. The area around the rooms are usually fairly safe to walk around if you keep your wits about you. I woke up at about one o'clock in the morning to a pup growling at my window. I had a feeling like I was being watched, so I just stayed still and quiet for about five minutes. I couldn't figure out why my pup was growling. Then I heard it, directly outside my bedroom window were quick, short footsteps and what sounded like children whispering. Thinking it was some of the other staff finishing a shift late and walking past my room or pulling a prank, I told them to shut up and they did, or it did. But then the whispers carried on, this time closer to my window. My puppy started whining and growling and trying to climb underneath my duvet. I grabbed my 303 rifle because things in South Africa are unstable with violence, so it's never a bad thing to carry. I mustered up the courage to yell at these jerks playing a prank outside my window. I quickly opened the blinds to catch them off guard. But I didn't see any people or any animals for that matter. But I did see something short, entirely black, and faceless a figure that immediately ran away at an unnatural pace. Each step was like a three meter glide to the next. The hair on my neck stood right up and tears started to well up. By now, my puppy was aggressively barking at the front glass door to where this thing ran and started howling. I had no idea what had just happened and I wasn't about to be a sitting duck. So I went outside with my 303 and searched the immediate area outside my window. There was nothing. 
No footprints, no dark figure, just nothing. But the next day, I did find random bird feathers bunched up with some twigs with what looked like hair under the tree outside my window. I spoke with one staff member, an African guy who I got along with the most, and I explained what happened. Turns out the locals that night stayed indoors because they knew it was the night where the witch doctors were calling out demons to do their deeds. This particular one was sent to whisper black tongues outside of my window, whatever that is, for who knows what. Apparently it's some kind of spell to get me to leave the area. My buddy told me that I was lucky it ran away and didn't attack me when I went outside. I guess what was supposed to happen was that the thing was supposed to light a fire of the feathers and twigs and hair, and that would be their sacrifice kind of thing for their spell. Who knows? And somehow I interrupted it. I never did validate any of this, it was just what I was told. I said, thanks for that information, I feel so much better. There's a lot more weird things that happened to me out there, but that one was definitely the scariest. Entities in the house. I lived in the house where all of this took place from the ages of 9 to 23. My parents got divorced when I was 14. I lived with my parents, younger brother, and grandma. My younger brother was the first to notice something strange in the house. One night in 2005, he woke us up at about 11 p.m., crying, saying that there was someone outside his window. Living in South Africa, such things are possible, so my dad went to inspect and found nothing. A few weeks later, my aunt, my mom's sister, came to visit from out of town and was sleeping in my grandma's room. She relayed to us the next morning that she was awoken by the door opening and a figure staring at her from around the corner. Fast forward a few years to 2007 and 2008. I would normally stay alone at home whenever my dad would go out fishing with my brother for the weekend. This is when I started noticing odd things happening. Keys would go missing. Lights would be on after I know I had switched them off. Small things, but significant enough for me to take note. 2010 is when things got real. I was in my last year of high school and working part-time for my dad who has an office on the same property as the house. I was working on a file, left it on the desk, and went to lunch. And when I returned, the file was gone. No one else could have taken it, as the only other staff member was the receptionist. About a week later, we found the file one morning just laying in the middle of the floor. That weekend, a friend of mine stayed over in my brother's room, and we came home from a party. It must have been about one or two in the morning when we got to bed. I was already falling asleep when I heard him scream for me. My room and my brother's room share a bathroom with doors on each side. I get to my friend who is literally sweating and I asked him what happened. He said somebody started to choke him as soon as he closed his eyes to sleep, but nobody visible was there. From that day, I would be seeing the man, as we named him, around the property. I've seen him while working on my car in the garage. I've seen him while doing dishes. My father has even seen him while sitting in the garden. I never see his face, but he's always wearing blue overalls, like the ones construction workers wear. It wasn't serious until I got married and had a kid. This takes us to October of 2019. My son is a year and a half old, and he refuses to be in this house. He cries constantly whenever we visit my dad, and as soon as we leave, he's perfectly well behaved. Two weekends ago, my dad had gone out fishing. My brother wasn't around. I had to come feed the cats and switch on the lights. I came in at about 7 p.m. that Saturday night, and as soon as I walked into the house, 
I felt a chill. Thinking nothing about it, I carried on with what I had to do. While in the kitchen, I heard heavy footsteps in the lounge and the breaking of glass. I rushed to investigate, and I found a vase that's normally on the cabinet about five meters away, on the floor, in pieces. I locked up and got out of there. I told my wife the story when I got home, and she suggested that I burn frankincense around the house and read some prayers. Sunday morning, I set out on my mission, and I started burning frankincense and praying around the house. When I got to the office, I had just begun to pray when the glass sliding door shattered. Since then, my son hasn't been fussing when he comes here, and the atmosphere seems a lot lighter around the house. It all happened during November of 2017. I had just graduated and decided to sign up for the school's annual graduation trip to Johor and Singapore. At the time, my friends and I subscribed to very dumb content on YouTube, such as the 3am challenges. I can't believe I used to think that that was legit. When we arrived at the hotel at 10pm, my friends and I that were assigned to the same room decided to push through the fatigue and stay up until midnight to go explore the floor, or in other words, go ghost hunting. The hotel had already sketched me out when I saw the ancient looking lobby and had witnessed the hotel workers warning us not to use the lifts. We had to climb to the 15th floor. Before the trip, we already knew that this establishment had a dark history of side cover-ups. For example, we heard rumors of an unaliving on the 13th floor that caused a whole entire room to be sealed up. It's midnight, and my other friend and I decided to split up to explore both pathways of the current floor. We wanted to go hang out in the lobby, but unfortunately it was pitch black down there. Unsurprisingly, we saw nothing and proceeded back to our room for bedtime. At 4 a.m. I had a strong urge to pee and I was shivering so badly from the cold. So I got up to relieve myself and right when I finished up, I began to go back to sleep when I hear three clear knocks on the front door. I know this was dumb, but I opened the door without looking through the peephole. I swear that if it was somebody with malicious intent and not some kind of paranormal thing, that would have turned out pretty badly. As expected, I didn't see anybody though, so I just coerced myself back to sleep. I told myself that I was tired and I was probably still half dreaming. Turns out I was wrong. As I turned back, it started again, but this time I did look through the peephole because my common sense started to return. Again, nothing. I retraced my steps back to the bed and I tucked myself in while preparing mentally to just ignore the knocks. Another three knocks happened when I rested my head on the pillow. This time, I chose to not even give it a thought. The opposite happened. The knocks became louder and faster. Then they started to become bangs. It was at that moment that I knew that whatever I'd been hunting had started to play with its food. I tried waking up my friends, but to no avail. They managed to continue sleeping while I was slapping and shaking them while something was trying to get into the room. I finally gained the courage and grabbed a chair nearby. I proceeded to stand guard in front of the door. I would go on to pray while getting tormented by whatever was outside until I finally passed out at around 6 a.m. The next morning, the whole squad was asking if I had sleepwalked I tried explaining to them what had happened, but nobody believed me. This really irritated me for like half the day until my friends from another room called us over that night to game. That night scarred me for life. This was the night that we potentially saw a real life possessed person. The teachers didn't allow us to travel between rooms to meet our friends, so we had to sneak over there. 
While sneaking, we saw a woman wearing a pink color baju karong without the tudung on, on the 13th floor. We saw her when we looked down into the lobby. Her face was obscured by the floor's ceiling. She was ramming her whole body onto a random door, and she was levitating. And before we went sneaking, the class group chat had messages regarding students seeing feet floating past the bottom of their room's front doors. Before we realized that she was levitating, we thought it was just some drunk person, but soon started questioning why she would even be drinking alcohol in the first place given the culture. We started recording the situation after about three minutes of whatever that thing was banging the door, but she would burst into a sprint and dashed her way toward the lift lobby on the floor, which is a blind spot. We patiently waited until it decided to reappear. But before that, two Malay women walked past the lift lobby and headed straight to the room that the thing had been banging on. Halfway to the room, the thing in pink starts walking again instead of levitating behind them and follows them right into the room. After that, we tried running back to our room but we realized it was locked from the inside. So we spent the night over in the room we'd snuck over to. I still remember the panic that my parents had when I texted them about it. They told me to delete the footage and kept asking me if I did the room entering ritual correctly. To this day, I'm still tempted to return to that hotel, but my gut is telling me not to. Was it ghosts, mold, our imaginations? I guess I'll never know. I live outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we went on a family vacation to Hershey, Pennsylvania, which was roughly 200 miles away, taking just under a three and a half hour trip. One morning, while I was at the hotel, I decided to take a shower. As usual, I took off my wedding ring and left it on the counter next to the sink. However, this time, in my rush and excitement to get going, I forgot to put it back on after finishing up. It wasn't until I got in the car that I realized I wasn't wearing it. I quickly ran back inside the hotel room and searched every inch of the bathroom, my suitcase, and turned every article of clothing I had worn that week inside out. But the ring was nowhere to be found. Feeling a bit desperate, I decided to leave a description of the ring at the front desk, hoping that the cleaning crew might find it. I tried to reassure them that it really wasn't worth stealing, it was just a simple 14 karat white gold ring with no engravings or anything like that. In fact, I even joked that it might be mistaken for a washer or a nut, understanding if they ended up throwing it out. Despite my best efforts and one last deep dive into everything in that room that night, I had almost given up hope of finding the ring. My wife wasn't too upset considering I had recently lost some weight causing the ring to constantly slide off my finger. I had experienced miraculous recoveries of the ring in the past, like finding it while cutting the grass or shoveling snow, even in public pools and bars, places where it should have been lost forever. So she had suggested that I get it resized anyway, but eventually we decided to just replace it entirely. Fast forward three years and I was doing some spring cleaning in my house. At one point, I took all the cushions off the couch and flipped it upside down to get rid of the crumbs left by my kids. When I picked up the couch again, to my astonishment, there sat my old wedding ring right in the middle of the floor. I verified that it was indeed the same ring I had lost years ago, now too big for my finger. Strangely, it looked exactly like the new one that I had bought from the same jeweler who still had my records and matched it perfectly in a smaller size. The most puzzling part was how, after three years, the ring had seemingly teleported from that hotel to my couch, a couch that I had thoroughly cleaned several times during that time span. I still don't know how it got back to me, but it has become a cherished keepsake with a cool story to go along with it. I 
I work in construction and I go to different job sites every week or two. This past job site was in middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, like literally just cornfields and cow pastures. There's a town, if you can call it that. It's really just a grouping of maybe 10 houses on a quarter mile of road and a single isolated gas station that was another mile down the road. I was on this job site for eight days, Monday to Friday, and then Monday to Wednesday the next week. After work every day, I would stop in at the gas station and get gas and a snack. The inside wasn't incredibly old, probably renovated in the past decade or so, and the checkout was on the left when you walked in. It looked like a normal small town convenience store. The clerk was a younger man who always wore interestingly patterned button up shirts, bananas, colorful lizards, things like that. And I would always compliment him on his choice that day. The gas station was this way for the first seven days that I was there. On the last day that I was on the job site, I stopped into the gas station. It looked the same from the outside, but the inside was completely different. The inside was now a bit more run down and the checkout was now on the right hand side. The laminate floor tiles were chipped and worn. The countertop was faded. There was now a food warmer advertising that they sold breakfast burritos and bean burritos on Wednesdays. The clerk was an older woman with a gray mullet type haircut. Not like it was a style choice, but just like she hadn't changed her hair since 1980. I don't think I went back in time or anything crazy like that because on the counter by the register, there were signs up for the annual 2019 meat shoot. For non-country folk, target shooting competitions where the prize is meat. In any case, I didn't feel out of place or have any weird vibes about it. I was just very confused as to where my cashier friend went and why the store was suddenly pretty shabby. And other than that sign, kind of stuck in the 80s. It was really, really weird. This happened on June 29th of this year, outside the main city of Pittsburgh. My partner and I went to the city for an event and had driven five hours to get there. We were cheap, so we took a hotel about 20 minutes away from the main city in a busy, bustling shopping district. There was a Walmart, Ikea, lots of food places, stuff like that. It was very big and busy, even for nighttime. This was about midnight. We went to the hotel for a bit and then went to go somewhere else, but we needed to go to the gas station first. I looked one up on Google Maps on my partner's phone. Awesome, two 24 hour stations right off the road where we needed to travel. So we turn in, go up a short curved road and pulled into this little spot where the stations were supposed to be. You can't see them from the road, but they were atop a small hill overlooking it. We started to unbuckle and then my partner noticed that both places were closed, not just the store part, the entirety of both stations were completely dark, including pumps, lights, except one street light, which weirdly made everything bluish, and this little diner nearby too. These were 24 hour pumps. We checked after as it was still on the phone screen. In addition, the whole thing just felt weird. Like it legitimately felt as if we weren't supposed to be there. We kind of just sat in awe looking around for a moment then drove out as quickly as possible and went to a different place that was normal. Nothing freaky followed us, thankfully. We had a great time at the event and forgot about this weirdness every time we drove. If we go back next year though, I'm gonna try to find the place again. Maybe there was something wrong with the wires for just those three buildings. Maybe there was something else that needed both of them to shut down completely but the fact that it showed up on Google Maps with the day's average prices, as well as 24 hours open, and when we got there, it felt like we drove straight into the twilight zone. It was all just really weird. Hi 
My grandparents have both passed quite a few years ago, but one of the stories that they told me has stuck with me all these years. Grandma and Grandpa were driving through Pennsylvania to an old family farm. The farm belonged to his uncle and cousins who lived there. Grandpa was a city kid and had visited the farm every summer for years as he was growing up. It had been about 25 years since he'd been, but he loved that farm. And he wanted to introduce Grandma to his cousins and show her around the farm. As they drove closer to the farm, Grandpa began to tell Grandma about the little town that was on the road on the way to the farm. Soon they reached the little town. Grandpa was amazed that it hadn't changed a bit. Toward the end of town, they saw that a hotel was on fire. The road was blocked by firemen using an old fashioned fire wagon with a water tank pulled by horses. They thought it was strange, but they just chalked it up to being rural Pennsylvania. Eventually, the water wagon moved and they could drive by. They reached the farm and after greeting grandpa's uncle and cousins, they shared the news about the fire at the hotel. Grandpa suggested they all go down to see if they could help. The relatives looked shaken. That's when one of the cousins explained that there was no town, not anymore. About 20 years before, the hotel had burned down and the fire spread to most of the small town's main street. After their businesses were lost, people left the town. In fact, the uncle and cousins were the last people living in the area. Grandma and Grandpa couldn't believe it. They had just seen the town, the fire, even smelled the smoke. They and some cousins got in the car and drove back to town, going back the way they'd just come. And the town was gone. Just some burnt out shells of a few buildings remained. When I was a teenager, I went to Pennsylvania to visit a friend and his family over the summer. I was about 15 years old at the time, and still to this day, I cannot forget the bizarre experience I had. It was a regular night and I was sleeping in my friend's room when I awoke having to pee. My friend had bunk beds and I was on the top bunk, so I had to hop down to make my way out of the bedroom and down the hall to the bathroom. I went into the hallway from my friend's room and because it was very dark, I kept one hand on the hallway as I made my way to the guest room door which is located on the same side of the hallway as my friend's room. I knew that if I followed the wall to the guest room door, I could go straight across the hallway to the bathroom door, which is exactly what I did. I get into the bathroom, I turn on the light, I go pee, and when I finish, I look at myself for a minute in the mirror before returning to bed. Everything is normal up until this point. This isn't the first time that I've gotten up in their house in the night to use the bathroom and I have always followed this same routine of following the walls with my hand in the dark. As I leave the bathroom, I do exactly the same thing to get back to my friend's room. I go straight across the hall from the bathroom door to the guest room door, and with one hand on the wall the whole time, I make my way back to my friend's room. This is where things get glitchy. I get to my friend's room and I enter it, but as I enter it, I'm not in my friend's room. I'm somehow in the office next to it. I realize immediately that this makes no sense because I had my hand on the wall the whole time as I had done countless times before. But here I am in the office. The office is not very big. It's a small square room with a closet next to the hallway door to my right as I enter it. Right away, I can see that there is light coming from inside the closet. So I turn and slide open the door. Inside the closet, there are four old TVs stacked one on top of the other. All of them are playing static. I am completely confused by this and I have no idea how I even got into the office to begin with, let alone why there are just four TVs in the closet playing static. 
I shake my head in confusion and decide to just go back to bed. I make my way out of the office, back into my friend's room, and although I'm still completely baffled by what just happened, I basically just go back to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I immediately thought about what had happened, and I went straight into the office and opened the closet. There's nothing in there except for one jacket hanging on a hanger, right above where the TVs had been. I don't recall telling my friend or his family about this experience, and everyone that I've told since always says, well, obviously it was just a dream, which my logic really wants to agree with, but I know that this was not a dream. I recall every single moment from jumping out of the top bunk, walking down to the bedroom door, trying not to make a noise, everything. I remember how black the hallway was, the feeling of the wall on my fingers, every single detail and everything about it was exactly the way it is in real life, except for the glitch. Half a decade back, I embarked on a journey with my church group to a location just beyond the periphery of Pittsburgh. The trip was thrilling to me, an opportunity to be with my friends, and I was absolutely certain nothing out of the ordinary would happen. Until then, I had been skeptical about the existence of ghosts. The concept fascinated me, but it seemed implausible. A bit about our setting. Our accommodation was an eerie old church building that had an unsettling aura about it. I don't precisely recall its name, but it was in a dilapidated condition with revolting bathrooms. On our inaugural night there, my three friends and I were surprisingly given our own room, an allowance typically not granted to those under 18. Being around 15 or 16 years old with no chaperone, we were understandably eager to break the rules and stay up late. Since it was a warm night, we left the window open, and that's when we noticed something unusual. A figure was standing in the parking lot, staring up at our window, despite it being around 2 a.m. We attempted to engage in a conversation with it, but to no avail. It remained motionless. In an attempt to figure out who or what it was, my friends used their iPhone flashlight revealing a chilling fact. This entity had no discernible face. It felt like a surreal dream. The moment we shone the light on it, it vanished. The next day, we discussed the incident with others and heard about a legendary ghost named Molly. Dismissing it as a fabricated tale, we decided it was just our imagination playing tricks on us which was a comforting conclusion. We put the episode behind us for a few days. However, my friends claimed to have heard strange sounds one morning, although they never really elaborated. By the time they heard it, I had already departed. But the tale doesn't end there. We all stayed up late again, secure in our locked room, when abruptly the door burst open. My friend, whom we'll call T, mockingly referred to Molly using some derogatory terms, firmly believing we were being pranked. Almost instantly, the door slammed shut, resounding throughout the room. Panic ensued as the door began to creak open again, prompting us to dash out of the room. It's worth noting that the hallway lights were on, and we didn't see anyone else around, and we would have. We bolted downstairs, bumping into a woman who had awoken, sensing a disturbance. To our surprise, she revealed that she performed exorcisms. Following her advice, we placed a Bible beneath our door and took other forgotten measures to protect ourselves. That night has been indelibly etched into my memory. Several others claimed to have witnessed strange occurrences too, which provided us with some reassurance 
that we weren't losing our minds. Even to this day, the nature of what we saw remains a mystery, casting an unsettling chill over me whenever I recall it. My boyfriend and I stayed at the Hotel Pennsylvania this weekend. It's known for being haunted, and it looks like it fits the part. It's old, and the rooms are run down. When we checked in, we got our keys, and went to our room on the 12th floor. The keys didn't work, so we went down and got new ones. Those didn't work either. A worker there had to let us in, and he said he didn't know why our keys wouldn't work because the key thing on the door was working just fine. Anyway, last night I fell asleep at about one, while my boyfriend stayed up for a little bit. He says that at about two o'clock, I sat up, opened my eyes, and looked like I hadn't been sleeping at all. He said all the hair on my body looked like it stood up. And then I said to him, the door is open, and then fell back down and went to sleep. He said five minutes later, the light on the bedside table next to me turned on by itself. He decided to just ignore the situation and go to bed. He got up early at about 6.15 to go to the gym. On his way, he passed a woman in the hallway that he didn't know. He greeted her, and all she said was, the door is closing now, and continued walking. Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in Southern Pennsylvania, near Maryland. We live in the boondocks, and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring toward my neighbor's house, who lives in the middle of the woods, isolated in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up there for about a mile, joking along the way. Let me give you a little backstory about the place. Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk one night and attempted to shoot bottles off of each other's heads. People died, and the wives of the men who had died burned down the bar and the cabins then were later hanged by the bar owners. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and the people who died in the fires still lurk around the forest. Another incident took place in the 80s or 90s. A teen was driving really fast with his friend at that exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The teen crashed into a tree, beheading his friend believing him alive. The teen was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. This place is destined for bad luck. So we're exploring on this trail, approaching the house. As we approached, we heard a very distant whistle, but we thought nothing of it. As it is spring and it was warm on this day, so there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap. We all froze as a giant branch fell, and then the tree. It was a dead tree that was easy to push down. I looked behind and saw a human figure. As it set in with my brain, I realized that it was a man in ripped, ragged overalls that had no more color, and a worn out, colorless plaid flannel. He looked no older than 40. He looked at us for a while, and then ran at us with a bat-like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran the other way until we got cut off by an electrical fence. Then we turned the other way. By this time, we were way off trail and in the middle of the woods. 
but I knew that all I had to do was go down to get back on trail. By the time we got the trail, we lost him. He looked real enough to us, but whether he was a spirit or a real person, we're never going back up there again. I'm a skeptic, but I used to be obsessed with anything paranormal. I lost interest as I got older. I used to believe anything that I would see on those weird History Channel shows about Bigfoot and UFOs. It's not like I think that any of this is impossible, it's just that I'm much harder to convince now. I try to take any footage or pictures of this stuff as rationally as I can. Usually, the simplest explanation is the explanation. Ironically though, I saw something that no matter how hard I try, I cannot explain. Years ago, I was at a party at a house surrounded by woods, miles and miles of isolated Pennsylvania mountains. I got bored and I asked my cousin if he wanted to go for a walk. As we left the property, we had to go down a pretty deep slope that was crowded by rusted out cars which had been there for over a decade. We found a clearing with a shack that looked like somebody was in the process of demolishing it. And after looking inside, we went back to the party to grab my younger brother. This was back when I was still pretty invested in the paranormal. So before we walked into the clearing again, I got the camera ready on my phone, just in case. The sun was starting to set, and as we left the tree line, I saw it. Something streaked out in front of me. It was a line of small bluish orbs, and honestly the best way I can describe it is like the fairies in Ocarina of Time, except they moved so much faster. They were only there for a second, fading in and then fading out, almost faster than I could react. I managed to take a picture, but I thought there's no way I managed to get that. With the sun going down, we had to investigate the shack quickly. I took a few more pictures of the inside and hurried out of there. When we got back, I looked through the photos, and to my absolute shock, I did manage to get whatever the heck that was. The photo came out strange, though. The photo was more like an elongated blob of bright yellow and white, not what I had seen. Surprisingly, nobody seemed to believe me other than a couple of close friends who were into weird things too. Everybody told me that I was mistaken, and one friend even accused me of fabricating it. The worst one was my dad. This dude will believe any fringe idea or conspiracy theory. For example, he once got a ghost detecting app and was absolutely convinced that his dead cousin was trying to contact him from beyond the grave through a free iPhone app. Of course, he thought I was lying about this, though. I tried to come up with some kind of explanation for what I saw, but I couldn't. I'm not going to say it was a ghost or a spirit, because I would have no way of proving that. Electromagnetic fields can make people see things like that, but that doesn't explain the fact that I had a picture of it, even if it was different. I'm not convinced that it was any weather phenomenon either, since it was a bright, sunny summer day. And fireflies don't look like amorphous blobs of light on camera. Really, all I know is what it wasn't. I guess in true story fashion, those pictures are stuck on a phone and a laptop that no longer work. I am planning on trying to retrieve them at some point. I don't believe the picture had anything to do with the computer or the phone breaking, of course. I've heard people say stuff about ghost pictures causing electronics to stop working, but both of those devices were pretty old, and they didn't stop working until years after I took those pictures. Whether or not you believe me is fine, but I hope you enjoyed the story anyway.
For some backstory, I'm a 26-year-old female. I grew up in a very haunted house. The woods were also haunted. It was in rural Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Our area had a lot of mining and Native American history. The oldest known site of human habitation was just a few miles away. Our house was also built near the portal to an abandoned mine where an accident took place. I've experienced noises, voices, things moving, and figures from a young age. I assume I have attachments. I no longer live in my childhood home. Things have started everywhere that I lived to some extent, but never as bad as there. This post is about where I live now, and I'm hoping to get some advice on what to do, or some possible reasons behind it. Currently, I moved in with my partner, who's a 26-year-old male, last summer. He bought the home in 2020 and says that he never experienced anything, and neither did his roommate. I moved in right after the roommate moved out. It was built in the 50s, no odd history that I know of. It's a pretty quiet suburb, right outside the city. One of the things that happens is that things move. I remember carrying a military duffel bag upstairs while I was moving in, and I stacked one on top of the other. A few hours later, I heard a loud bang upstairs. The top one was on the floor, in front of the bottom one. It wasn't like it rolled off, but more like it had been placed, or dropped. It was upright. A few days later, my folded flag from my re-enlistment was knocked off the windowsill but all the windows were closed, and I checked for drafts. Two weeks ago, I actually watched my partner's GameCube slide over about two inches on our TV stand. It's not plugged into anything. It's just the box sitting there, so it's not like the dogs could have pulled the cables. This was a common theme in my childhood home as well. It got so bad I had to fall asleep with movies on, because if it was silent, I would have to listen to things falling off my dressers, toys falling, things sliding, and so on. Another thing that happens is footsteps. I've heard heavy boot footsteps coming up the stairs and stopping in front of the bedroom door multiple times. It sounds so real that I've actually grabbed my gun thinking someone broke in. The last time it happened, a few weeks ago, my dogs heard it and walked over to the door. They didn't bark, they just sniffed. Most of the time it happens when I'm home alone, but there was one time when my partner heard it too. This has also happened at multiple locations. I've heard the same heavy footsteps that stop at the doorway, at my ex's house, and also an apartment I lived in. I've also seen figures. It was early morning, I was half asleep and I heard the footsteps. This time they came into the room. I thought it was my partner home from work. When I opened my eyes, he was already laying next to me and sleeping. I didn't see anything. Nobody was in the room. When he woke up, I told him about it. And he said that he had a dream that night where someone was in the house walking around and that he saw a figure standing in our room a black figure with weird eyes. He said that he's dreamed about a figure in our room a few times since he started seeing me. My ex also experienced the same thing and would sometimes see black figures or a man with a mustache in the room in his dreams, but only when he was with me. One of my friends also saw a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk in her dream while we were at training a few years ago. We've heard voices as well. My partner has heard me calling his name or saying, babe, in the next room when I'm actually upstairs and didn't say anything. This has happened about five times. It's another thing that used to happen to me in the house that I grew up in. I would hear a woman saying my name in the next room when my mom wasn't home. Last night, I woke up and saw the shadow of my dog sitting upright on the end of our bed. I could see the shape blocking out the light of the TV behind him. I could see shoulders. Sometimes my dog gets too hot and can't sleep and will sit up like that. 
so I reached forward to pet him, and my hand didn't touch a thing. He was actually laying down flat on his side. The shadow was behind him. I didn't have my contact lenses in, so I couldn't see too clearly. My regular eyesight is horrible. I just see shapes. I turned my phone flashlight on, and the upright shadow disappeared. I haven't seen a figure since I lived in the first house, which is why I'm concerned. Little things have always started after I moved in somewhere, but it's escalating faster this time. This brings me back to the mine behind our childhood home. Two months ago, my two brothers, my partner, and I decided to go back to those woods and try to find the entrance. Well, we found it. The portal was collapsed, and they tried digging it out. We found pieces of the old mine cars, and we all brought a little something home. Do you think it could be escalating because we went back? And not only that, I brought a piece of a mine car into our house without even thinking about the repercussions? Now I'm worried. I haven't told my partner about the figure. And now, I'm just wondering what comes next. I'm wondering if anybody has any information about the Omni Bedford Springs in Pennsylvania. I live very close and I used to go there daily to swim. It flooded when I was a child. In the early 2000s, Omni bought it and restored it, while adding on as well. Construction workers reported many strange occurrences. It was James Buchanan's summer White House. It was a facility to hold foreign diplomats during the wars. The springs are known to have healing properties. I have always felt a presence in the old section of the main hotel. I swam laps there for years in the famous pool. One day, they were filling the pool, and the hose was still. They fill it using the natural spring water from the mountain. About 15 minutes later, it looked as if a child was holding it and playing with it, swinging it around. My friend and I always swam together, and we both saw it. And then, we both saw it suddenly stop. On other occasions, we would hear splashing when nobody was in the pool. One time, I felt a huge movement in the water while swimming. Nobody was there, though. We were the only ones there, and my friend wasn't in the pool. We also spotted a gentleman at the top of the stairs to the balcony, where the band used to play for the pool, but nobody was there when we looked again. I have also sat in the library many times reading while waiting on my friend to arrive, or before I hit the road. I would hear sounds. I'm not sure what the room used to be, but the windows are scratched from brides testing their diamonds, I was told. They also have some of the guest ledgers there. All of the things that happened to me were between 3 in the morning and 6 in the morning. Does anybody have any idea what's going on there? I have always believed in the paranormal. As a child, it fascinated me in many different and sometimes terrifying ways. I grew up in a mid-sized to small former coal mining city in Pennsylvania. My house at the time was an older, small, three-bedroom house in a historically lower income area. For as long as I can remember, I have felt the presence of spirits in that home. As a child, I would wake up constantly in the middle of the night, sweating and in fear that something was watching me from the far left corner of my room. That feeling never went away, but got stronger. I never felt alone while living in that home, always on edge. It got to the point where I was late in my teens, still sleeping with the lights on, 
because I was that terrified of the presence that lingered over me at night. In terms of seeing things, the only truly horrifying image I remember seeing was as a child. I was opening up my downstairs bathroom door and I saw my dog as a rotting corpse staring back at me. When I shut the door and reopened it, the image was gone. My dog was alive and totally fine at the time. My dogs would bark at random noises in the house and would sometimes bark at nothing at all. But the animals of my house would never come into my room. They would always whine by the door and scratch until I let them out. I never really thought about that until now. One thing that would happen to everyone in the house was things going missing. Granted, we were a large family in a smaller home, but things were always moving around and never in the same place that we remember putting them. In my room, this was a constant experience that I could never escape. I suppose here I should put a content warning for mental health and mentions of suicidal ideation. One thing that always stuck with me was the way that that house made me feel mentally. Granted, my family dynamic didn't help the situation. It's much better now, but at the time, it was rocky. But the best way that I can put it into words was it felt like something was sucking the energy and life out of my existence. I felt the most depressed and suicidal I ever have in the span of four years while living in this house. During this time, these feelings of being watched and stalked were at their highest. I felt truly and utterly alone, and yet my presence was never alone. A lot of these problems would end up fading, but never really went away. My grandfather would pass in 2016, and since then, the entire energy of my house changed. My mental health improved immensely, and those feelings of being watched felt more comfortable and warming rather than cold and negative. You could feel a shift in the entire home's dynamic, and just our overall moods and emotions were more stable. I felt comfortable staying home alone and simply using a nightlight to sleep. The last time I lived in that house full time was in 2019. I moved away for college and would only go home to visit. I would be home for maybe two to three days with a five day visit for Christmas, but an energy was still there whenever I walked through that door. My friends from college would feel that same energy too. I asked my one friend as we were driving back from Pennsylvania to New York, where we were in college, if she felt like my house was haunted. And without any hesitation, she said, oh, a thousand percent. Let's flash forward to this year. My family moved from the city to the mountains. We're now living in a converted cabin near a lake, three miles off a dirt road. During the day, it's beautiful and serene. At night, it's really creepy. Just darkness. I wrote it off, thinking I just wasn't used to the new environment, since I live just outside of New York City. The first time that I went home to visit the new house, I was only there for one day. The second time, I spent two nights with my friend from college. We slept in the same room, and she would tell me how I would talk in my sleep, something I've never done before. The second night, I would wake up in the middle of the night, shouting full sentences and having the worst time going back to bed. The next morning when I woke up, there were scratches all over my neck and upper back. My fingernails are not long, so there's no way that I could have done that to myself at all. That was back in April. More recently, I went home for three weeks. This would be the longest I would stay in the house thus far. I began to hear the voices of my loved ones clear as day in the middle of the night, despite those people being asleep or across the house from me. That feeling of being watched was back, and it felt more negative than how I even remembered it. I continued to talk in my sleep, to wake up in the middle of the night, drenched in sweat despite the room being freezing cold, and I would always feel uneasy at night. I'm back in New York and nothing has happened here. My family claims nothing weird has happened to them in the house. So I don't really know what to think. 
Am I crazy? Or is that presence back from the past to haunt me? In 2020, I was staying with my sister in her house that she'd had for nine years. I was taking a shower, and when I opened the curtain to get out, I saw the towel on the hook of the door move up and down off of the hook, like it would if you were going to take it off to dry yourself. I was shocked. I had never seen anything like that before. I ran downstairs to my nieces, ages 13 and 14, and they were just laughing. One of the first nights I moved in, I had a dream about me hiding from my sister in a boiler room or basement. I saw that she was burned up like Freddy Krueger. My sister is 40, and I'm almost certain that she practices witchcraft along with our grandmother, in whose home I also experienced weird dreams when I stayed with her a month later. We both stayed in the same room, sleeping, and one night my grandma was in my dream. When I woke up, she did too, just a minute or so later. Hours later, she got on the phone with her friend, and I heard her say, it's crazy where your spirit will travel when you're asleep. She started to talk about the exact same dream I had had. I had never told her about it. A year ago, while living in New Jersey, I currently live in Michigan, I came across a strange news story about a young hiker discovered dead in a mountainous forest. It initially seemed a routine incident, but the circumstances soon proved to be strange. The report indicated that the mountain was undergoing a period of heavy rainfall during that time. The downpour was relentless, sometimes exceeding half an inch per hour and it continued for several days before and during the search for the man. An autopsy conducted by a medical examiner revealed intriguing findings. Aside from a few scratches on his knees, the man displayed no visible injuries or signs of infection. However, the condition of his lungs and airways was alarming. The autopsy report emphasized the remarkable presence of pus in his tracheal bronchial tree. The man was only 28 years old. What's even stranger is that the coroner suggested the rainfall might have contributed to his condition. By the time the hiker was found, he had been dead for three days, and there was no record of him issuing any distress calls. It also hinted that hypothermia was not the cause of death. After this report, there were no subsequent updates about the man's case. It was a startling silence for such an unusual incident. A man found lifeless on a mountain, his lungs and airways filled with an abnormal amount of fluid. Sometimes, I still wonder about what really happened to him. This happened about two years ago, nearing the end of September. My aunt and her friend decided to fly up to New York from Panama to enjoy a mini vacation with my parents and I. Although many strange and paranormal experiences have happened to me ever since I was little, this event stayed with me and affected me more than the other experiences. A lot of things have happened to my family members, especially my aunt and her friend but that's for later. So it was around 10.30 at night. Keep in mind that my old neighborhood was a very calm and quiet place. Since I live near the countryside, not much action happens in the neighborhoods. The neighbors were either elderly or young couples with smaller children, none that really caused trouble around the neighborhood. 
There were only about 20 to 25 houses in the entire neighborhood that I lived in. The three of us decided to stay up late and watch scary movies while my parents slept upstairs in their room. My aunt's friend was sitting near the slide doors leading to the backyard while my aunt and I were sitting in the bigger couch near the front door. I was sitting on the left side where the door faced and my aunt sat on the right side of me, which meant I was closest to the front door. We spent about 10 minutes debating on which movie we should watch. After those 10 minutes, we finally chose to watch Odd Thomas, which wasn't really a scary movie, but it was about a guy who could see spirits and demons. We were only two minutes into the movie when I had the sudden urge to look at the door. I glanced back at my aunt and her friend, only to see them staring at the door as well. I looked back at the door for about five seconds, and then a loud bang came, then another one following after, and then a third. All three bangs came from the front door. It was like five people had just body slammed into the door three times. I thought it was going to fly off its frame. My first instinct was to run to the kitchen and grab a knife. But as I was about to do that, my aunt grabbed my shirt and told me to stay down. As I looked to my right, I saw my aunt's friend with her knees to her chest, rocking herself back and forth, while my aunt just kept her gaze toward the door. While all three of us kept our attention on the door, next to it there were two small rectangular windows on either side. The right window had a small curtain, and the left was being covered with a small decorative tree. The small curtain had a gap in between because it was glued onto the windows from the top area to the bottom, leaving the middle part loose. At the moment of the bangs, it caused the middle area of the curtain to puff up slowly and then quickly press against the window, leaving it wrinkled. After that, we were all silent. All of us were terrified. My aunt denied being scared, but at that moment I could see nothing but fear in her face. I wanted to run upstairs to get my parents, but I was too afraid to go up the stairs because it was right in front of the door. All I could do was text and call them, but they were too deep in their sleep to hear the phones ring. My aunt told the two of us to calm down and dismissed it as wind. We all knew that it couldn't have been but in order to stay calm, she made up that excuse. It was totally cliche. The next morning, I told my mother about the previous events. She brushed it off, saying that it must have been a bear or a deer, another cliche thing to say. We both went outside to inspect and found my mom's decorations near the front of the door thrown off to the side. There were no scratch marks or bumps on the door. Everything seemed normal except her decorations laying to the side. When the three of us looked at the door, the night of the event, there wasn't anything that could have caught our attention. The woods were 40 meters away from the house, and we would have heard the trees moving with the wind if it was that, but we heard nothing. It was so strange how we all felt this sudden urge to look at the door at that time. It was like we all collectively knew that something was about to happen. The bangs were extremely loud and caused me to jump up from the couch. It couldn't have been kids playing a prank on us because I had been living there for about three years and nothing like that had ever happened. Plus, I knew the neighbors well enough to know that they would never do such a thing. There were exactly three bangs, one after the other, and one could have honestly caused the door to fly out of place, but thank God it didn't. What about the curtain? The only explanation that we could come up with was that the impact of the bangs created the wind, causing the curtain to react that way. But why did it inflate slowly, as if the bangs were rapid, and then suddenly cause it to go against the window so fast after they were over? My aunt thinks that the wind must have been knocked off its course, and that's why we didn't hear the trees moving. And it created huge columns of wind that must have caused the doors to move so much, the gust of wind must have gotten inside the house from the cracks of the door, leading to the curtain being puffed up. 
personally, it doesn't make sense, and it sounds like total BS to me. She also mentioned that she saw a shadow outside, but she doesn't have an explanation for that. I didn't see the shadow, though. My mother came up with an excuse as well. She said it must have been a deer or a bear. But why would a deer or a bear bang their head or body into a door? Like I said previously, there were no scratch marks to prove that it was an animal. No animal could have caused those three loud bangs. We've had deer sightings in that neighborhood before, but none have ever exhibited that kind of strange behavior. If anything, they run away from you back into the woods. Bears are out of the question. Not once has there ever been a sighting of them around where I am. I should also mention that we had the lights from outside on. So why would an animal come that close to a house, especially a door, that's clearly being illuminated by a light? Like I said before, the animals in this area are pretty skittish and are generally out of the question. As I mentioned, my aunt, along with my mother, have had many unexplained experiences, and they do believe in the paranormal. I think the only reason they tried to make up an excuse for this situation was to prevent me from becoming paranoid and afraid. It's pretty late for that now, though, since I've had my fair share of experiences as well. My aunt's friend has seen some things, too. My aunt told me that when her friend was younger, she suffered really badly from night terrors. She said that she saw things, demonic identities as she described them. She would wake up screaming and crying. It was traumatizing for her. Her family had always been religious and they prayed for her every night and slowly those things haunting her went away as she grew up. That really creeped me out and led me to believe that she might have brought or attracted that thing to my house. Or maybe it could have been something else. Whatever it was, I hope it never happens to me again. And if you know what it was, let me know. My boyfriend and I went to visit family in New York, and we stayed at the Hyatt Grand Central. I believe that there's a paranormal world due to having experiences in my childhood home. I also know that Grand Central Station is known to be haunted. Our hotel was connected to the station, but I didn't think anything of it. Of course, ghosts can't travel from building to building, or so I thought. It was our last night, and I was asleep. I woke up to the sound of the hotel doorknob moving, as if somebody was trying to come in, but I never heard the door open. I closed my eyes and said to myself, you're just imagining things. I heard it again, and I looked up. When you walk into this room, there's this long walkway, and the bed is to the right. I looked up, and I swear to Jesus and all of his disciples that I saw a man, a tall figure with black eyes, peek around the corner. I screamed, somebody's in here. As soon as I screamed, he disappeared, and I heard the doorknob again, as if he had walked out. My boyfriend jumps out of bed, butt naked, and runs around the room. The door was locked, so I don't believe it was an actual person because hotel doors are heavy, and you can usually hear when somebody opens and closes them. Of course, you can't lock the door behind yourself. I only heard the doorknob move, but never heard the door, so we figured it was a spirit. I later found out that there are tunnels from the hotel to the train station, and many people have died in the tunnels. Beautiful hotel, but I will not be returning. I'm from California, and way back when I was on the college search, 
I realized that I'd likely get to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. My mom and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. One of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last minute decision to stop there, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and worth the stop. So my mom and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old run down overlook of the falls. This overlook was down a hill and through some trees. So my mom didn't want to leave the car on a red curb. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and I did. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. I didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went to the ledge and took some pictures, sat and listened to the water for a while, and then turned to go back up. When I turned, I got this odd feeling, as if somebody was watching me or standing with me. I got uncomfortable and looked around. Nothing appeared to be wrong, so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mom the photos, and realized that I didn't take any video. My mom suggested that I go back down to get a video since we had time, so I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy. I was down a slope, so my mom couldn't see me. I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling kept growing. I got to the edge, took the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of there. I had an intense sense of urgency. I turned around to go back up, and some force stops me dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there, like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Just such dread. I literally feel like I'm going to die. I still can't move and I sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. This thing felt big and so real, but I couldn't get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there, too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Whatever this thing was, it bends down toward me, and right next to my ear, it says, you who I kid you not, when I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and just like in a movie, I went, drive. My mom looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? I said, just drive. She told me later that I was pale and the sense of urgency in my voice told her that she had to get away from whatever I was scared of. What spooks me so much about this story is that I never turned around. It felt so real that it could have been a person, but I was standing right against the overlook. I don't think anybody could have snuck up behind me. And I've also gotten that sense of dread visiting other haunted places. I really feel like it was something paranormal. As for the Yoohoo, it didn't sound male or female. It did sound mean though as if it was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope all of you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what you think this was. I'm going to preface this by saying that it isn't my story, but something that happened to my parents. 
They live in western New York, upstate, and they're very open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens, for reasons other than this encounter. That's a story for another day, though. It might be a good time to add that my parents do not use substances or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance, and intuition goes. I'm just going to copy and paste the text message that my mom sent me about this experience. I thought somebody would find it interesting, or maybe even have an explanation for them. This is what my mom had to say. Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a UFO, or something. Between Randolph and Steenberg, there was a huge, very bright light blinking off and on in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky, except that it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that's not a falling star. I even thought it might be a plane, but it was too bright and too fast, and it was plummeting downward with intention. Then all of a sudden, mid-sky, it was just gone. I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or the trees. Right then I said, did you see that? And at the same time, dad said, what the heck was that? He said that he was thinking the same thing I was. And at the same time, we both noticed out loud, there are no mountains. And there weren't. No mountains, no hills, no trees. It was just cornfields and open space. And this thing just blinked out of existence. The next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky. And it shot directly upward, back into the sky. I was looking out of my rear view, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around, but the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad turned around watching it, and it started to follow us. We had that same eerie feeling that we did when we saw that thing that we thought was Bigfoot. All we kept saying was, what the heck is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. Isn't that weird? When I was 15 or so, a group of my friends and I all slept over at the leader of our friend group's house. This guy lived in the most absolutely rural area of our rural town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out and start a bonfire deep in the woods. So we packed up, got all of our materials and went straight out there. On the way to the spot that we'd be making our campfire at, he told us about how messed up and creepy his woods are, and the numerous things he's seen. White, skinny figures peeking around the shed, staring at him and running off when he looked at it, screaming and whispers from the woods, figures watching him, all that good stuff. It set the mood pretty well. By around seven o'clock that night, we had the campfire set up, and it was pitch black outside as it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire. I can still remember how creepy the whole vibe was that night. You couldn't see a single thing besides the ring of light coming from the fire. Everything else was just a black wall of nothingness, and the sound of the forest was so quiet that the silence was almost deafening. At least it was if we weren't talking. We ended up needing more firewood and a few other things that we were using for the campfire, so the leader took me to go with him to get it. Without a flashlight or any light source, he and I walked the mile and a half long trail back to his house in complete and utter darkness. It was all good, we were talking, joking with each other, having a good time and just hanging out. 
when the first noises started. He immediately made me stop talking. To my left and my right were a bunch of different sounds. Screaming, laughing, talking and whispering, shouting, people saying unintelligible words. It sounded like there was something around 20 people just surrounding us. The natural night vision had finally set in a decent amount and I looked over at my friend who had his head down and didn't say a single word. Known for being a complete goofball and a wild, funny dude, I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look to him that still kind of haunts me to this day as I knew him pretty well and he always portrayed himself as the fearless leader type. Seeing him so shaken up and afraid was very unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, what the heck is that? Before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward, and not to pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said, and the next three minutes or so were incredibly uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach. By the time we reached his house, the sounds had stopped. We both grabbed what we needed in total silence. That's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of that night. No birds, no sticks falling, not a single sound, absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night. It's still my most unsettling and bizarre experience that I have no explanation for and I'll never forget it. When I was a child, around eight years old, I think I had an encounter. I say think, because after another experience I had later in life, it was highly probable. I lived in Lake Orion, Michigan then. The bedroom I slept in was not on the second floor, but it was higher up than the average. When you entered my house, you had to walk up three stairs to be on the main floor. So the windows were not ground level like ordinary homes, and we also had a basement. The window next to my bed was the same height as the others. Ordinary people couldn't look into the window standing on the ground. I would like to guess that it was way over six feet off the ground. One night, I woke up facing the window. My bed was pushed up right against it. It was a reasonably small room. I opened my eyes and my eyes were looking directly at an alien. Where we lived, there wasn't any light pollution, so it was very dark outside. But the way the moon was in the sky, it must have been full or close to it. It illuminated his head, which was entirely in view, and part of his neck. He had typical features of an alien. Big black eyes, white grayish skin, and a small mouth. He had his hand resting on the window with long, thin fingers. Three long and the fourth shorter. At the time, I didn't quite process his height because I was a child. I couldn't really rationalize then. But as I grew older, I realized it had to have been very tall. I remember being very scared. I closed my eyes again, hoping it would think I didn't see it. I rolled away from the window and lay very still. I always told myself it wasn't real. I've only told a couple of close friends about it because it always sounded silly, but as I got older, I wanted to share my story. I worked at a restaurant located in a remote town in Michigan. Do you recall that show Ghost Hunters? Well, they actually investigated our place a few years back. 
From what I've been told, there are two spirits here, a little girl and a man. On my first day, curious about the ghostly rumors linked to the TV show's visit, I asked a coworker about it. As she was leaving the room, she casually mentioned, oh yeah, there's a little girl ghost here. Just as she said that, something knocked the tool we used to retrieve pizzas from the oven right to the floor. Months later, that same coworker shared another eerie tale. She claimed the spirit would turn on the radio even when it was unplugged. I was skeptical, until one particular incident. It was a bustling Friday evening, with karaoke in full swing, making the restaurant quite noisy. Directly above us is an old, condemned apartment, perpetually vacant. Out of nowhere, we heard a series of thunderous steps coming from the ceiling, as if something was charging across that room. Suddenly, an entire stack of full-length hotel pans, each measuring about three feet by one foot and eight inches deep, were violently thrown off the shelf in our kitchen. The resulting clatter was deafening, like a cacophony of stainless steel crashing down onto tile floor. These pans, stacked together, must have weighed around 40 pounds. Just moments before this chaos, I had called out to the manager across the room, asking, did you hear that? About the thundering upstairs. I had this gut feeling that it was the ghost. The restaurant was loud, but the noise above was unmistakably distinct. Before he could even nod in acknowledgement, the stack of pans was flung to the floor. The most chilling part? Our 18-year-old dishwasher was directly in front of the shelf and witnessed the pans being hurled. The shock on her face was something I will never forget. In all, four of us heard the phantom footsteps, one saw the pans being thrown by nothing, and several others were startled by the clamor. Given what I've experienced, it's hard for me to remain skeptical. The only other explanation might be a very elaborate prank, but that seems even more far-fetched given the people that I work with. About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had always expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail and camp spot, as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs and things like that. My family has been going to this spot for about six years and my friends introduced me about 10 years ago. We went on a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well. Except, we did notice a group of people hanging out next to our campsite. Still, they were just stargazing and ended up leaving, so it was weird, but not spooky at all. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high pitched and sounded as if it just kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. That's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped, and then it started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite, but I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m., when it finally stopped. And that was finally when we could get some rest. After waking up, we checked the campsite and saw nothing unusual, so we packed up. 
Once we were packed up and good to go, I started my vehicle, which was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery, and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I got a jump from AAA. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end we both laughed, and we did get some help. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, about 25 miles away from the campsite, about what had happened, and he got really freaked out. He told me about two incidents that he's had, one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance, and he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees, looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside, when they saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that led into the woods. They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be over seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all felt very scared when these events happened. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thought that it might have been a Wendigo. I don't know what it could have been, but I haven't felt that scared before or since. Over the years, several friends and I have experienced an odd phenomenon while traveling around the state. We live in Michigan, by the way. On multiple occasions, we have inexplicably lost hours, and we've never been able to determine why. Sometimes I was alone, and other times a friend was with me. One of the most vivid instances, from approximately seven years ago, still unnerves me. Back then, I was living in Flint, Michigan, with my parents, about a year before relocating to Grand Haven. My friend and I decided to go camping in the Beulah, Frankfurt area, a journey that typically took between three to three and a half hours. We were no strangers to this route. We had made this trip numerous times over the years, especially since my family owned a lake house on Platte Lake and we spent every summer there during my childhood. Wanting to maximize our time, we left Flint at three in the morning, hoping to get in some early morning fly fishing upon our arrival. Roughly two thirds of the way, on M115, just north of Cadillac, a peculiar calm enveloped the surroundings. Now, M115 runs through a national forest, so tranquility is the norm. But this calm was different. It was almost eerie. The early morning sun began to cast its first light, slowly illuminating the surroundings. Before we knew it, we were nearing the US 31 intersection in Benzonia. A glance at the car's clock showed 12 p.m., a detail my friend also observed. Doubting the car's clock, I checked my cell phone which confirmed the time. Even a bank sign we passed displayed the same. The reality was hard to grasp. We had anticipated our arrival around 6 to 6.30 a.m., but here we were, 
six hours behind schedule. Fatigue wasn't to blame. I had had ample sleep the previous day, and with over 120,000 miles driven annually, I was accustomed to long hauls. Plus, both of us were well acquainted with the route. Our gas tank was still nearly full, indicating we hadn't just been driving aimlessly. Checking our credit card statements later, we found no gas charges during the missing hours. The truck's mileage aligned for the expected distance of our trip. What's most baffling is how seamless the time loss felt. We had no memory of any extended stops or detours. Our journey, by all accounts, felt typical in duration, but the clocks told a different story. I haven't recounted this tale in some time, so let me give you a bit of background. Between 2003 and 2005, while completing my college education, I worked the off-shift IT role at a historic federal building in Michigan that operated 24-7. This wasn't just any building. Dating back to the 1800s, it had served various purposes, such as a sanitarium and a hospital. The facility even had its own subterrain tunnels used for transporting supplies and, more eerily, bodies, reminiscent of train stations and old cemeteries. On my shift, I primarily worked in two areas, the call center and a secured communications room. The latter was situated in the building's sub-basement, which previously functioned as a morgue. Even though the comms room operated 24-7, with the lights always on, it perpetually felt as if unseen eyes were watching. The room's sensitive nature meant that no one could be in there alone. During the day, a minimum of three personnel occupied the room, while at night, on my shift, it was just two of us. One particular night, as I was engrossed in my homework, I heard a peculiar noise. It sounded like something heavy, being dragged on the opposite side of my cubicle wall. I beckoned my coworker, who also caught the unsettling sound. We wondered if any unscheduled work was going on, or if someone else was in our secured zone. But after checking, the answer was clear. It was just us. Every door was locked. No one had entered or left. Spooked, we took a brief break outside for our own sanity more than anything else. Oddities were not confined to the comms room. Many reported unsettling experiences in the restrooms, like an invisible hand tugging at their clothes. But perhaps the most unnerving part of my job was navigating the vast gothic structure in the darkness while updating computers. The security guards had a habit of turning off lights in unoccupied sections and I would invariably switch them back on during my rounds. Occasionally, as the lights flickered on, I would see fleeting shadows or hear soft murmurs emanating from seemingly nowhere. While the building bustled with life and noise during the day, masking its eerie history, nighttime was a different story. When it was just me and another colleague, every creak and whisper amplified our fears. For what it's worth, the building is still in use today. However, I've heard that many of those eerie sections are now merely storage spaces, inaccessible to most. I hope that sharing my experiences provided some insight, or at least a good story. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six years or so. It's been so long that I don't really remember it, 
but I know that I lived in an apartment complex near Meyer. We ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and I remember some disturbances at a young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room, so then my mother and I could use it as our room. I was scared to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had separate rooms. My grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. One day, we were taking a break from cleaning the room. We were hanging out in my grandma's room, and I can't remember what it was exactly. Still, my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something that she'd forgotten. It may have been a drink. As I walk toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I have ever heard in my life. It was almost like something out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. The typical answer that a child would always get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. Occasionally, I would hear stuff, see shadows, and feel like someone was watching me. Still, I was never genuinely bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa just messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that things were happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and kept me up some nights. Still, it was always interesting to me because I believed my house was haunted, but I liked to pretend that it wasn't so I could sleep at night. My mom died November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched, noises, and shadows increased, but nothing really significant. I thought it was because my grandma had like six cats, so they were probably just messing things up. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. We played video games, and he in particular loved to talk to me about his dreams because they were so creative and vivid that they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that I closed my bedroom door, because one of the cats would always come in the room and wake us up by licking plastic for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I'm drawn to look at the bedroom door as it slowly opens and an almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room, staying close to the ceiling. As that's happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, no, stop. At this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, most eerie feeling that I have ever felt. I was so afraid, but simultaneously so tired that I just covered my face with my blanket. I eventually passed out and woke up the next day. Everything is seemingly normal. I asked my friend about that night and he said he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. When I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. I mean, he remembered all of them. There were other things I can remember. My dad one night said that he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs to grab some food out of the fridge when he said he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and as he stumbled back and looked, he said nobody was there. But from his face and how sobering of an experience it was, I couldn't see how he would make that up. However, all of us would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us, and I would freeze and look in every direction, trying to find where it came from. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out of the house. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went to the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer. 
almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what seemed to be a month, she passed away. And ever since that day, that house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from 20 to 100. Stuff being knocked over, voices echoing from the hallways and basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right in your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement. The list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house who always told me that when he went downstairs to shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said that he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. However, he was still trying to figure out how I was doing it, until one day he realized that I wasn't, because I had another friend come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair. The friend who had his hair dyed went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing video games. He walked in and said, Okay, how the heck did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were puzzled as heck, until he told us that somebody kept shaking the door handle. My other friend went pale and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all pretty freaked out and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much, and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my home again. Between hearing doors in the basement and seeing shadows, my dad kept telling me that when he was home alone, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which he says drove him back into alcoholism. If you're squeamish about animals, you might want to skip this next sentence. But one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat had died shortly before we moved out. When I say the intensity of these encounters got worse, I mean it. All my friends that came over just said the house did not feel right, and they didn't feel welcome. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, even though by this point all of the cats had passed. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I would get home, I would check to find that pretty much all of the doors were closed when no one could have been in the house. This is all just my perspective. My friends and roommate especially have their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I've moved out and into a new apartment and now a trailer, I have experienced nothing at all and it's been a nice change of pace. I honestly hope to never experience anything paranormal ever again. Some background. I grew up in northern Michigan, about 30 miles southwest of Traverse City. My grandparents also lived about five minutes from where I grew up, and they have a large acreage of woods, about 117 acres. Growing up, and still to this day, they have an old golf cart, and they've created long, sprawling trails in the woods. Somewhere in the middle of the acreage is a field, about two acres, with an old sawmill. About seven years ago, when I was about 13, my sisters, nine and eight, and I decided to go on a golf cart ride through the woods on the trails. My nine-year-old sister sat up front with me, while the eight-year-old sat on the back on a mounted seat facing the opposite way. We drove up toward the field, and once we got through the trees into this area, I drove about a hundred feet in and I saw this figure a ways ahead of me. It was probably 10 feet tall and was human-shaped. Its legs dragged as it walked, and it was hunched over, and its arms looked semi-detached and dangled. Its face was a gaping black hole, but I saw what I thought was a dangling eye. My nine-year-old sister caught it too, and it began to run toward us. 
I whipped the cart around and sped home. My grandpa went out with a gun to the field and found nothing. I have been able to find nothing on this for years, and my sister and I are still terrified to this day. The only legend I know of from up here is a dog man, but it wasn't that. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything or experienced something similar. Maybe it was a skinwalker or a wendigo. I really don't know. Through my younger years, from about 7 to 12, my mother dated a guy very on and off, which I think mostly had to do with him being in the army and staying with his family in Laredo, Texas whenever he was home. Either way, he invited us to visit his cousin's summer cabin in Monterey, Mexico for a weekend, so we did. The cabin was very ranch style, longer in one dimension and shorter in the other so it was built like an architectural rectangle. On one far side of the building, think of this in an aerial view, was the kitchen, and next to it was the living room. Attached to the living room was a long, slender hallway, connected to bedrooms on each side, and a bathroom on one of the sides. The backyard was only accessible through the living room via a sliding door, and what started as a bit of the desert floor, met by a forest's tree line, although there weren't a lot of trees. Mostly it was dead and dying Monterey cypress trees. Meeting the so-called tree line was an elevated hunting tower. Its platform met the top of the vertical tree line. On our way to the cabin, my mom's boyfriend was telling us about a cursed legend of the witches of Monterey. Apparently, they had been haunting the mountainous area for generations and were his childhood version of La Girona. Clearly, he was trying to scare us from the get-go, and me being so young, I was eating it up like candy. We got to the cabin in the late evening, so we decided to stay in for the night and watch M. Night Shyamalan's The Lady in the Water. After the movie, my mom's boyfriend asked me to go get something from the bedroom for him, and as I was halfway down the hallway, he turned the lights off on me. Let me remind you that this was a very rural part of Mexico, so the dark was dark. So with all the scary stories and the, at the time for me, scary movie, I was spooked, and I froze. My mom's boyfriend began to make your stereotypical ghost noises and taunted me to go deeper into the dark hallway. But I was so petrified, I remember just standing there, frozen in fear. Long story short, my mother got onto him and he turned the lights back on. They comforted me, and after a few apologies, we all went to bed. I can't remember how I slept that night, but I honestly wish I did. The next day, we did basic tourist things. Went to a bazaar, embraced the city's beautiful mountain range, which seemed to hug the city, ate authentic Mexican food, and visited the main hub of the city. When the day was all done, we decided to call it and went back to the cabin. What's strange is that I remember the night before so vividly, but I can't remember much about this night other than what I'm about to share with you. I was in the living room of the cabin, and I remember my mom's boyfriend was there with me. He asked if I wanted to go up into the hunting tower out back with him, and I said yes. I remember following him through the back door of the living room, and I remember him walking ahead and turning back to wave me toward him. I thought he was just trying to help me keep up with him, so I followed him. I watched him climb up the ladder of the hunting tower, and then I heard a voice behind me. Hey, where are you going? I turned around. It was my mom's boyfriend 
behind me, asking where I was going. I didn't know how to say I was following you. I turned back around to look at the hunting tower along the tree line, and nobody was there. Nothing was. Not an animal, not my mother, not a ghost. Nothing. Fast forward to a few years ago, my now wife and I were still dating at the time and sharing ghost experiences with one another. I told her about this experience and Monterey, and I'll never forget the look on her face when I told her. She is from a Mexican family as well, and this legend of the witches of Monterey is a very real thing for her as well. The scary part? I was telling her this story on a Friday, and according to what her family told her growing up, Friday is a forbidden day to talk about them because that's one day of the week that they're most powerful. Apparently, they never forget their prey and they use that day as a lure toward what was lost. Initially, I thought, that's BS. But I can't begin to express how many Fridays my wife had to stop me because I would randomly bring up the story. Maybe it was just self-conscious, I don't know. But it still kind of freaks me out to this day. When I was around 11 years old, we lived in a log cabin in the woods of Dedham, Maine. Though there were other houses nearby, we seldom crossed paths with our neighbors. The cabin, which was approximately 250 miles from our primary residence, had been purchased recently by my father, and we had already spent a few nights there. On this occasion, we had planned to stay for an extended weekend. Given the cabin's age, my parents had decided to have some renovations done to enhance its charm. This meant that several rooms were under construction, leaving us with just one bedroom to accommodate all six of us. My parents, my two brothers, my sister, and me. The night had set in, and we were all tucked in the solitary bedroom. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, I was jolted awake by the distinct sound of bootsteps in the living room. An old wooden door on a rickety deadbolt lock, likely to fall apart under a strong impact, were all that separated us from the living room. As I was still shaking off the sleep, I heard my sister's voice asking if anyone else could hear the sound. That's when I realized it wasn't a dream. It was all too real. I quickly sat up to find my parents and my sister staring anxiously at the door. My heart started racing, unable to make sense of what was happening. My sister's fear-filled question, are we going to die, sent a chill down my spine. The bootsteps paused briefly as my other brother began to wake up, but then they resumed. There was no fading, implying the source of the sound was stationary. A sense of fear and worry pervaded the room as we tried to understand how someone could have entered our locked cabin. As my last brother woke up, the boot step ceased altogether. In response, my father retrieved the machete he had kept under the bed, cautiously approached the door, and listened for any other sounds. Then, with one swift move, he unlocked the door, flung it open, and brandished his weapon, ready for an intruder. He checked the living room and the other rooms, only to find everything undisturbed. All the doors and windows were still locked, and nothing seemed to have been tampered with. Getting back to sleep that night was a struggle. In the morning, the memory of the previous night's events still haunted me. Those crystal clear bootsteps were real, a fact confirmed by my family, leading me to believe that we had had a paranormal encounter. Despite our attempts to explain the event rationally, we have yet to find a plausible explanation. And one thing I'm sure of, 
those bootsteps originated from inside the house. This remains one of the most frightening experiences of my life. If you have any logical explanation for this, please let us know. In the summer, my parents rented an Airbnb in Holton, Maine. It was a very old farmhouse, but it was recently renovated. The fields and sunsets were beautiful. I always felt like something was watching me. It wasn't a bad feeling, though. We celebrated my birthday there, and that night I had a crazy dream. A woman named Gladys introduced herself to me and told me that this was her home. She told me she loved having my family and I there. She said that she never wanted us to leave. She also said that our birthdays are very close together as well. In the dream, Gladys and I played a board game and talked about so much, her past, her family, things like that. I tried so hard not to Google her name and see what came up until after I left to go home, but my curiosity got the best of me. Turns out there was an old woman named Gladys who lived there and died about a year earlier. Her birthday was August 10th, and mine is August 7th. The picture that was in her obituary looked exactly like the woman that I saw in the dream. That's how I know that it was her. There's an old wives' tale about this stretch of road in Maine, Route 182, AKA Blackswoods Road. It's home to Catherine, the ghost hitchhiker, and the devil truck. I am still shaken to my very core by the experience I had five years ago. The story of Catherine I won't really comment on. There are lots of accounts of that. They even made episodes on shows about it. But what I'm going to talk about is much darker, the devil truck. This truck isn't talked about much, except by old timers at the gas station called Tideway. When they first told me about it, I didn't believe it. Boy, I wish I would have before I left the store that night. But anyway, I thought, great, old timers telling me some BS because I just moved here. I should add that at this time, I was a fresh deputy with Waldo County. So I grabbed an orange juice out of the cooler because they didn't have the Gatorade I liked, told the old timers I was gonna head home because I had a long day shift, paid for my drink, and left. Here's the creepy part. I live on 182. So I started driving home normally in my take home vehicle. I pulled out of the gas station and sped off I set the cruise control and the charger to 50 miles per hour and just started thinking about what I wanted for supper. About three miles after the gas station, a truck pulls out behind me. I didn't think much of it, except that it was weird to see a 72 F100 out on the roads this late. Then out of nowhere, about 25 minutes after pulling out behind me, the truck rams the back of the cruiser, sending me sideways. I remember slamming into a tree and spinning back across the road into the guardrail that separates the road from Fox Pond. I instantly put on my blues so traffic would see me, since my headlights were facing right where the blind spot was on the road. I got out looking for the truck, thinking it had to be a problem with the truck. Surely somebody wouldn't try to kill a sheriff's deputy in Maine. There was no truck. There wasn't even a sign of a truck. I tried to call it in, but my car radio wouldn't work. Luckily, one of the old timers from the store was traveling home as well and stopped to help. What he said to me haunts me every time I drive that road at night. It must have been going fast. Devil truck doesn't like speeders. After he said that, I went to look at the tree that I hit 
and saw a speed limit sign that somebody must have ripped out. It was lying right about the point of impact where the truck had hit me. Speed limit, 45. Sure enough, I was speeding. And I guess the devil truck didn't like it. My dad grew up in the 70s in a wooded area in Maine. It was a tiny neighborhood with woods surrounding the outer part. My dad had all sorts of unexplained activity in his mother's house, but this is the one that stuck with me. My dad was around nine or 10. He couldn't sleep. Right beside his bed was a window and he could easily look out it from his bed. He heard noises outside and he got excited because he thought it was a moose or some wild animal. So he whipped open the shade. There was no moose. Looking back at my father was a little boy his age, maybe a little bit younger. He wasn't sure exactly what he was seeing. It was very foggy, but it was undeniable that he was looking at a little boy, a little redhead boy with overalls on and one of those stupid propeller hats. My dad wanted to close the shade and pretend that he had never seen him, but he just could not look away. The boy smiled and waved and began to walk away, becoming harder for my dad to see. Eventually, the boy disappeared into the fog. It was dark and there was this thick fog it was easy for my dad to convince himself that he imagined the whole thing. I think little kids find it easier to convince themselves that nothing has happened, that they just have an overactive imagination. I mean, that's what adults always tell children anyway. My dad was over at a friend's house a few days later. They were outside shooting BB guns, normal kids in the 70s, freedom type playing. The friend's dad was working on a car my dad tells his friend this story, thinking that they would both laugh at how silly my dad was. My dad told the friend, but he didn't laugh. His eyes got wide and all the color drained from his face. The friend books it over to his dad. My dad panics a little bit, thinking that his friend was telling his dad that he was trying to scare him and that my dad would get in trouble for it. Instead, the boy runs up to his dad and says, Dad, Dad, he saw the boy with the funny hat too. I'm currently visiting York, Maine for a family reunion. We're renting a house about a mile from the Nubble Lighthouse, if anyone cares to look up the location. This house has a wraparound porch with a front door and a side door right before the porch ends and the stairs lead to the backyard. The side door has a very recognizable sound. It almost sounds like somebody passing gas. We joked about it the first night there. The front door creaks like any other old door and slams on the frame. You can hear the wood, then the rubber liner on the door squeeze shut against the frame. Anyway, the first night we got settled in, we all went up to bed around midnight. It's a three bedroom house with very thin walls. You can hear conversations happening in the kitchen from the upstairs bedrooms and every floorboard creaks with any movement. My mom and dad went up to bed first, followed by my brother, my girlfriend and I followed about 15 minutes later. The other night I'm upstairs in my room waiting for my girlfriend to get out of the bathroom. I hear a creak and a slam from downstairs and the vibration through the house of a door hitting the frame. At first I thought it was my dad coming in from a smoke, but I listened 
and I could hear him snoring in his bedroom. Once my girlfriend got back, I asked her if she dropped anything. She said that she hadn't, but she thought I had fallen off the bed or something because the noise was so loud and shook the house. Kind of creepy, but I didn't think much of it again. Until last night. Around 12.30 to 1 in the morning, the same door creak and slam noise occurred at roughly the same time. And after this second time, keeping me wide awake, I decided to ask the rest of my family if they were up and about in the middle of the night. My parents deny walking around downstairs, and my brother then tells me he's been sleeping with his light on every night, since the very first, because he would hear soft footsteps and feel a presence standing at the back of his room. We're going to have a quieter evening tonight and keep an ear to the downstairs area before bed to see if we hear anything else. I'm also considering laying in my brother's room in the dark to see if I hear or feel anything out of the ordinary. If anybody has any experience with this and may know how to stimulate more action, please let me know. I love paranormal things, but up to this point in my life, this is the closest I've ever been to experiencing any. I wish I had more to the story, but this is what we've been going through so far. I lived in a 1900 farmhouse in northern Maine, along the border of Canada. The house was a small two-story clapboard-sided farmhouse. The central heat was a giant handcrafted metal stove. It was large enough to fit a log a foot in diameter and three feet long and sat in the middle of the dirt floored basement. The stove was so airtight that you could throw in several chunks of split hardwood and dog it down tight. Then you crack the air vent just a tiny bit and the fire would smolder all night with heat drifting up through the vents and ducts. It was the main heat source in the house, although there were two additional cast iron wood stoves. I lived there with my father and his girlfriend. My father would spend a lot of time working on the property, clearing brush. He also worked on scraping the peeling paint and applying a fresh new coat. Although he refused to invest money in the house, so many of his repairs were low quality and incomplete. After I moved away, I stayed away for over 15 years. One day, my wife and I were staying at a hotel a few hours away and found ourselves with a free day to randomly explore. We ended up driving back to the area of that house and decided to make it our destination. The area hadn't changed much. The area is very sparse, with a lot of dense trees and large grassy yards and fields, farms here and there. We turned off US Highway 1 onto the road named Wilcox Settlement Road. The house was maybe a quarter mile down that road. The sun was low in the late afternoon sky, a bit above the trees. I pulled up at the end of the driveway, or dooryard as the locals call it, and stopped in the road. The house was a wreck, in much worse shape than when my father had owned it. There were a few beat up cars parked by the house. There were barrels and scrap wood and random old junk all around the yard and on the porch. Much of the siding had been removed, exposing mylar backed foam insulation boards that had been pressed between the studs in the exterior wall. There was an old dented rusty pickup truck parked closest to the road where we sat idling. My foot on the brake, my wife and I sat gaping at the creepy old dilapidated house. The yard was overgrown and the brush had reclaimed most of what my father had laboriously cleared all those years ago. Movement caught my eye in the dimming light. A waving hand. There was a man standing on the other side of the old pickup truck and he was slowly waving his arm beckoning us toward him. 
He was a large, overweight man, late 30s to mid 40s, dressed in a dirty work coat. His mouth was open in a gap-toothed smile and he stood there, still, except for his upraised right arm, slowly beckoning us to pull into the driveway. I was frightened. First of all, we didn't see him initially, so it caught us off guard to have him standing as close as he was. Secondly, the way he stood there, watching us, beckoning, reminded me of a scene from a backwoods horror film. The man's smile seemed to me a cunning veneer of harmlessness, belied by a bleary, cold glint of greed, or worse. I instinctively floored the accelerator and sped away. I hate that house. It was a very bad place. I felt like it was stained with bleak sadness, fear, and loneliness. I'd like to preface this particular event that happened to me in my youth by saying that I've experienced far more paranormal activity, looking back, than I had ever really taken the time to consider. That being said, I have more stories that I might share in the future, but for this one, I want to tell you about the strange woods of Maine. As a child growing up in the backwoods of Maine, I've heard my fair share of strange things in the night. Typically, it'll be coyotes hunting, or the prowl of another nocturnal creature. As a child, I was never particularly afraid of the dark, but I knew dangers lurked in the absence of light. So at night, I played indoors. During the daytime, however, there were never any restrictions. On one summer afternoon, I was riding my bike down the street that branched off my dead-end road. Our only neighbors were a relative and a couple of decent folks just down the way. Otherwise, quiet woods. I would make this ride quite often, as there was no town, but this stretch was fun to ride because I could pedal my heart out without having to slow down in order to veer. On this day, I made my normal round up the road, only to turn around and head back. I had an uneasy feeling on the ride up, which was the only abnormality. I felt like I was being watched. Something told me to look toward the woods on my right, and reluctantly, I did so. Deep in the woods, amongst the pines, I saw a black, almost liquid thing peer out from behind a tree. My heart dropped. I took off pedaling as fast as my feet would take me, keeping a steady eye on the woods to my right. This thing kept pace effortlessly, darting from tree to tree like some primordial ooze. It was either playing or stalking prey, and I wasn't about to stop and find out which. I was pedaling so hard I thought my chain would snap. I knew my uncle's house was approaching on the left. I spun out in the dirt, ditched the bike, and ran to his door, frantically knocking. I turned around to see if whatever it was would be making its way toward me, but I didn't see anything. My uncle opened the door, cigarette in his mouth, asking me what was wrong. I explained to him what I saw, but he grabbed a rifle and said, probably just a bear, with slight concern in his voice. I've never seen a bear move like that, I said, out of breath. Yep, he said. They'll do that. He peered through the blinds. To this day, I don't know what I saw, but something tells me my uncle sure did. It's been 20 years, and I've since lost contact with my uncle. Maybe someday I'll reach out and ask. My wife and I were camping in a campground near Acadia National Forest. 
We realized the last night at the campground that there was an old family cemetery on the property near the tent sites. Later that night, after walking the dogs, we walked in that direction, listening to Necrophonic on earbuds. As we got closer to the cemetery, the app became more active, with fewer pauses between words. It wasn't like the other times that we've had the app running. My wife walked over toward the gravestones to read some dates. While reading the dates, she said, If we're disturbing you, tell us and we'll leave. Then, very clearly, a deeper voice on Necrophonic said, Leave. We apologized and we left the area. The only other experiences that have seemed like there was communication through that app were when we were introduced to the app in Gettysburg by a ghost hunting group. But those experiences were not as clear or direct as that night in Maine. My friend and I camped on his property in the middle of nowhere. It was in the area of Cane Creek, Kentucky, near Laurel Lake. There was no service, no noise, no anything but you and the woods. We set up our tent under an overhang, and I was tasked with gathering the firewood. It was about 5 p.m. or so, and while collecting, I got this odd feeling. And then I started to hear whispers. They weren't saying anything I could make out, it was just murmurings. At that point, I got this creepy, odd feeling, and I moved closer to our camp to collect the firewood. I didn't want to stray very far after that. Night progresses and nothing out of the ordinary happens, until we climb into our sleeping bags. I heard footsteps in the leaves and more murmuring. I was getting really freaked out, but I know the best thing to do is to ignore it and sleep, and so I did. The following morning, my friend and I found ourselves awake at 5 a.m. He asked me if I had heard whispering last night. I told him I heard it twice, and we were both just as baffled as the other. We were not the first people to camp in this area. His uncle and his friends attempted to camp there as well, but they couldn't make it through the night either. My dad is a hunter, and he refuses to go down there to hunt anymore, as well as another friend I have. His dad says that the air down there is rich in death. I don't know the reason for what happens down there, but I won't be going back. Reading some posts about Glitch in the Matrix experiences reminded me of an experience my mom had about 10 years ago. I asked her about it again tonight, and she retold it to me to make sure I had all the right details, so I'm telling the story on her behalf. My mom was driving into the city one day and was stuck in traffic. We live in Ireland. She was looking out the window at the buildings and saw an old woman sitting in a wheelchair in the doorway of one of the buildings. She described this woman as a shawley, which apparently was the name of the women in this part of the city in the 1940s and 50s who worked in the marketplace. They were called shawleys because of the black shawls they wore. She remembers the woman looking out onto the road with a solemn expression, and my mom was particularly fascinated by her because it had been so many years since she had seen one of these women. The traffic moved on and she parked in a car park around the corner from the street. About an hour later, she was leaving the city and looked over to the side of the street as she was passing to see if the woman was still there. All of the buildings were run down and boarded up, including the doorway the woman had been standing in. She said that the buildings looked entirely different to how she had seen them just an hour before. My mom has always thought of this as sort of a seeing through the veil type of thing. But could it be a glitch in the matrix after all? I 
I was about 15 years old when this happened. It happened in school, which was in Ireland. In my school, we had compulsory subjects that we had to take, such as math, English, etc. We were able to pick two option subjects. I chose technology, kind of like woodworking, but with circuits as well, and art. My best friend of like 12 years and I got put into the same technology class. Now, to be honest, all we ever did in that class was mess around. We never completed our projects, and instead we would just burn stuff and do stupid things. Anyway, each table was square, and one person was sat at each edge, and beside each person, connected to the desk, was a mechanical vice. It's basically something that you could tighten to hold something in place. My friend and I would literally put anything in there and just squish the crap out of it. One day, we had a piece of copper wire. It was quite thick, I'd like to say a centimeter in width, and it was probably like eight or nine centimeters long. We placed it in the vise and started twisting the knob and tightening it on the wire. When the vise fully closed, we opened it to see what would have happened to the wire. However, when we opened it, it was gone, and I mean like fully vanished. We started to look under the table, in the vice, around other tables, even behind our teacher's desk. After looking everywhere, we thought maybe we dropped it and somebody picked it up. We had like eight others in our class, so we just asked them if they had picked up a copper wire. And of course they replied, no, didn't you just squish it? Or no, I didn't see anything. Now, I want to emphasize, that my friend and I spent at least an hour looking for this wire, and we tested another wire in the vise to see if that would vanish, but instead it just fell on the floor when the vise was opened. We just laughed it off and said that it's probably some kind of interdimensional thing, but we've really been puzzled about what happened ever since. In 2004, I went to Ireland on the super cheap during this one magical week where there were insanely low fares. That's not the glitch, I'm just nostalgic for that time. While visiting family there, I picked up a Ross O'Carroll Kelly book, not realizing that it was a popular series, and read The Orange Mocha Frappuccino Years in about a day. The first person narrator uses a Bret Easton Ellis-like voice, where everything is his impressions in real time. I found it hilarious. At one point, we were walking down Grafton Street in Dublin. We walked past a busker and he was playing Don't Look Back in Anger, and he was right on the So Sally Can Wait etc part as we walked by. Something about how he was singing his heart out, even though it's sort of a cheesy song, impressed me. And I turned to my partner and said, you know, I don't care what anyone else says, I love this song. And she said, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, I heard another one doing it earlier. I had been with her, but I hadn't noticed. Later, in a train station news agents, we were selecting supper. It was either a triangle sandwich each or a candy bar each. And another book in the Ross O'Carroll Kelly series, The Teenage Dirtbag Years, to read on the next train. We chose candy and the book. She'd read two pages, then I'd read two, passing it back and forth, perfect for a late evening train where half the people were sleeping and the rest were quiet. She handed me the book with an odd expression at one point, and I looked down to read. It said, So I'm walking down Grafton Street with Sorsha, and we walk past this busker, and he's doing Don't Look Back in Anger, giving it all, so Sally can wait. And I turn to Sorsha, and I say, I don't care what anyone says, that's a great song. And she says, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. My own skepticism says, okay, common street, common buskers, and if you google the title of the song and busker and Grafton, there's a YouTube video of a guy playing that song in 2014. So it is a cliché. And our conversation wasn't at all original, filled with phrases that are really just filler in a way but it still felt really eerie. And honestly, it kind of still does. In 
Make of this story what you will, but it happened. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I still managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage, and it suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, one night I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom rail was strewn across the bedroom floor. My first thought was that there was somebody in the house with me, so I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was really nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder, because the door was locked and all of the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I just wasn't paying attention and that maybe I did leave my towel in the middle of the room, even though I knew that I didn't. But things got worse as time went on and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. For instance, coming in from a particular night at work, there was a light switch on in the hallway by the doorway. I'd have to switch that on before I'd even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. Sometimes when I would open the door at nighttime, there would be a gust of wind coming from the house to greet me when no windows were open and there was no way for that to really happen. It eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months, things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about three o'clock in the morning after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small. There was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom. The bathroom was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. This night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by, all I can say is it was a big man's shadow and this thing was standing at the end of the hall. Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me because there were three spotlights running down the hall and they lit up everywhere but this shadow stood under the light and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense. I just roared out, leave me alone, just leave me the F alone. And with that, whatever it was turned sideways and I could see the whole profile of his face. There was a massive bang and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back in my car, and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught. I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time, and he thought I'd been in an accident or something. I tried to explain to him as best I could what had happened. I hadn't said anything to anybody about the goings-on at the house. I'd been living there for about six months and it had been going on all that time. Almost every day something happened. Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day. We found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway, on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge, and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst, it was like somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it. It just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house six months later. 
During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully, though, I never saw the apparition again. One night I was lying in bed. It was about one o'clock in the morning, and coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, No doctor, please. Petrified, I jumped out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere. I checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television wasn't plugged in, because sometimes it turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which I also left unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please help me. Like, for some reason, she couldn't trust the doctor, or she couldn't afford one. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I asked a neighbor, and he told me that the couple who I'd bought the house off of had been complaining about hearing things in the house, at least the wife had been. I don't know what I saw or heard, but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house, because I've never experienced anything like that again. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off of me experienced anything. I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't really talk about this with people, as I don't want them to think I'm crazy. But I do know that this happened to me. Back in May of 2012, my family and I went to Ireland. We were staying in a cottage in a rural area that was far away from any major city or town. Two days before we were leaving, my cousin and I and her two-year-old daughter, Maisie, were outside in the garden. Maisie had one of those interactive books for young kids that play nursery rhymes, row your boat, hickory dickory, things like that, whenever you pressed a certain button. She was messing around, pressing multiple buttons, when she pressed a green one that was supposed to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but it didn't. Instead, the book played a song that neither I nor her mother recognized. Even weirder, however, was the fact that Maisie began to sing one line toward the end of the song, which I remember being something like, I will reach the Golden City to join the Angel Band. Her mother, of course, was shocked, as she was only two years old and was just beginning to talk. These words were extremely advanced for her vocabulary, even if she had only learned from memory. When I got home, I searched the lyrics Maisie had sung, and it turned out to be what I had speculated, a hymn, specifically one called The Pilgrim's Journey. None of our family was religious, and neither of us understood where Maisie had learnt the hymn, and even less why the book had played it in the first place. We tried pressing the green button again and again, but it never played the hymn again, just Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, as it was supposed to. This is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never really proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, my friends and I went out to do some shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed that somebody had left the oven on. Each of us denied having done it, but we knew somebody had to have left it on. Looking back though, this was probably the first unexplained incident, as thinking about it, nobody had even put food in the oven. 
Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans, movements from the side of her eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting, but myself and one other were not totally convinced. It was soon after that it was only me left unconvinced, as one day while the other non-believer was home doing some studies, they looked up to see a face peering at them before it vanished. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night just before Christmas to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by year's end. One of my friend's girlfriends swore that she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there are three switches needed to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night, and one room off the kitchen would just send shivers down our spines any time we were in there. There was one night in particular that really scared me, though. I always locked my door before going to bed, and I distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes, telling myself that it was just a dream, and I went back to sleep. The next morning, my door was wide open. So were all of the doors in my wardrobe, and the guys had told me that it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other all night long. I hadn't moved anything. So many other things happened in that house, but this story has gone on long enough. I decided to tell my story after telling a Galway person about living in the estate, and without saying which house I lived in, he told me of a creepy haunted house at the back of the estate that a family he knew had moved out of a few years prior because of the activity. When I told him which number it was, he almost fell off his chair. It was the same house. A little background. I am from Glenmore, Banyawangi, Indonesia. I work at a busy chemicals and perfumes factory for laundry. The place is on a narrow street between large farm fields and oil refineries. Since my home is a long way, I sleep in the factory bunks. This is where I encountered a lot of paranormal things. First, I remember it was a sunny and very hot afternoon. There was nobody in the factory because it was a holiday. I was the only one there because I had to check machinery routinely to make sure everything was in order. Suddenly, I heard a very loud bang, like somebody had punched the tables in front of me. And when I looked, there was a white smoke emerging from it, almost like a vape smoke, but much thicker and denser. It disappeared after that. It wasn't from chemicals or any of the other things going on in the factory. It was very strange. It almost looked like the smoke was aware of my presence. Second, one time I was trying to sleep and I couldn't close my eyes, even though I felt very sleepy. I just couldn't close them. It was like I was waiting for something to show up and eventually something started to. I can only sleep like two to 3 p.m. And all the while, almost every time, there's this shadow-like figure. It flies through the machines, or it will crawl beside the bed. I feel afraid, but there's nothing I can do about it. My body freezes still every time that I try to stand to watch it. It's a terrifying experience, and it happened every single time that I would try to sleep there. Third, this happened like a month ago. It was raining on a Sunday night, 
I was still inside the factory, waiting until the rain stopped. I walked into the kitchen to make myself some coffee, and that's when I heard a whispering voice inside the women's bathroom. I know that it's only me in there, and everyone else has gone home, but it's very clearly a voice, just humming. It was raspy though. It almost sounded like a woman in pain, humming to soothe herself. The next second, it was whispering some kind of words that I couldn't understand. My body got really cold, and I started to shake. I wanted to run, but I couldn't. It was like something was holding my feet tightly. The whisper became louder. My eyes actually started tearing up. I kept thinking, I can't handle this, I just want to cry. But I couldn't even do that. Finally, after 20 or 30 seconds of this, I broke the hold and got out of there. I didn't care if it was raining. It was better than being in there. A lot of other things have happened at that factory, but those three were the scariest. I want to quit, but it has a decent salary, and so ultimately, I stayed. And I still do. I still work there, and I still have to spend the night there sometimes, too. Things keep happening, but so far, nothing as scary as all of those things. But I'm sure it's only a matter of time. I'm currently seeking some insight into a strange event that happened in my past. I'm hoping for possible explanations related to cryptids or paranormal phenomena, so I can understand what happened. This occurred back when I was living in Seymour, Indiana, when I was about eight or nine years old. I was spending my day at a playground located near the apartment complex where I lived. In my playtime, I distinctly heard my mom's voice calling out to me from a direction entirely opposite to where she was at the moment. Baffled, I went to confirm that it was her, only to be told that she had not called me. I went back to playing, and I didn't hear the voice again. What puzzles me are actually a few aspects of this experience. First, my mom was situated a substantial distance away from me, probably about four or five minutes away. Yet, the voice that mimicked hers seemed to come from an identical distance, but in the complete opposite direction. Secondly, I have no prior history of hallucinations in my life. I initially shared this story before, but I got more questions than answers. Hopefully somebody knows what this might be. Skinwalker doesn't seem to fit the description, at least based on what I understand, but some kind of mimicry was at play. This happened outside of Hillsboro, Illinois. The story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job. Free popcorn, soda, candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town, randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working and just chat. Not much else to do in a small town. Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tiege, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tiege told me that he heard a rumor of some weird lights out at an old cemetery just outside of town. Tiege was a pathological liar, so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started backing up what Tiege was saying, so I told them that as soon as I finished cleaning up the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, 
I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at about one in the morning. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck. So the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to the cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge, which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck. So I parked the truck right in front of the bridge. Tiege told me to turn the truck off and said he was getting out. At this point, I didn't really trust Tiege and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at two in the morning. So I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes passed and we started to see fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could see them even in the woods around us. I asked Tiej if those were the lights he saw, but before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill and I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been for moving around in the woods where trees were blocking their light. I started freaking out and I was screaming at both of them and said that if they were playing some kind of prank, it wasn't funny and I was leaving. I tried to turn the truck back on, but it turned once and then died. Tiej had a shocked look on his face which only made me more anxious. At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas when turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. I looked up then and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge and it had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening, but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew that I needed to get out of there. Tiege was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted to see this thing, that he wanted to see this thing to get closer, but I wasn't listening. I was shaking as I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we'd come. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tiege and Justin off at their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer, searching to see if I could find any explanation as to what I saw. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? I had no idea. It all seemed like BS to me, honestly, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning, I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her to the cemetery, so I did. We parked in front of the bridge and walked up the hill and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on the tombstones, flashlights, even footprints around the muddy woods, but we didn't see anything that could explain what I had seen the night before. The cemetery was also too far away from any major road for it to have been car headlights. I still don't know what we saw that night, but I get goosebumps every single time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me to keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens in the world. And maybe that lesson was worth it. My grandma used to work at an Aramark factory in Chicago, close to downtown. I don't know the exact address because I think they changed locations. My grandma's job was to iron the fabric that would come through the machines. One time, she went upstairs to the washroom with her friend. Only two could leave the line at a time. 
So my grandma was in the stall next to her friend doing their business. When through the cracks, they both see the shadow of a man with a fedora and the long coat, but they didn't see any legs. My grandma didn't know if her friend saw it and her friend didn't know if she had seen it. So they started to wash their hands and they heard a man cough. They hurried to leave, took a long flight of stairs to get to their work area, but never said a word to anybody, not even to each other. At lunchtime though, they did talk about the event. Comparing notes, they both saw and heard the same thing. So they asked this lady who had worked there for a really long time about it. She said that they heard those stories all the time, that it was either Al Capone or one of his associates. It wasn't that specific warehouse, but around that area was where he would do all of his business, where they would arrange meetings. My mom also worked there, and she said that one time the shift was ending, so all the women tried to be the first to leave. They said that once they got to the main doors, everybody saw a huge black dog, like a Rottweiler, but with a huge collar, and he was just barking and barking. The dog wouldn't stop. They called the boss and, unfortunately, the boss tried to hit the dog with a stick, but it didn't even hurt him. He wouldn't back away at all. Then, finally, on a whim, the dog just ran away. The lady said that they should check the cameras or something because maybe some gangbangers or people up to no good tried to sick the dog on them. The next day, the boss checks the cameras and you can't even see the dog. They see the women by the door. You see the boss moving the stick and hitting the air, but there's no dog anywhere. Other times people would see the dog around the parking lot, but there would be a gate because it was kind of in a bad neighborhood. So he couldn't have jumped or walked in or out. This was in the nineties when it was pretty bad down there so nobody understands how the dog could have gotten into such a heavily gated property. To this day though, the weirdest thing is why that dog never showed up on the camera. Our Yellowstone journey began in California with seven adults. We caught a flight to Salt Lake City, Utah, and from there drove to Henry Lake, Idaho, where we had arranged to stay in a cabin. We arrived at the cabin, which was sizable, around 5 o'clock p.m. on the first day. The ground floor housed a living room, a kitchen, a master bedroom, and a dining room with a set of stairs on either side leading to the upper level. Additionally, there were entrances from outside into the kitchen and outside the master bedroom, apart from the main entrance that opened into the living room. The upper level comprised about four bedrooms and three bathrooms. The cabin had an old, rustic feel to it. Our first evening at the cabin was uneventful. However, as night fell, an eerie feeling took hold. My husband and I retired to one of the upstairs bedrooms, while two other couples occupied the master bedrooms downstairs and upstairs. The only single member of our group took the bedroom next to ours. Given our plan to set off early for Yellowstone the next day, we all turned in for the night around 11 o'clock p.m. No sooner had my husband and I hit the sack that we fell into a deep sleep. However, I was jolted awake by a scream, which turned out to be my own. Simultaneously, my husband also woke up screaming. Although I have had instances of crying in my sleep due to nightmares, this was the first time I had screamed, and I distinctly remember not having any dreams or nightmares that night. As for my husband, it was highly unusual for him to have a nightmare, let alone wake up screaming. Our friend in the adjacent room, who was on a call, heard our screams and rushed to check on us. We assured him that we were okay, if not confused, 
and tried to get back to sleep. But I spent the rest of the night battling strange feelings, unable to sleep until the first rays of sunlight peeked through the window. The next morning, we were all up at around nine o'clock in the morning, discussing the previous night's incident. The other two couples, unaware of our midnight ordeal, reported hearing random footsteps throughout the night. Thankfully, no other strange incidents occurred during our five-day stay. Yet, the cabin radiated a considerable amount of negative energy, and none of us were keen on spending more time there than necessary. We would leave early in the morning and return late at night, using the cabin merely as a space to sleep. Thankfully, we haven't experienced anything similar since then. My grandpa was born in the last years of the 19th century and spent his entire life living in rural Idaho as a farmer and rancher. He has tons of old cowboy stories and he would always tell us grandkids. Most of them were funny, some were cautionary, but a few were downright creepy. When my grandpa was six years old, he, along with his older brother and a gang of kids from the nearby farm, decided to go ice skating for the day. At that time, my great-grandpa was working as a ranch hand and the family lived near Chesterfield, Idaho. Now it's mostly a ghost town. It was a bright and sunny January day in 1902. And though the temperature was low, the sun kept things somewhat warm. They had hitched sleighs to their horses and headed down to the Portnoy River to ice skate. There were eight kids all together, and they were excited to show off their new skates for Christmas. Along with my grandpa and his brother, there were the three Robinson kids, Tommy Bear and the Gooch twins. The best spot to skate was next door to the Gooch's ranch. The river there was broad and shallow, so the ice tended to be thicker. And if they did fall through, they would just get their legs wet. The kids spent a couple of hours skating when a loud scream came from a willow bush on the riverbank opposite them. The kids could only watch as a giant man, covered head to toe in thick black fur, came lumbering out of the bushes. It was carrying a large tree branch and was screaming in rage at the kids. They had fled toward the sleighs trying to scramble up the riverbank in their gates. My grandpa, being the youngest, was at the back of the rush. He couldn't get a good foothold because of the skates and he fell backwards toward the ice. The giant was now crossing the river toward them, screaming and swinging his branch. My grandpa was sure that this creature was going to eat him. As my grandpa tells it, Lady Luck smiled down on me that day by the river because as the giant was midway across the river, the ice gave way. It only submerged to its shins, but it slowed down considerably as it tried to get back on top of the ice. This gave my grandpa's brother enough time to jump down and cut the laces off my grandpa's skates. They left the skates and dashed up the riverbank and jumped onto the sleigh. As they looked back, the giant man was cresting the riverbank. To their relief, it did not chase the sleighs. It just stood there, hollering at the kids, and swinging its tree branch. The kids were able to make it back to the Gooch Ranch where they told their encounter to John Gooch, the twins' grandfather. Word spread quickly in the tiny farming community and soon a posse was formed to hunt down the wild man. Where the kids had been skating, there were footprints, almost two feet in length that the group found. My grandpa's skates were found near the tracks. They had both been bent in half like horseshoes. The tracks headed west into the nearby mountains. The hunting party followed them as far as they could, but deep snow prevented any further travel. The creature was never sighted in that area again. The story captivated the small community and soon word traveled across the country of the Idaho wild man. 
That spring, my great-grandpa decided to buy a ranch in the Little Lost River Valley, farther north in Idaho. My grandpa had many other weird and creepy backwoods stories, but he always said that this encounter frightened him the most. He was sure that he would have been killed if that giant hadn't broken through the ice and given his brother a chance to cut his laces. My tale unfolds on the big island of Hawaii when I was around 10 or 11 years old. My father was an avid hunter of wild boars and sheep, and occasionally he would take our family to a remote cabin that my uncles had constructed. The exact location of the cabin is hard to pinpoint, but it was an hour's off-road drive up the mountain from an obscure road that branched off the main highway. This quaint one-story cabin's front door was a sliding glass door. Across from it, you could see three rooms, each furnished with two bunk beds, but no doors for privacy. The cabin's bathroom was a primitive outhouse, lacking light and running water, nestled within a clutch of trees and bushes. Despite the cabin's lack of amenities and poor ventilation, which made it quite chilly, the place had a certain charm. However, I couldn't shake off the sensation of spiritual presence, perhaps due to my uncle's story of an enormous battle that had taken place in the vicinity during ancient times. This immediately made me think of night marchers, which, although just a part of Hawaiian folklore, for some people, are perceived as extremely real entities by native Hawaiians. During this trip, my cousin, sister, and I found ourselves exploring the expanse around the cabin, an open field laden with grass, weeds, and bordering trees, growing over lava rocks. Out of boredom, we picked up some hammers and started breaking into small lava tubes, hoping to discover something interesting. These tubes weren't massive like caves, but small pockets that had formed due to air bubbles trapped in the flowing and later hardened lava. You could identify them by merely tapping your shoe on the surface and listening to the sound. Much to our surprise, one such lava tube did contain something. A pile of bones, cushioned by long brown bird feathers. These bones, which didn't appear to belong to a human, but rather some animal, perhaps a chicken, were strikingly well preserved and still bore hints of pinkish red color suggesting freshness. We were puzzled. How did these bones get inside the tube? Why weren't they destroyed by the lava? The only plausible explanation we could think of was that these bones were an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, given that the volcano hadn't been active for centuries. Out of respect, we quickly sealed the tube's opening with rocks and retreated, choosing not to mention this to our parents. The following morning, our father asked us if any of us had visited the outhouse early in the day. When we all denied it, he shared that he had seen a large figure standing at the sliding door, presumably having returned from the outhouse. Unable to discern the figure in the darkness, he dismissed it as a dream. However, the possibility that it might have been the entity whose offering we had disturbed terrified me. The figure could have been a human, but considering the cabin's remote location, it seemed very unlikely. Regardless, after that unnerving encounter, I never stayed at that cabin again. I've always been an outdoorsy type, eager to explore every inch of the world's natural beauty. The Maine woods were no exception, and I'd ventured deep into them countless times. Every now and then, locals would talk about eerie occurrences, disappearances, strange cries at night, and even whispered legends of a creature 
known as the Rake, an almost skeletal humanoid entity with elongated limbs and lifeless eyes. I dismissed these tales as old wives' tales, but I would soon regret my skepticism. It was late July, and I was taking a solo trek through the forest to clear my mind. The canopy of green above me was a comforting sight, and the songs of birds echoed in the distance. I'd set up camp near a creek, enjoying the solitude and the symphony of water trickling over the rocks. As darkness fell, I prepared a fire and settled into my tent, my flashlight and Swiss army knife within arm's reach, just in case. The air was unusually dense that night, thick with a tension that draped over the forest like a dark veil. I shook off the feeling and slid into my sleeping bag, dismissing it as the product of an overactive imagination. In the dead of night, a rustling outside my tent yanked me from my sleep. My heart pounded as I grabbed my flashlight, unzipping the tent just enough to poke my head out. The beam of light danced through the trees, but found nothing. Slightly relieved, I told myself it was probably just a raccoon or a squirrel, but the tension in the air still held its grip on me. I tightened the zipper and returned to sleep. Not long after, I was awakened again, this time by an unholy screech that echoed through the woods. It was a sound that defied description, like the scream of a woman combined with the roar of an animal. I felt my blood freeze, my body paralyzed with fear. As quickly as I could, I put on my boots and grabbed my knife. With the flashlight in hand, I stepped outside the tent. The forest had fallen ominously silent. Even the creek seemed to murmur more quietly, as if aware of the dread that hung in the air. I began to move cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the dark. I told myself I would investigate only a little before turning back. Just when I thought I couldn't handle any more suspense, I saw it. A figure no more than 50 feet away was hunched over, drinking water from the creek. It was skeletal, but covered in patches of skin its elongated limbs disturbingly human, yet entirely wrong. I nearly dropped my flashlight when it turned toward me, revealing hollow eyes that seemed to absorb the light. In that moment, I felt a terror that eclipsed all rational thought. My legs carried me back to my tent faster than I'd ever moved. I tore it down in record time, throwing everything into my backpack, I didn't look back until I was well away from that clearing, and even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was still being watched. When I finally emerged from the forest, bathed in the first light of dawn, I knew something had changed in me. The woods would never again be a sanctuary. They were now a place where nightmares could step out of the shadows and into reality. I never reported my experience, knowing the ridicule and skepticism that would greet me. Even now, years later, I can't find a logical explanation for what I encountered that night. But one thing is certain. The cryptic legends of Maine's forests hold a truth far more terrifying than any tale. And whatever that creature was, it's still out there, lurking in the depths of the woods. And so, I tell you this story with a warning. Be wary of the forest's edge, for beyond it might lie horrors that defy understanding. The woods of Maine had always held a special place in my heart ever since my family began vacationing there when I was a child. The tall pines, the craggy coastlines, and the deep sense of isolation 
made it the perfect escape from the pressure of everyday life. This year, I invited some friends, Mike, Sarah, and Liz, to join me on a camping trip, blissfully unaware that this particular venture would be unlike any other. We set up camp deep in the woods, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. Our campsite was idyllic, encircled by ancient trees and just a stone's throw away from a tranquil lake. We spent the day fishing, swimming, and basking in the beauty of our surroundings. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire, roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. It was then that Mike, a Maine native, brought up the local legend of the Poco Moonshine Lake Monster, a serpent-like creature rumored to inhabit the depths of a lake not too far from where we were camping. It's supposed to be massive, he said, with scales like armor and eyes that glow in the dark. We all laughed it off, attributing the legend to the vivid imaginations of bored locals. But as the fire dimmed, we retreated to our tents, and the atmosphere changed. The woods, which had felt so inviting during the day, now seemed to close in around us, as if hiding secrets in the shadows. It must have been around midnight when I first heard the noise. A low rumble, like something large moving through water. I unzipped my tent and peered out into the darkness, my eyes straining to adjust. There it was again, this time accompanied by a series of splashes and the sound of something heavy dragging itself along the ground. Curiosity getting the better of me, I woke up Mike and Sarah, and together we grabbed our flashlights and cautiously made our way toward the lake. And there, in the water, illuminated only by the silvery glow of the moon, was an enormous serpent-like form, its scales glistening, and its eyes, two glowing orbs, fixated on us. In a state of collective shock, we scrambled back to our campsite, adrenaline coursing through our veins. Liz, roused by our hurried movements, stared at us in disbelief as we recounted what we'd seen. We need to stay in our tents until morning, Mike said, his voice tinged with a gravity I had never heard before from him. We huddled in our tents, too terrified to speak. That's when the scratching began. Slow, deliberate, and unnervingly close, like the sound of talons dragging along the canvas walls of our tents. The noise circled the campsites, stopping and starting, but always there, a maddening soundtrack to the longest night of our lives. As dawn broke, the scratching finally ceased, replaced by the familiar sounds of birdsong and rustling leaves. We emerged from our tents, visibly shaken but unharmed, our campsite untouched. Packing up as quickly as we could, we left that place, vowing never to return. And while we never spoke of that night again, the experience bonded us in a way nothing else could, a shared encounter with the unexplained forever etched in our memories. Now, when I hear tales of cryptids or local legends, I no longer dismiss them as mere folklore. Because in the remote woods of Maine, we came face to face with something that defied explanation, something that turned skeptics into believers and a casual camping trip into a haunting encounter with the unknown. There are places in California where the modern world seems to blur, fading away to reveal a land that time forgot. Humboldt County, with its towering ancient redwoods, is one such place. And I learned, 
during one unforgettable camping trip that it might be home to more than just trees. Eager to escape city life for a while, I planned a solo camping trip in the heart of the Humboldt Redwoods. My destination was a remote site, far from any trail, a place where I could truly be alone. The first evening was peaceful. The silence was only broken by the chirping of crickets and the gentle rustling of leaves. But as night deepened, another sound joined the forest's natural chorus, a soft, almost mournful humming. I emerged from my tent, flashlight in hand, scanning the trees to find the source, but the dense foliage revealed nothing. Unnerved but exhausted, I attributed the humming to my imagination and tried to sleep. The next day, while exploring a nearby grove, I stumbled upon a small clearing. At its center stood an ancient tree, its bark scarred with symbols that looked like a mix between indigenous carvings and something far older. As I touched the markings, the same haunting humming filled the air. Startled, I turned to see an elderly woman, her appearance weathered yet timeless, standing at the edge of the clearing. In a voice filled with sorrow, she spoke of the forest's memory and the spirits it harbored. The tree, she explained, was a memorial for her ancestors, and the humming was their song, a lament for the land they once called home. She invited me to sit with her by the tree. As night fell, she sang the song of her people, a tune filled with longing, love, and loss. The forest seemed to echo her sentiments, joining in the mournful melody. When morning came, I found myself alone in the clearing, the ancient tree standing silent. The woman was nowhere to be seen. I later learned from locals that the woman I described had passed away 20 years ago, but her spirit and the spirits of her ancestors were said to still roam the redwoods. My trip to Humboldt changed me. I had gone seeking solitude, but found a connection to a world beyond our own a world where the past lingers, singing its song for those willing to listen. If you ever venture into the ancient groves of Humboldt, tread softly and listen closely. The trees might just share their stories with you. Napa Valley, with its sprawling vineyards and lavish wineries, is known to be a paradise for wine lovers. But one autumn evening, while on a solo retreat, I encountered a mystery that turned this picturesque haven into a realm of the inexplicable. Eager to explore the valley's renowned vineyards, I booked a small cottage on an old winery estate. The property was beautiful, rows of grapevines stretched as far as the eye could see, framed by the purples and golds of the setting sun. On my first evening, while sipping a glass of wine on the porch, an elderly gentleman approached from the vineyard. Dressed in dated overalls, he introduced himself as Thomas and said he was the caretaker of the land. We chatted about the history of the estate, and he mentioned that the vineyard had been in his family for generations. Thomas invited me for a walk, offering to show me a part of the vineyard not usually accessible to visitors. Curious, I followed him down a narrow pathway that led to an old gated section of the vineyard. Thomas explained that this part of the estate was abandoned and had remained untouched for decades. As we entered, the atmosphere changed, the air grew cooler, and the usual sounds of nature fell silent. At the heart of this secluded area stood an ancient, gnarled grapevine, distinctly different from the others. Its grapes were a deep shade of black, and its leaves shimmered under the twilight. Thomas began to recount a tale passed down in his family. This vine, he said, was believed to be cursed. Legend spoke of a forbidden love between an ancestor of his and a rival vineyard owner's daughter. 
they would secretly meet at this very spot. But when their affair was discovered, it led to a tragic end. As a symbol of their undying love, the couple supposedly buried two intertwined vines here, which grew into this singular dark grapevine. Suddenly, a soft whisper filled the air, and ghostly apparitions of a young man and woman appeared, dancing gracefully among the vines. Their translucent figures glided effortlessly, lost in a timeless embrace. Stunned, I looked over at Thomas, but to my shock, he too had become translucent, fading into the misty surroundings of the vineyard. The next morning, I hurriedly sought the estate owner to recount the previous evening's events. To my surprise, he revealed that there was no caretaker named Thomas, and that the story that I shared was from a local legend from over a century ago. Today, I'm convinced that the spirit of Thomas and the tragic lovers of the vineyard shared their story with me that evening. Napa's vineyards may be famous for their wines, but for me, they'll forever hold a tale of timeless love, reminding us that passion, once rooted, can transcend even the boundaries of time. San Francisco is a city of layers, of histories piled upon histories. Its storied streets have witnessed countless tales, but the one I stumbled upon in the famous Hyde ashbury district was nothing short of otherworldly. As a photography enthusiast, I was eager to capture the eclectic mix of Victorian homes, psychedelic murals, and colorful characters of this iconic neighborhood. As sunset approached, the district was bathed in a soft golden glow, making it the perfect backdrop. As I meandered through the streets, an old faded mural caught my eye. It depicted a band playing music, surrounded by jubilant dancers, a perfect representation of the summer of love. But what was most striking was a young woman painted in the center. She had piercing blue eyes, and a look of profound sadness, incongruent with the celebratory scene around her. Curiosity peaked, I set up my camera, but as I peered through the viewfinder, I was taken aback. The young woman appeared to be moving, dancing slowly amidst the static figures of the mural. I blinked, thinking it was a trick of the light, but there she was, twirling gracefully, her eyes never leaving mine. An elderly local, seeing my astonishment, approached and shared the legend of Blue-Eyed Lucy. Lucy was a young woman from the late 1960s, drawn to Hyde Ashbury by the promise of love and freedom. But her dreams were tragically cut short when she vanished one summer night, leaving behind only rumors and whispers. The mural, the local explained, was painted in her memory by a heartbroken lover, and it was said that at twilight, when the world blurred between day and night, Lucy would dance once again, searching for the love she had lost. Chills ran down my spine as I looked back at the mural. Lucy had returned to her static form, but her eyes, those haunting blue eyes, seemed even more alive. That night, as I reviewed my photographs, one image stood out. Amidst the vibrant colors and lively scenes of Hyde Ashbury was a hazy silhouette of a dancing figure with unmistakably piercing blue eyes. A soft, melancholic tune seemed to echo in my ears, a haunting reminder of the love and loss embedded in the very walls of the city. To this day, I often think of Lucy when the golden hues of twilight envelop the world, and the liminal space between day and night the past and present, perhaps we are all given a fleeting chance to find what we've lost. If you ever find yourself in Hyde Ashbury at sunset, keep an eye out for those blue eyes. They might just be looking for you.
When most people think of San Francisco, they imagine the Golden Gate Bridge, trolley cars, or maybe sourdough bread. But my memories are dominated by an eerie encounter on Alcatraz Island, one that still chills me to the bone. A bit of background. Alcatraz, for those who don't know, is the infamous prison island located in San Francisco Bay. It housed some of America's most notorious criminals until it closed in the 1960s. It's a popular tourist destination now, and being a history buff, I was eager to check it out. My trip to the island started out normally. The guided audio tour is creepy enough on its own, with former inmates and guards recounting tales from the prison's heyday. But things took a strange turn when I decided to break away from the main group. Drawn to a solitary cell at the end of a corridor, I felt an inexplicable need to explore it further. As I stepped inside the dim cell, I felt a sudden drop in temperature, a bone-chilling cold. I heard soft whispers, seemingly emanating from the walls themselves. Straining my ears, I could discern a single phrase repeated over and over. They won't let me out. They won't let me out. Panicking, I tried to leave the cell, but found, to my horror, that I couldn't move. It felt as if unseen hands were holding me in place. The whispers grew louder, more desperate. I felt an overwhelming sense of despair, an emotional maelstrom of loneliness, anger, and regret. Just as suddenly as it began, the grip released me. The cell was silent once more. Stumbling out, I quickly rejoined the tour group, trying to shake off the terror. Once we were back on the mainland, I approached one of the tour guides, hesitantly recounting my experience. She said that there had been an inmate, a solitary prisoner who had been confined to that particular cell for an unusually long time. Rumors suggested he had gone mad, constantly whispering about being trapped forever. I've never been one to believe in ghosts, but that day on Alcatraz, I felt an undeniable connection to the island's dark past. There's a weight to history, especially places steeped in pain and suffering. And sometimes it reaches out, reminding us of the souls that once inhabited it. I grew up in California, and like many locals, I've taken countless road trips across its vast landscapes. But there's one trip I'll never forget, a detour into the unknown in the heart of Death Valley. During a summer road trip a few years back, my partner and I decided to drive through Death Valley late at night, aiming to beat the oppressive daytime heat. We had stocked up on snacks and water, but as the night wore on, our hunger grew, and we wished for a place to grab a warm meal. As if in answer to our prayers, we saw a neon sign flicker to life on the horizon, advertising a diner. We were deep in the desert, miles from any town, so finding a diner here was oddly out of place. But hunger won over skepticism, and we followed the sign. Pulling up, we found a quaint 50s-style diner, complete with the neon lights and checkered floors. A cheery waitress named Maggie greeted us. There were a few other patrons, which seemed odd given the late hour and remote location. We ordered burgers, and as we waited, I struck up a conversation with an elderly gentleman sitting at the counter. He spoke of the diner as a haven, mentioning he'd been coming there since the 50s. What was odd, though, was his mention of specific dates dates that went back further than any human could possibly live through. Before I could ask more, our order arrived. The food was delicious, perhaps the best burger I'd ever had. We paid, left a generous tip, and promised Maggie we would be back. As we continued our journey, my partner and I dozed off. We woke up to the morning sun, parked on the side of the road, with no diner in sight. Thinking we had simply lost our bearings, we drove around looking for it, but there was no trace of it. 
Curious, I did some research and found old tales of a diner in Death Valley, a mirage of sorts appearing only to those truly in need. Legend spoke of a terrible accident in the 50s where a diner caught fire and its occupants perished, trapped inside. Today, I'm convinced that the diner we visited was a fleeting glimpse into the past, a remnant replaying its heyday. It's a memory I hold close, a reminder of the thin veil that sometimes separates our world from the mysteries beyond. If you ever find yourself hungry and lost in Death Valley, keep an eye out for that neon sign. It just might lead you to the diner that exists between time and reality. Santa Monica is famous for its beautiful beaches, the iconic Ferris wheel, and its bustling pier. But underneath its bright lights and cheerful atmosphere, I discovered a chilling secret that still haunts me. It was a typical Saturday night. My friends and I decided to hang out at the pier, enjoy some street food, and take in the view of the vast Pacific. As the night wore on and the crowd thinned, a dare led me to a game of exploration beneath the pier. While the top of the pier was alive with laughter and music, the space underneath was a stark contrast. It was eerily silent except for the muted sounds of waves crashing against the pilings. The dim light from the pier above cast long shadows on the wet sand, creating a maze of dark and light. Venturing further, I noticed an old, weather-beaten door half buried in the sand, with a rusted sign reading, Employees Only. Drawn by curiosity, I managed to pry it open. Inside was a long forgotten storage room filled with discarded carnival games and equipment. The air was thick with age and the musky scent of the sea. As I sifted through the relics, I came across a collection of old photographs. They depicted various scenes from the pier's early days, families, performers, and couples, all dressed in early 20th century clothing. But what caught my attention was a recurring figure. In the background of each photo stood a tall man with hollow eyes, always watching, always present. Each photograph had a date written on the back, spanning decades, yet the man never aged. Chills ran down my spine when I felt a cold gust of wind from the back of the room. Turning around, I saw the same tall figure from the photographs standing in the shadows, his gaze fixed on me. Panicking, I sprinted out of the room, not stopping until I reached the well-lit part of the pier. My friends, seeing the fear in my eyes, didn't ask questions and quickly accompanied me away. Later, I researched the pier's history and found multiple accounts of a tall man, believed to be a performer from the pier's early days, who tragically died in an accident. Locals said he never left, and was occasionally seen wandering the pier and beach at night, searching for something, or someone. While the Santa Monica Pier continues to be a place of joy and entertainment, I can't shake off the memory of that night. Beneath its cheerful exterior lies a reminder of its storied past. If you ever find yourself there after dark, be wary of the shadows, because they just might be watching you. Hollywood, the city of dreams where stars are born and legends are made. Yet beneath the glitz and glamour, there's a haunting tale that locals dare not speak of after dark. A tale rooted in the very symbol of stardom, the Hollywood sign. I moved to Los Angeles with hopes of making it in the film industry. One evening, after a particularly rough day of rejections, I decided to hike up to the Hollywood sign, thinking it might inspire me or at least offer some solace. As I neared the iconic letters, the city lights below twinkled like a blanket of stars, 
but a melancholic breeze carried an eerie lament, a soft, sorrowful song that seemed out of place in the quiet night. I soon realized I wasn't alone. A ghostly figure of a woman stood precariously on one of the letters, her vintage 1930s attire flowing around her as she gazed longingly at the city below. Recalling the tales I'd heard, I recognized her as Peg Entwistle, a young actress from the golden age of Hollywood. Legend says that after facing numerous setbacks in her acting career, she tragically leapt to her death from the very sign that promised fame and fortune. And now her restless spirit is said to haunt the symbol of the dreams that eluded her in life. Drawn by a mix of curiosity and empathy, I approached her. She turned her gaze to me, her eyes deep pools of sadness. The city of dreams, she whispered, is also a city of broken hopes. Before I could respond, a gust of wind swept through, and she vanished, leaving only the haunting echo of her words. As I descended the hills, the city lights seemed dimmer, the dreams they promised more distant. But Peg's story was a stark reminder that success isn't just about glitz and glory. It's also about resilience in the face of despair. Now, every time I glimpse the Hollywood sign, I remember Peg and the countless others whose dreams remain intertwined with the city's luminous facade. While Hollywood promises stardom to many, it's the whispered legends of its hills that remind us of the real stories, dreams, and spirits that linger long after the credits roll. Death Valley, with its scorching heat and unforgiving terrain, has been the final resting place for many an adventurer. But within its vast desert expanse lies a labyrinth of abandoned mines, remnants of California's gold rush era. And it was within one such mine that I unearthed a terrifying tale. I was part of a team of geologists surveying the valley for new mineral deposits. One day, after mapping the surface, we decided to explore an old mine reputed to be one of the deepest and oldest in the area. The entrance to the mine was a gaping black hole in the mountainside. The cool air emanating from within was a stark contrast to the blistering heat outside. We geared up, turned on our headlamps, and ventured in. The deeper we went, the more the outside world seemed to fade away. The only sound was our footsteps echoing through the endless dark corridors. But as we ventured farther, another sound reached our ears. A faint tapping, rhythmic and consistent. Curious, we followed the sound, which led us to a large cavern. In the middle stood a lone miner, hunched over and chipping away at the rock. The sight was perplexing. His clothing looked outdated like something out of the 19th century, and his figure was translucent with a ghostly pallor. As if sensing our presence, he stopped his work and turned to face us. His eyes were hollow, filled with an eternal sadness. Without uttering a word, he pointed to a section of the cavern wall. Approaching cautiously, we discovered an array of inscriptions. They chronicled the miner's story, Lured by the promise of gold, he had ventured too deep and became trapped, his calls for help forever echoing in the vast void of the mine. The apparition resumed his tapping, the sound now taking on a haunting quality, each tap a plea, a cry for salvation. Feeling a mix of sympathy and fear, we decided to make our way out. But as we retraced our steps, the miner's tapping grew louder echoing throughout the mine, as if begging us not to forget him. Upon exiting, we were greeted by the blinding sunlight and the familiar heat of Death Valley. The ghostly miner and his sorrowful tapping felt like a distant dream. However, when we reviewed our audio recordings from the exploration, the eerie tapping was clearly audible. 
Now, whenever I hear the echo of tools on rocks, I'm reminded of that forsaken miner and the countless souls who ventured into Death Valley's mines, never to return. The valley might be renowned for its natural beauty, but beneath its surface, it holds secrets, echoes of hopes, dreams, and tragedies from bygone eras. The Pacific Coast Highway is renowned for its breathtaking views, with towering cliffs on one side and the vast expanse of the Pacific on the other. It was on this scenic drive, specifically near Big Sur, that my perspective on reality was forever altered. I had always been a road trip enthusiast. One summer evening, with my trusty old Jeep and a playlist of classic rock anthems, I set out on PCH hoping to find solace in the rhythm of the road and the symphony of crashing waves. As night descended and the stars began to twinkle, I decided to pull over at a secluded lookout near Big Sur. I set up camp, kindling a small fire and reclining on the hood of my Jeep, ready to indulge in some stargazing. Hours passed in silent contemplation but as midnight approached, a peculiar glow appeared on the horizon. At first, I brushed it off as a passing ship or aircraft. However, the light grew brighter and began to pulsate in rhythmic patterns, casting eerie reflections on the ocean's surface. Suddenly, a beam of light shot down from the source, illuminating the waters and revealing the unmistakable silhouette of a massive disc-shaped object hovering silently above the sea. The object emitted a low hum, and intricate patterns of light danced across its surface. Frozen in awe and fear, I could only watch as smaller luminous orbs detached from the main craft and began to gracefully maneuver over the coastline, weaving through the trees and cliffs of Big Sur. Without warning, the orbs converged back to the larger craft, which then emitted a blinding flash. When I regained my vision, the mysterious object and its smaller counterparts had vanished, leaving only the starlit sky and the rhythmic sound of waves. I spent the rest of the night replaying the event in my mind, struggling to rationalize what I had witnessed. By dawn, with no evidence other than my own memories, I resumed my journey, the magic and mystery of Big Sur now forever intertwined with an extraterrestrial enigma. To this day, I often find myself gazing skyward, pondering the vastness of the universe and our place within it. The Pacific Coast Highway may offer travelers stunning vistas of Earth's beauty, but for me, its true wonder lies in a fleeting moment when the boundaries of our reality expanded, revealing the infinite possibilities that lie beyond. I don't know her name, nor do I wish to. I'm not even sure if she's female. All I'm certain of is that around 2.30 in the morning, sometimes I awake to find her standing in front of my window. But let's start from the beginning. When I was two, my uncle tragically passed away due to an accident involving a patch of ice at the bottom of a hill. I don't remember much from then, but I distinctly recalled dancing at the cemetery during his funeral. Clad in an outfit I was cautioned not to dirty, I noticed everyone's somber expressions. There was a sea of mourners, including children, who appeared a bit unusual. Ignoring their oddity, I danced with them, executing the innocent, clumsy steps of a child. My aunt, upon noticing, admonished me, Stop dancing with the dead. It's inappropriate. The rest, up until I was eight, is based on my mother's account. After the funeral, I would often point out peculiar individuals among us, 
describing them as old, sometimes hurt-looking people. Given her belief in the supernatural, my mother deduced that I was seeing spirits and advised me to disregard them. I heeded her words until one night when I was eight. I can vividly recall that night. As I lay in bed, I awoke abruptly to a street light illuminating my room through the curtains. Before me stood a woman in an old-fashioned dress, reminiscent of Victorian times, positioned inexplicably in front of my window, even though my dresser blocked its access. From the back, she appeared ordinary, perhaps a spirit from a bygone era. But when she turned, I was met with a haunting sight. Where her eyes should have been, there were black voids, and her chest bore a similar darkness where her heart should be. While she emanated no threat, I instinctively sensed her abnormality and ran to my mother in terror. Thereafter, I started experiencing nightmares related to my surroundings. Whether it's an animal or human suffering, these dreams always tie back to the land I reside on, leaving me emotionally drained. Once, I sought counsel from a priest who suggested she might be a demonic entity blocking my spiritual sight. His advice was to seek spiritual guidance from a variety of sources, including shamans and white covens, given my lack of strict religious affiliation. The uncanny aspect is that when I've researched the histories of places related to my nightmares, they often mirror the horrors I've witnessed in my dreams. Though I discuss my ability to see ghosts openly, I mostly ignore them now, just as my mother advised. It's bizarre yet fascinating to witness figures from the 1800s amidst the hustle and bustle of modern day Vancouver, tangible yet not. Out of an abundance of caution, I've undergone several medical examinations to rule out any neurological or psychological disorders. The results revealed high functioning autism, but no conditions that could induce hallucinations. I maintain a clean lifestyle, abstaining from drugs, alcohol, and smoking. This leaves me puzzled. Why do I see these apparitions? Is this woman truly demonic? And if she shields me from painful memories, do I want her to depart? Unfortunately, I am left with more questions than answers. In 2007, I frequently traveled between Alberta and British Columbia with my then boyfriend, whom I'll refer to as John. The journey was breathtaking, meandering through mountains, glacial lakes, and impressive rock formations. I mention these details because I have a hunch they're relevant, though it's just a gut feeling. One particular morning before a trip, something shifted in my mind. I can't determine if something external caused this or if I was the catalyst. Although it might sound like I'm describing a schizophrenic episode, I want to clarify that I have PTSD and bipolar too, but not schizophrenia. If this doesn't fit the narrative, it's okay. The day started as any other, but a bizarre conviction overtook me. I felt certain that John was planning to kill me in the mountains on behalf of my father. This idea was preposterous. Neither my father nor John had any reason or inclination to harm me. Convinced of this alternate reality though, I confronted John. It seemed he shared this disturbing belief. He evaded my questions. And as my distress grew, his demeanor changed. His voice altered, and subtle changes appeared on his face. He seemed to morph into someone else, a transformation I can't quite explain. Everything became surreal, like a lucid dream. The depth and complexity of the conversations and situations we found ourselves in were overwhelming. We discussed topics that I can't recall. At times, John seemed to alternate between himself and this other entity, 
who I whimsically identified as Satan or a manifestation of pure evil. Sounds crazy, right? By this time, I had worked as an escort in the city for about three years. This trip marked a turning point, and I left that life behind. Fast forward a bit and things became even stranger. We had taken a different route, one that John was familiar with from his work travels. However, our journey between places seemed unnaturally fast, and the towns en route seemed incomplete or transitional. Time felt distorted. Though in real time, our trip took three days, it felt like a week had elapsed. When we finally reached the city, reality seemed to reassert itself, though not entirely. We intended to pick up furniture, but although I remember having the furniture later on, the act of acquiring it remains hazy. After leaving the city, the night seemed to fall suddenly, and we were back on that eerie road. Our reality became fragmented, shifting between different states of awareness. At times, John transformed into that malevolent being, while at other moments, he was just John. We found ourselves trapped in a looping timeline, one that only progressed when we made the right change. As things escalated, John's intent seemed murderous. I felt trapped in this cycle of dark and light. In my desperation, I prayed fervently, seeking help. Suddenly, I was outside the truck, running along the road, with John, or that other thing, chasing me in the vehicle. Despite the terror, I resolved to keep running, driven by sheer will. Then, abruptly, I was back in the truck with John. The terrifying alternate reality still lingered, but it slowly began to fade as daylight approached and we neared familiar places. There were a few lingering time loops, but we eventually returned home, where time flowed normally once again. John and I tried to process what happened. Initially, we discussed it in depth, but over time, John avoided the topic. The initial belief that he intended to kill me remained unexplained and unfounded. When I recounted the story to my father, he was upset, suspecting that I was using drugs or losing my sanity but neither was true. For years, I have tried to locate that mysterious high road, but I've never succeeded. On two occasions, I felt I saw others using this road, once with a former boss after a traumatic work incident, and once with someone linked to my past in escorting. Both experiences predated that bewildering trip with John, and I can find absolutely no evidence that that road exists. To this day, I don't know what happened, and I can't explain any of these experiences. from Northern British Columbia, Canada. A few years ago, my friend invited me to join him, his mother, and sister at a resort beside a lake roughly 90 minutes from our town. This trip occurred at the cusp of June and July. Now, I term it a resort because while it has a primary log building, which functions as both a check-in spot and a restaurant, it's mostly just a collection of log cabins with spaces near the lake for RVs. So, resort is in very heavy air quotes. The location is predominantly surrounded by expansive forests, with the only real disruption being the highway that slices through the woods. Despite a few scattered houses around the lake, it's generally a quiet area, unless it's a holiday weekend. A winding road connects the cabins to the main building, which is a brief five to eight minute walk. Beyond the main structure, there is a clearing with tables, seemingly untouched for a decade, given the overgrown vegetation around them. A short distance from these tables, within the woods, lie two lagoons encircled by an old wire fence. We arrived in the evening, 
familiarized ourselves with our cozy log cabin and began exploring. The first day was fairly uneventful, but the next day's overcast and rainy weather was surprisingly welcome. It ensured fewer visitors, granting us more freedom. Our explorations led us to the clearing with the old tables, which clearly hadn't been used in ages given the encroaching nature. Delving further, about 50 feet into the woods, we discovered the lagoons. An intriguing detail was a section of the wire fence, flattened as if a large animal had passed over it. We nonchalantly dismissed it and continued our exploration, intending to return later. However, our next visit was cut short by strange noises, reminiscent of footsteps from the previous day's path. This experience kept us on edge, but we rationalized that it might just be the local wildlife. Despite the unsettling atmosphere, we even ventured to another forested spot near the cabins, where, oddly enough, we heard echoes of our own actions. It was like somebody mimicking our branch-breaking sounds. This was even more unsettling when we realized the unlikelihood of another person being in that same remote spot. Later that evening, our attempts to recreate the sounds were interrupted by a strange and frightening sight, a shadowy figure hiding behind a tree. Panic took over and we fled back to our cabin. That night's discussion was more sober as we tried to make sense of the figure and the sounds. Fast forward a year and we were back, this time with an additional friend. We briefed him about our prior adventures, which he met with skepticism. Yet the ensuing days made a believer out of him. Our encounters this time were mostly around the lagoon area. We again heard the footsteps, and on our last day, a terrifying, indescribable screech. Investigating, we were met with a sudden, massive sound of something heavy hitting the ground. We fled in terror, only to later encounter a black bear which, to our astonishment, seemed just as afraid and bolted away. It wasn't afraid of us, either. It was running from the direction where we had just had our encounter. It barely even looked at us. As I contemplate revisiting this year, I recount this story to seek insights. Two distinct entities seem to reside there. The elusive woodsman or tree knocker and the aggressive entity that we have dubbed the Screecher. Despite scouring the internet, I have found no similar experiences. Does anybody have insights or theories about these mysterious presences? The location, despite its oddities, is genuinely picturesque and offers great amenities. It's known as Purden Lake Resort, with a notable green roof. Anyway, I welcome any theories about what might be lurking there. I work as a bartender in a quaint town nestled in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia. The establishment I work at is housed in a heritage building, standing proudly on the main street. Over a century old, it opened its doors, I believe, as a hotel in the 1920s, or perhaps even earlier. From the moment I began working there a year ago, whispers of a resident ghost circulated among the staff. My general manager and co-workers would recount their eerie experiences, unexplained events that left a chill in the air. More than once, as we settled the cash register at the end of the night, items that had no reason to fall would spontaneously tumble, startling us. Inconsequential things, like plates with sugar or salt, would suddenly take on a foreboding presence. However, one particular night stands out, an experience so strange that I still grapple with its reality. It was nearing midnight, our official closing time, and the only souls remaining were my general manager, the chef, a line cook, 
and a friend who awaited my shift's end. Given the peacefulness of the evening, I had wrapped up my duties early and decided to step outside for a cigarette. Adjacent to the bar is a liquor store, accessible from the back of our building. A stairway leads down to the back street and to the right, there's a door to a shared storage room, which proves handy if we ever run low on supplies during a busy evening. Only a privileged few, my general manager among them, possess a key to this room. As my cigarette neared its end, I began my ascent up the stairs. Midway, I noticed a hand from within, pulling the back door closed. The light from the room streamed out, and I presumed my general manager had ventured in, perhaps to retrieve something. However, as I entered the bar, there he was, seated as before. Puzzled, I said, I just saw someone slip into the storage room. I thought it was you, but here you are. His casual demeanor shifted in an instant. Rising briskly, we both headed to the storage area. He unlocked the door, disarmed the alarm, and scoured the room. Moments later, he returned, confirming that the room was empty. We often play pranks on each other, but the gravity of my expression assured him that this wasn't one of those times. With a mix of amusement and unease, he said, Well, it seems like you've had your introduction to our resident ghost. Welcome, I guess. In 2003, fresh out of high school, I was living in a quaint town in the Rocky Mountains of British Columbia. Despite its breathtaking altitude and scenic views, it was a place with a small populace, exuding a distinctly rural vibe. One night, my best friend and I found ourselves lounging in her Honda Civic. We had parked on a secluded dirt road, deep within the woods, ensconced by trees with a clearing overhead. As we chatted away, reveling in the melodies of our favorite tracks and enjoying some devil's lettuce, the clock neared one o'clock in the morning. Out of the blue, a strange phenomenon occurred. Every inch of our surroundings, the sky above and even the interior of our car, were illuminated by an intense neon blue light. This glow, which lasted for about two to three seconds, was unique because it was completely omnipresent. It didn't cast a shadow. It didn't really have a source. It wasn't like a spotlight. It felt as if the light permeated everything and vanished as quickly as it appeared. Our initial reaction was shock. We first thought maybe it was the police, but a quick scan of our environment confirmed our isolation no soul in sight, and the town was enveloped in its usual nocturnal stillness. Without exchanging many words, driven by a sense of unease, we started the car and made our way home. To this day, we have no idea what that light could have been. Boston's Freedom Trail is a path steeped in history, a two and a half mile long route that takes you past 16 historically significant sites. It's a well-trodden path for tourists, but for locals like me, it's also a popular running route. On cool mornings, the trail offers a chance to immerse oneself not just in exercise, but also in the echoes of revolutions past. It was one such morning, the city still shrouded in mist, that I encountered something profoundly inexplicable. I was nearing the Paul Revere house, lost in thought, when the distant sound of footsteps caught my attention. They were rhythmic, unmistakably those of another runner. However, the steps sounded older, more like the clatter of dress shoes than modern sneakers. 
Curious, I increased my pace, attempting to catch a glimpse of the fellow early bird. Rounding a corner, I saw him, a man dressed entirely out of time. His attire resembled the colonial era, breeches, a waistcoat, and even a tricorn hat. Oddly, he seemed to shimmer, his form not entirely solid, more like a figure rendered in watercolors. He was not one of the reenactors of the area. Of that, I was sure. The man ran with a purpose, occasionally glancing over his shoulder with an expression of deep concern, as if being chased. He didn't seem to see me, though. Deciding to follow, I kept a respectful distance. The journey felt timeless, every footfall resonating with whispers of yesteryears. As we neared the old state house, the man's pace became frantic. It was then that I recalled a tale I'd once heard, a patriot during the American Revolution who had been entrusted with a message vital for the colonial leaders. He was pursued relentlessly, but was said to have mysteriously vanished without delivering his message, changing the course of a pivotal battle. Reaching the old state house's steps, the phantom runner suddenly stopped, his form dissipating into the morning fog leaving behind only silence. I stood there, heart pounding, trying to process what I'd witnessed. My city, Boston, was not just a guardian of the past. It was an active participant in its retelling. Now, whenever I lace up my running shoes and hit the Freedom Trail, I do so with reverence, understanding that every step taken is not just a stride forward, but also a journey back into the embrace of Boston's history. Symphony Hall, home to the Boston Symphony Orchestra, is renowned for its flawless acoustics and architectural splendor. Little did I know, however, that the hallowed hall is also played host to sounds from beyond our realm. I had recently joined the team as an audio technician, a job that often required me to be in the hall during odd hours, testing equipment, and ensuring everything was set for performances. One evening, after the last musician had left, I stayed behind to calibrate a new sound system. With the vast hall empty and silent, I set to work. Suddenly, the unmistakable sound of a violin filled the room. The melody was mournful, yet beautiful, echoing through the hall with perfect clarity. Initially assuming that a musician had stayed behind to practice, I followed the sound to its source. However, when I reached the main stage, it was completely empty. The music, meanwhile, seemed to be emanating from a specific seat in the audience. Approaching cautiously, I found an old photograph on the seat. It was of a young woman, violin in hand, her eyes reflecting a deep passion for music. Puzzled, I showed the photograph to an elderly janitor who had worked at Symphony Hall for decades. His face turned pale as he shared the tale of Eleanor, a prodigious violinist from the 1920s touted to be the next big sensation in classical music. On the eve of her debut performance at Symphony Hall, she tragically passed away, her dream of playing on the grand stage left unfulfilled. Legend had it that her spirit still visited the hall, playing her violin, pouring her soul into every note, ensuring her music resonated in a place she held so dear. Skeptical, yet intrigued, I placed a recorder in the hall every night. Each morning, I would find a new recording of a mysterious violin solo, each more poignant than the last. Though I never saw Eleanor's spirit, I felt her presence every time I stepped into Symphony Hall. Her haunting melodies became a testament to the undying passion artists hold for their craft, transcending even the barriers of life and death. Now, when the lights dim and the audience settles, I often close my eyes, listening intently, hoping to catch a note or two from Eleanor's violin. 
a spectral serenade forever echoing within the walls of Symphony Hall. Boston Opera House, a place of magnificence, where art and history meld into one. Its ornate architecture is a testament to bygone eras, and its walls have witnessed countless tales of passion, tragedy, and triumph. But there's one story that remains largely untold, hidden amidst the applause and standing ovations. It began on a night like any other. I was attending a performance of Swan Lake, a favorite of mine. As the ballet progressed, I became entranced by a dancer who wasn't listed in the program. Her movements were graceful, transcending the bounds of the stage, almost ethereal. Every pirouette and leap seemed to defy gravity. During the intermission, I inquired about her, but to my surprise, no one else seemed to have noticed her. They attributed my query to being captivated by the main performers, but I was certain of what I had seen. The ballet resumed, but she was nowhere in sight. That was until the final act. As the curtain slowly descended, she appeared at the edge of the stage, bathed in a single spotlight, dancing a melancholic solo. As her dance reached its climax, she vanished, leaving only echoing silence behind. Intrigued, I decided to delve into the history of the opera house. Buried in the archives, I found a tragic story from the 1920s. Lillian, a prodigious ballerina, was set to debut her solo performance. But on the eve of her premiere, she mysteriously vanished, never to be seen again. The lore goes that on some nights, when the moon is just right and the stars align, Lillian returns to the stage she never got to grace, dancing her heart out for an audience she never had. Returning to the opera house weeks later, I managed to find an elderly usher who had been working there for decades. When I mentioned Lillian, his eyes clouded with a mix of fear and sadness. He whispered to me that over the years, select attendees, especially those deeply passionate about ballet, have reported seeing a mysterious dancer, always during Swan Lake, always dancing a solo during the curtain call. Lillian's spirit, it seems, is forever intertwined with the opera house, her passion and dedication transcending time. She remains a silent testament to the artists of yesteryear, a reminder that art, in its purest form, is eternal. Now, every time I visit the Boston Opera House, I find a seat in the balcony, gazing at the stage, hoping to catch a glimpse of the timeless dancer, forever trapped between the world of the living and the embrace of the arts. Nestled within the heart of Boston, Beacon Hill is renowned for its cobblestone streets, federal-style row houses, and gaslit lamps. I had recently moved into a quaint brownstone there, relishing the historical ambiance the neighborhood offered. The apartment was cozy, its walls echoing stories from the past. The previous owner had left behind an antique gramophone, a relic from a bygone era. I found it charming, and it quickly became the centerpiece of my living room. One evening, after a particularly tiring day, I was jolted awake by a soft melody playing from the gramophone. Confused, since I hadn't acquired any records for it yet, I approached the device. The turntable spun, but there was no record. The music was hauntingly beautiful, an old ballad of love and loss. As the tune played, a sudden drop in temperature enveloped the room. My breath became visible, forming small puffs of mist. And then, in the dim light of the gas lamp, I saw her. 
a translucent figure dressed in a flowing gown from the 1800s, waltzing alone, her movements graceful and full of longing. Her eyes, deep pools of sadness, seemed to be searching for someone. Not wanting to disturb her, I watched in silent awe. As the final notes of the melody faded, she extended her hand as if beckoning a partner to join her, but alas, no one came. With a forlorn sigh, she vanished, leaving the room in silence. The following day, eager to understand what I had just witnessed, I visited the local library. Delving into the history of my residence, I uncovered a tragic love story from the 19th century. Eleanor, a talented violinist, lived in my very apartment. She was betrothed to a sailor, Thomas, who had promised to return to her after his final voyage. To celebrate their upcoming nuptials, Eleanor had composed a ballad, which she played on her gramophone each night, awaiting Thomas's return. However, he never did. Heartbroken, Eleanor passed away from what folks termed a broken heart. Now it seems her spirit remains tethered to the brownstone of Beacon Hill, forever waiting for her lover's return, seeking solace in the melody of their unfinished love story. Some nights, when the wind howls and the gas lamps flicker, I play the gramophone, filling the room with music, hoping to give Eleanor a few moments of peace and a dance with the memories of her lost love. Beacon Hill, with its gaslit streets and federal-style row houses, always felt to me like a step back in time. The quaint neighborhood, rich in history and allure, was a daily reminder of Boston's storied past. My family's home, passed down through generations, sat nestled in its heart. One summer, while renovating the basement, we unearthed a hidden passage leading to a small, sealed chamber. Inside, we found remnants of what seemed like an old tavern, wooden stools, dusty bottles, and an old ledger filled with names, many dating back to the revolutionary era. Soon after the discovery, strange occurrences began. Every night, muffled voices echoed from the basement, the clinking of glasses, laughter, and debates, all culminating into the tune of a fiddle. It was as though the tavern had sprung back to life, playing host to its long departed patrons. Curiosity overcoming fear, I decided to spend a night in the chamber. As midnight approached, the atmosphere shifted. The room, though void of any living soul but myself, felt crowded. Shadows flitted across the walls and soon the murmurs began. I could discern snippets of conversations, tales of battle, secret meetings, revolutionary plans, and stories of love and loss. Among these voices, one stood out, a young woman's voice singing a mournful ballad of a lover lost at sea. As dawn neared, the spectral gathering waned, and the chamber plunged back into silence. I emerged from the basement feeling a deep connection with the spirits that once called Boston their home. Digging deeper into the house's history, I learned that it stood atop an old tavern, a hot spot for revolutionaries, thinkers, and sailors in the 18th century. The singer, as per local legends, was Lillian, the tavern owner's daughter, who often sang for patrons and tragically lost her fiancé to the tempestuous Atlantic. Today, our basement remains a testament to Beacon Hill's vibrant past. While we've modernized it, the old chamber is preserved, and on some nights, when the winds howl and the city sleeps, you can still hear the echoes of a time gone by, the whispers beneath the cobblestones, reminding us of the souls that once walked these streets and the stories they left behind.
I was in Germany participating in a military exercise. Being an American, this was my first time in Europe, and also my first time in Germany. I loved being there, as I have a huge fascination with military history, especially World War II. This is important, because it might have something to do with my unexplainable occurrence. We headed out to do some training. Our location was deep in the German countryside. There were some other military units out there training with us. Aside from them, any real civilization was miles away. At this particular point, we had been out for three days or so. We still had about a week to go, and we weren't expecting anything crazy to happen this early in the week. That's when we got attacked by the people who pretended to be the enemy. While most units received a direct attack, we did not. Tasked with providing communications to our artillery unit, our position was farther away. My best estimate is that we were at least two kilometers away from everybody else. To add to this, we were on top of a huge hill, so our radio signals could reach farther and be more effective. Regardless, we still needed to pull security to be safe. I happened to be the first one on guard shift that morning, so I grabbed our machine gun and headed out from our vehicle. As I mentioned, the hill was huge. As such, there was only one way to approach it, a tank trail. This trail went from the bottom of the hill all the way to the top where we were. The top of the hill was flat for the most part, but there was another smaller hill to the left of the road. To get to the bottom of the small hill, you would follow the road to the top and then go about 30 meters to your left. This small hill was the perfect spot to set up a machine gun nest, so that's where I put it. Based on the position, it was impossible to come up behind me. The hill was quite steep and was covered with heavy brush and dense trees. The foliage was so thick, in fact, that the only way to approach my position was from the direction I was looking. Fast forward 30 minutes or so, and the sun is just starting to rise through the trees. It was so quiet and peaceful, and I sat on guard enjoying the beauty of Germany when it happened. I heard a very distinct, hushed voice say, Hey! Almost as if it was right next to me. It seemed like someone was trying to get my attention without making too much noise. The wind wasn't blowing. The birds weren't chirping. All I could hear was this whisper. I looked around to make sure that nobody had somehow been able to sneak up on me, but there wasn't a soul in sight. The rest of my squad was a good 100 meters away, in the vehicle, and I couldn't even hear them. It freaked me out, but I had no choice but to stay at my post. I tried to brush off the incident, but then my sergeant tried to sneak up on me a couple of hours later. I caught him, though. He hadn't realized how steep the hill was, nor how covered in brush. I heard him coming a mile away. He congratulated me for having my head on a swivel and doing the right thing. We started to talk, and that's when he told me a story that made my blood run cold. The area we were training in was a World War II battlefield. A lot of American soldiers from our sister unit had died around those parts. They'd had no artillery support, and the Germans were so well dug in they couldn't do anything about it. That information, combined with the World War II ammo cans and machine gun belts we found there, helped me put two and two together. I'm not sure what to think about this. I have no explanation for why I heard this voice. I believe in the supernatural, but I also believe in trying to find a logical explanation first. The thing is, nothing adds up. I wasn't tired, there was nobody around me, and there were no other sounds in the forest. Part of me believes that it was the spirit of a soldier from our sister troop, still fighting, hoping that I would help. But at the end of the day, the truth is, I don't know.
For the past two weeks, my family and I have been traveling around various countries in Europe. Unfortunately, we had our passports stolen in Belgium and had to make a couple last minute changes to our plans, one of which included booking a hotel in a new city for one night. We stopped just for the night between trains in Cologne, Germany. I helped my parents find the last minute reservation online and it was a pretty standard apartment style rental. When we arrived at the rental, we were all impressed by the views of the nearby cathedral and church spires, the shingled roofs, just the general feel of history that the whole town had. We went out for dinner and came back after dark, all heading to bed for our early train the next morning. I shared a room with my little brother, and my parents slept in the next room over. I remember asking them if we could swap rooms, because I didn't like the layout of ours. There were way too many doors for me to feel comfortable. I have a weird thing where I don't like sleeping near doors, and I can't sleep in a room with any doors left open. Anyway, they said no, we could just stay in the original room, which had doors to the kitchen, hallway, and two closets. I was too tired to push it, and I figured my fatigue would override my personal habits, so I just got ready for bed and tried to go to sleep. While I was sleeping, I remember having some cycles of regular dreams. Then all of a sudden, I woke up within another dream. I was lying in the same bed, in the exact same room, and my little brother was lying in the same bed too. It felt exactly as though I had just woken up normally. Now I have very vivid dreams sometimes, but I've never dreamed about being in the exact room I'm in, and I've never woken up to a dream within a dream. In this dream, I was sitting up in bed and so was my brother. I could feel that for some reason, we were both very scared, and there was this charged and anxious feeling in the room. I remember my little brother saying, what is that? Get out your flashlight. At the same time, we were both looking at the far end of the room, where it was darker and away from the windows. It was like we were both almost too scared to speak, but I could feel that we were both sensing whatever dark energy was at the end of the room. I started to fumble for my phone flashlight, just for some light, when all of a sudden this thing, the closest I can describe it as is a dark blob of energy, moved super quickly over next to my side of the bed. My brother and I screamed at the same time as this thing rushed up next to me. That's exactly when I woke up for real, at about 2.30 in the morning. My heart was racing and I was sweating so hard, despite the room not being hot at all. I was so unsettled that I turned on all the lights in the room and I didn't sleep for about two more hours until I could finally somewhat relax and drifted back to sleep finally. This experience was very disturbing for me. I never wake up early in the morning for no reason, as I usually sleep through the night, and I rarely, if ever, have nightmares. Like I said, I have vivid dreams, but they're usually not bad. I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a phenomenon like this, or if you know what it's called. Can people have paranormal encounters in their sleep while in certain spaces? Was I just having a really vivid nightmare? Or was that experience a signal that something bad was in that room? In 2018, a group of friends from college and I decided to go and spend a month in Berlin over the summer. We spent our time between part-time jobs, partying and just simply enjoying the city and its cultural activities. Everyone in the group was cycling places, but not me. We had a bit of a bike situation with mine, and so I decided to spend the rest of our time there on foot or using the metro. It wasn't that much of a bother, until we decided to go and party near the River Spree. This place has bars and clubs, and it's overall a great place to party. But from what I recall, public transportation didn't go that far in the middle of the night. They had all cycled there, 
so I was the only one without a means to go back to our apartment. It was a 20 minute cycle from the bar, but it was at least a 35 minute walk. A friend of mine, I'll call her Ava, decided to walk back with me and just take her bike next to her so that she wouldn't leave me alone wandering around the city in the middle of the night. It was about 4 a.m. by the time we left. As we're walking down this rather big street and chatting, I remember smelling food and seeing this restaurant past the pedestrian crossing to which we were headed. I'm a foodie and I was rather hungry, so that was pretty appealing. A woman was sitting there having some kind of food. She had black hair. I could see her profile through the large windows, which took up almost the entire wall up to the ceiling. I specifically remember thinking, that's weird that they're still open at this time of night. I remember telling myself I had to tell Ava about it when the flow of conversation allowed it. As I was walking and starting to cross the road, the crossing in front of the restaurant, things got kind of blank. It's like I was on autopilot. I was hearing her voice, but it was kind of muffled. Once we were past this restaurant, Ava stopped, turned to me and said, wait, wasn't there a restaurant just there with a woman eating? I had completely forgotten to tell her. It's like my memory had been wiped and restored within seconds. And there it was, a hotel. The large windows were the same and inside was the hotel's restaurant with a layout and tables that looked nothing like what we saw and nobody was sitting there eating. We were both very shocked and saw that a male receptionist with short hair was in there. I knew we just had to ask him if somebody had just been eating there. It was just too weird. He was a little bit freaked out about us coming in like that, but he said he'd been alone in there for hours. After discussing with Ava, we found out that she also saw the woman eating, but she only saw her back. She was seated with her back to the window. While I could tell everything about this woman, because I saw her entire profile. After that, Ava never wanted to talk about it again. She got mad whenever I tried to bring it up. People seem to have changed around me after this event too. Even my mom started to not remember things that she should have remembered. And a lot of people just seemed different overall. I must also note that I was not drunk, not by a long shot. And staying up that late was really common for me at the time. So I didn't feel sleep deprived either. Also, Ava saw the same thing I did. Interestingly enough, the name of the hotel that was originally a restaurant when we saw it is the Grimm Hotel, in reference to the author of many fairy tale stories. All in all, a very weird experience. For context, I live in Germany. My boyfriend's childhood home is old. How old, nobody knows exactly. It might have been built around the beginning of the 20th century, but it could be older. It's a three-level house with a huge archway at the first floor that marks its age. There are two stories I want to tell you. The first one happened when we had just started dating. My boyfriend had searched for his room key for quite a while. It appeared to be lost forever. One day I entered his room and there was the key, laying perfectly placed in the middle of the bed. When he came home from work, I mentioned that I was glad he had found his key. He looked at me confused and I pointed at the door where I put the key in. He said, I never found it. Later we asked his parents and sister if they had placed it there but they denied it. To this day, we don't know how it ended up there. The second story happened pretty recently. The building has two front doors. The inner front door squeaks remarkably if you open it, so everyone knows when somebody's coming inside. 
My boyfriend's mother and I sat at the dinner table. His dad was watching soccer on the TV next to us on the third floor. My boyfriend and his sister were out of the house. Suddenly, my mother-in-law and I heard the front door. Then another door-like sound. Oh, someone must have come in, my mother-in-law said. She went down the first stair and said, hello. No answer. She decided to take a look herself. Not a single soul in sight. At the exact moment she went down to look, my boyfriend opened the door and came in, just to see the two of us confused. We asked if he was mocking us. He affirmed that he hadn't even been inside before, so the door wasn't him. He and his mom both told me that these kinds of things have happened to them before. Doors open, things move, sometimes you hear steps that aren't supposed to be there. Apparently, they call their ghost Herbert, after their uncle that passed away a few years ago. I guess it's a friendly soul. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Ital, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single bedroom all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway our rooms were in, I remember almost feeling as though I walked into a wall of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that that wing of the hotel was odd. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about two o'clock in the morning, I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room, because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming black shape was visible in the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only for nothing to be there. The window was locked from the inside, and there was nobody in the closet or the bathroom. My room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing games on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room, but when she turned on the light, there was nobody there. It was just a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I never got to experience anything after that, but it still freaks me out to this day. I was little, like kindergarten starting first grade little. I lived in Germany at the time due to being an army brat. My little sister is two years younger than me, so we did everything together. We lived in a two-story farmhouse style home, and my little sister and I were playing in our room. I don't remember when he came, but we started playing with a boy a little bit older than us. I don't remember ever seeing him, just talking to him and playing games and other kid stuff. It was like he kind of just appeared. My sister and I would later realize that the little farm boy was kind of a jerk because he would turn off the lights in whatever room we were in, mostly our bedroom, and lock the doors. We would find each other in the dark, scared, but also a little bit annoyed. I remember telling my sister to try to find the light and I would get the door. 
they were both next to each other. I couldn't open the door, so I began to bang on it, when my sister, in a panicked voice, said that she couldn't find the light. I was kind of mad scared, and I thought that she was pulling my leg. And she was small, so I was like, move over, let me try. I felt around the area where I know the light switch was, but all I found was a wall. Confused, I decided to find the bottom of the wall, use both of my hands, and just slide them all the way up as high as I could. Nothing. I then told my sister to do what I had just done, and I would do the same at the top. But we would do kind of a slow zigzag pattern just in case we weren't going far enough. Our hands eventually grazed each other, and we realized we couldn't find a thing. There was no light switch. So I turned back to the door, and I ordered my little sister to start banging on the door and screaming. We did this for what felt like forever. I was even more confused because mom should be making dinner right now, and dad would be getting home soon, or he already was. My other older sisters were never home, so they weren't on my list of rescuers. My little sister and I started to give up, thinking that this was just our life now, in the dark next to the door. We weren't about to go into the abyss behind us. Then, all of a sudden, our mom came to the door, and we shouted that we were stuck. Dad got us out, and my little sister and I were pissed. We thought they were being mean and meant to do that to us. We started saying, didn't you hear us? We were shouting and banging on the door. They looked confused and said, we never heard anything. We told them about the farm boy and that we didn't want to play with him if he kept doing that. We actually played with that boy until we left and I'm still quite miffed about some of the things that he did. But looking back on it, I don't know. That's one heck of a prank, right? I'm starting to wonder what that boy was really up to, if he was even a little boy at all. I'm 22, currently in the military, and I was an army brat until I was 12. I moved all the time, overseas twice and to 10 different states. I lived a very unusually unstable life because of this. My first life memory that I can recall, I was six. My father was stationed in Fort Sill. We lived in Lawton and this tiny brick house, very old and creepy. I recall going to take a bath before I went to bed, and I saw this odd sort of organic, amoeba-shaped, fluorescent, transparent green thing just a few feet above the bathroom tile. It floated out and disappeared. I was genuinely unconcerned and thought that I was tired. I go to bed, and in the middle of the night, this thing woke me up and had me follow it down the hallway. It leads me to the living area, where I kid you not, the whole house is full of fluorescent, transparent green people, dressed in like 1800 type clothing. I'm six at the time, so how do I even know what period clothing looks like? I couldn't tell you. I was older when I finally saw an old western movie and recognized the clothes. These people looked at me, watched me intently, and were very still. One man stood up and began walking toward me. I remember leaving and going back to bed, scared as heck and pulling the blankets over my head. Enter the rest of my life until around the time I turned 20. From this day on, every night for several years, I would have the same dream about these things. I would ignore it. I never again followed the thing if it came for me. I didn't want to know what would happen. I was an odd, quiet kid, and I guess I just accepted that it would be this way. I didn't tell my parents for a very long time. When I got used to the dreams, and the thing, I firmly believed it began manifesting itself in different ways. For instance, if I left my bedroom and shut the door behind me, the door would unlatch and pop back open, as if somebody was behind me and needed to open the door again to follow me. 
My father can even confirm this to this day, and he's a complete skeptic. My belongings always moved around and would be found in odd places. The lights would be on, the doors would open. It drove my parents nuts. My best friend, we'll call her T, dubbed this very masculine presence of mine, Ed. T and I have been friends for eight years now, and she definitely had to accept Ed as well. As I got older and began driving, Ed would ride in the back seat of my car. I could hear him adjust in his seat, or the occasional arm resting on the door. It sounded as if somebody was just casually riding in the back seat. Once I was driving to a nearby town at night and I got tired. I almost veered off the road, but something shook my shoulder and woke me up. Maybe Ed is evil or just incredibly protective. For example, we had a rabid dog in our neighborhood once that I encountered while on a walk. This dog, foaming at the mouth, came up to me. Once it got close, it's like he got hit hard by something. Not enough to really hurt him, but just enough to get him to go away. He ducked and kind of yelped and scampered off quickly. I could never see the source of what this was. Another occasion, I had gotten mad at Ed for moving some of my things and while going to the fridge during dinner, my whole family watched the light fixture above my head explode and shatter. Right as I said, Ed needs to get the heck out of my life. Luckily, I was the only one hurt and I only needed two stitches. T has some interesting stories as well, as Ed didn't always want her around. Ed only got really scary whenever we moved, or really when I moved. When I packed my things, that's when it got bad. By bad, I mean whenever we were getting ready to move again, things began happening to slow down the process. When we went from Sill to Vilsack, Germany, the power in our house repeatedly went out. Two of my boxes opened and unpacked themselves onto the floor, and our house was broken into and many things were stolen. This would become a pattern every single time we started to move. On top of that, every time we arrived somewhere new, I could feel that Ed wasn't anywhere near us from about three days to two weeks. And then he would show up. It was almost as though he had to do his own traveling to catch up. For whatever reason, Ed left me in March of 2017. I lived in an old house in Montana, in downtown Helena, a very historic mining town. The house was built in 1889. It was a duplex. I rented one unit and I lived there alone for much of the time. I had a boyfriend who I dated for a long time and we lived together for some time. He knew of Ed and while he never wanted to discuss it, he was also not really bothered by it. The day we broke up and the day he moved out and never came back, I sat in the living room crying, and I said out loud to Ed that I needed to be alone. I basically begged him to leave. I heard an odd noise. It was like a choked cry, maybe a cough or a sigh, I couldn't really place it. And then things suddenly felt empty and quiet, like I had more space. I remember never feeling this way except for those short times after a move when Ed wasn't there. That's how I knew Ed had left. Ed has never returned. It's been years now, and part of me still wonders if this terrifying thing will one day come back. I never say his name out loud. I don't bring him up, and no one that knows of him says a thing. We all just know. I lived with this thing for a long, long time. He followed me to basic training too. I often wonder what Ed was. He held power over me, preferred me to treat him in a certain way. If I ever spoke badly of him, he retaliated. Although I only did that by accident a time or two. On other occasions, he protected me. I know how crazy all of this sounds, that's why only a handful of people in my personal life ever knew about Ed. All of us still really wonder what in the world he was.
Up until the point of 2008, I wasn't okay with the supernatural, nor did I put much stock into it. I was already socially awkward enough as it was, and I was stuck in that awful teenage phase of not like other girls. But I also didn't think that I was special enough to see ghosts, an idea that I would come to regret. I'd really be okay now if I never saw one again. For more context, after we had moved into this house during the summer of 07, my parents noted that I had undergone a significant personality change. I was suddenly nasty, aggressive, abusive to people who had never harmed me before, even to my friends. Previously, I was just a goofy kid that teachers didn't quite know how to talk to, but I was otherwise considered very bright and pleasant to be around. I was no stranger to moving every other year, and this move had barely bothered me, so they knew I wasn't just upset. It was late one night, my dad was away for work, and it was just me, my mother, my little brother, and my dog that week. For some reason, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me. I sat up in bed to see a dark figure standing in the corner of my room, almost indiscernible at first glance. I didn't yell, I didn't panic at first, because I thought that I had to be dreaming. I wasn't special, and non-special people don't do cool things like see ghosts. I tried to fall back asleep, but it was pretty tricky, and I felt like I was being watched for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked to sleep in another room, slightly more fearful now, but thinking I just needed a change of pace. It was a fluke, and by sleeping elsewhere, my brain would reset, and I would be fine. I had not just seen a ghost. My mother thought that I was acting up for attention, but figured it wasn't the hill to die on and let me sleep elsewhere. So I did. That thing followed me. It waited at the foot of my bed all night, staring me down as I tried to sleep. I was so exhausted from the lack of sleep the previous night that I did manage to drift off, but it was a restless sleep. I tried to envision myself surrounded by white light, like the Tolkien elves, hoping that it might repel the darkness. The third day, I was sat at the table with a few friends and their mothers and my own family. We had just had dinner and were doling out the cinnamon rolls when I suddenly felt my whole body get heavy, like somebody had just added a 50 pound weight to my skull. I couldn't stop it. I slumped forward in my chair, despite my grabbing at the back of it to stay upright. My eyes just about rolled into the back of my head. Someone asked me if I was okay. I couldn't see. I couldn't see, and yet I could. I suddenly saw a flat plane stretched out before me, and everything was gray. The dark figure stood right in front of me. And then it rushed me. It ran at me so fast I didn't know what to do. I couldn't do anything. I had to fight to pry my jaws apart, and I screamed. It was like the screaming released me, and I about knocked my chair into the wall I shot back so hard. I was sobbing, and I could hardly catch my breath, while everyone tried to figure out what was wrong. I told my mother what I saw, that the thing was back and that it tried to hurt me. I think this finally convinced her that I wasn't crazy, that something was wrong and I wasn't just trying to get attention. I wasn't a crier, I hated being caught crying. After I was calmed down, she took her two friends upstairs with her to my room. She didn't tell me until several years later that her friends had seen it had seen this dark presence in my room, could prove that I wasn't lying, that I wasn't crazy. The dog often followed her around the house while she was doing chores, but he refused to go anywhere near my room. He actually growled at my room, hackles raised kind of a growl. Even after we moved to a new house, my dog never wanted to stay long in my room again. I don't know if it was because he remembered the bad thing from before, or if something had been irreparably broken in me, or was now a part of me. I couldn't walk into churches anymore without having sudden, unexplainable breakdowns. I would feel like hands were choking me. I would struggle to breathe. I would feel a hundred emotions at once and start sobbing. Needless to say, I quit entering churches after more than a few bad experiences. 
We found a journal in my room a few months before I moved out for uni, full of crazy ramblings, written by something that said it was a monster, that my parents would unalive me if they discovered I was no longer human, that it would have to hurt my family first to stay alive. I burned it immediately, and I tossed the remnants into the trash can. The scariest part of that was, all of it was in my handwriting, and yet I don't remember writing any of it. My family still wonders to this day what it was. Germany is small and so many new things got built on top of old things all the time. We lived close to Celtic tombs, had visited old mounds and tall obelisks mounted on them. We lived next to a walled city. Buildings in the village could be dated back several centuries prior and were still inhabited by people today. Maybe our home was on top of someone's grave. The weirdest coincidence of all was that the people who had lived there before us had developed a reputation of being quite nasty as well. I wonder if they'd always been that way, or if maybe the same thing that happened to me, and changed me, changed them, too. So when I was 20 and in the army, I was sent to my first duty station in Germany. The barracks we lived in were converted old five-story buildings that were supposedly once the headquarter buildings for the Nazi party. From what we were told, the basement of the building that I lived in had been converted into our armory. However, supposedly, it had once been filled with ovens and a gas chamber. Apparently, a lot of people died in that building. There were all kinds of underground tunnels below our caserne that had outbuildings on base. They were, of course, off limits, but we snuck in some anyway. Aside from the underground tunnels, the building that we lived in was super creepy. I was on the very top floor. My friends and I would be in a room watching a movie and doors would fling open. We all had strange experiences. I would get woken up regularly by something nudging me and calling my name. I would wake up and see figures in my room. I would hear footsteps in the attic above my room almost every night. It became normal for me. As I'm telling this story, I'm getting creeped out. Anyway, one night around two or three in the morning, I got woken up by a nudge and I see all these lights on in the hallway from under my bedroom door. Then I hear tons of people walking in the hallway, like a crowd of people. I thought, what the heck? Are we having an alert? That's a random deployment readiness inspection that happens early in the morning. I thought maybe nobody told me. I threw on my uniform and opened the door, and it was completely dark. There wasn't a single light on, and nobody was in the hallway. I thought I was going crazy. It's the weirdest thing that's happened to me. I really just stood there in shock. I had no idea what was going on. I went back to bed, thinking I had completely lost my mind. I never told my friends, because I thought I was losing it. I guess it can all be attributed to dreaming or sleepwalking or a half-awake state. I mean, I know there's a reasonable explanation for everything, but honestly, in my heart, I know those barracks were haunted. This was back in 2006. A group of friends and I decided to spend the weekend in Germany to watch some of the World Cup games in the local town squares of Frankfurt. We flew in from the UK. Things go as expected, lots of beer and lots of fun. The evening is getting really late and we find ourselves struggling to find any more bars open at the time. We end up walking a bit and we find ourselves at the river. We decide to walk along it to see if we come across any place that's open. 
It's mostly just trees, grass, and small parks. It was clear that we weren't going to find anywhere here to get a drink. We rounded a corner, and all of a sudden there are these huge tents with music playing, a good amount of people, and beer being served. Great, we hit the jackpot. So we all find a table. It wasn't a waitress-style venue, more like a mini-festival vibe. So I offer to go buy drinks at the bar and bring them back. The girl at the bar asks me what I'd like, in German. She realizes that I am English, from my terrible German, and we start chatting in English. After a few exchanges, she says that she wants to introduce me to someone and to follow her behind the bar. So I follow her, and we walk behind the bar and out behind the tent. It's quite a large open space, with no one else there except a group of guys in the back corner of this grassy area. She walks straight toward these guys and introduces me to them with something along the lines of, Hey, this guy is English too. I think you'll get along. She then turns around and walks back to where we'd come from, leaving me with these guys. I say hello and we start small talking. I can't really remember what about, where I'm from in England and why I'm in Germany, things like that. Turns out these guys are from the same town as where one of the friends that I'm with is from. I end up chatting with them for what seems like an hour or so to the point where I completely lost track of time. That's when my friend finds me. I see him walking across the grass from the tent. He says they're about ready to leave and to come on with them. I say sure, but just before we leave, let me introduce you to my new friends as they're from your town. He says hello and asks where about in the town they live. It turns out they live on the same street as one of my friend's uncles. My friend asks per chance if he knows his uncle, and the guy says, yeah, actually, it's his dad. Now both of these guys realize that they're first cousins. My original friend's dad isn't in his life anymore, and he doesn't ever have any contact with that side of the family, but obviously knows who they are. So it kind of makes sense that these guys have never met each other before, but they know who each other are once they connected the dots. Anyway, they chit chat a bit, exchange numbers, and they still keep in touch to this day. As we're walking away from the group, my friend asks me why I decided to go up to these guys in particular and strike up a conversation. So I tell him about the girl behind the bar who wanted to introduce us. That's when he looks at me really weirdly and explains that he watched me go to the bar to get drinks. According to him, it looked like I was speaking to nobody, and then I just wandered through to the back area behind the bar. It was fully open so he could see through. And I walked directly over to this group of guys, and then stood there talking for that hour. My friends ended up deciding to leave me to it and just got drinks themselves until they were ready to leave. To this day, my friends do not believe me that there was any girl or third party there. To them, I just walked up to a bar, spoke to no one, and then walked up to a random group of guys in a reasonably busy beer tent away from the main area. And then one of them ended up being my friend's first cousin. Since I was making a big deal about how there was definitely somebody that introduced us, otherwise why would I hone in on a bunch of strangers and start chatting, my friend ended up calling his cousin to ask him exactly what happened. Apparently, I did just walk up to them with no one else there and start chatting. They found it a bit weird, but they just went with it. Now, I don't know if it's a glitch or what, but it's really odd especially because we're in a different country. If we were in the same town or even anywhere in the UK, it might not have been that weird and I could have explained it away, but we hadn't bumped into any other British people the entire weekend. Anyway, I've always dwelled on this and I just refuse to accept that there wasn't somebody who introduced us. I remember it vividly. And I know that being drunk doesn't help me, and it makes me question my version of events too. But I remember this person. I mean, I've gone drinking a lot, and I've never hallucinated before. So, I honestly don't know how to explain it.
A couple of months ago for my sister's birthday, she wanted us to take a trip to Savannah, Georgia. She paid for the hotel, which was a room in one of the guest houses from the historic 1790 Inn. The guest house itself was located directly across from the old Thomas House and slave quarters, and a couple blocks behind us was the Colonial Park Cemetery. I had looked the place up, looking for ghost experiences, but nothing came of it really. Lots of people had said that they had no ghost experiences, but that it was a nice day. So while I was excited to stay, I wasn't really expecting anything paranormal to happen. Now there were a few small things that could easily be explained away perhaps. Like a few times we thought we had left our parlor door open, only to come back to find it closed. Or we left the TV in our room off and we came back to find it on. But maybe we were just really forgetful. While at Colonial Park Cemetery, we both felt a pull on our right pockets and we felt cold spots. Again, small things that could probably be explained away. But after exploring the city all day and having some night tours, got to go by the Sorrelweed house too, we went back to the hotel exhausted. We were sharing the bed. We grew up together mostly sharing a room, so this was nothing new for us. But we were laying in bed watching TV, both on our phones, when the little trash can by the bathroom sounded like the bag inside was getting rustled very loudly. We both shot up and looked at it. It lasted for about 15 to 20 seconds. I got up, half expecting to see a rat or something pop out. The hotel was very clean. I never saw any rats or bugs, but I couldn't think of anything else it could be. I didn't find any explanation for the sound. I snapped a picture of it and we both ended up going to sleep. It should probably be noted that the vents for the AC unit were on the other side of the room and the trash never made a noise before or after this night. I know it's such a small experience and it's probably not even noteworthy, but at the time, in the moment, it definitely caught my attention. When I was eight to 10 years old in the mid 1990s, my mom worked at a carpet company near Beaufort, Georgia. The building had a storefront where customers could walk through and look at the samples. And in the back, there was a huge warehouse where all kinds of flooring was stored. There was a loading and unloading area with large bay doors that opened up to a concrete loading lot. The loading lot was against an overgrown wooded area but the area still had rural housing dotted here and there, so you could see the backs of a few houses a bit of ways through the woods. In general, the building always gave me the creeps. I would run around the huge hanging carpets in the warehouse while my mom was working up front. One day, while I was waiting for my mom to get off work, the big bay doors were opened, so I went out in the loading area to play outside. After a few minutes, I heard what sounded like a train coming down the tracks. Of course, when you're a kid, you get really excited about that stuff. So I ran out a little farther into the loading lot. Sure enough, I heard a train horn and I could see a train coming down the tracks from the right of the building. I put my hands over my eyes to shield them from the sun so I could see better and I watched this robin egg blue, shiny metal train coming down the track. I remember seeing a lot of rivets. At the time I called them screws because I didn't know what rivets were, on the train and windows that came down, not up. Specifically, I saw people sitting in it and especially a lot of ladies with these kind of round looking hats and a kid running down the middle of the train car. I saw a man smoking a pipe, and I remembered thinking, must be in the smoking section. To give you a better idea, the train front was rounded and the cars were rectangular. The robin egg blue was in some details, like one of the panels under each window, stripes going up the front, 
and a few other small areas. The rest was really shiny, like metal. It seemed like one long train, because the cars were attached really close together. I watched this train pass by, and I was really excited about it. It seemed like my mom came out almost right after it passed to tell me she was ready to leave. I said, I saw the train, it just passed by. She was really confused and told me that there were no trains that passed there. I lamented that there most definitely was a train and I told her everything about it. She said, there's no train that can even come back here. The train tracks end right down there. I seriously thought she was pulling my leg. So I laughed and I said, uh-uh. I ran down there and sure enough, the train track ran out of track just around a bend that wasn't visible from the lot. I swore to her that I had just seen the train pass by and she swore, of course, that I was making it up. As I thought about it, I couldn't really say that I saw any specific facial features of the people on the train though. I remembered the hats, the kid, the pipe smoking, but I couldn't remember what a single face looked like. I kind of dropped it because, yeah, the tracks clearly ended and a train couldn't have gone through. But I brought it up to her and explained the detail of the train again in recent years. She thought I had made it up and couldn't believe the details. But I remember all these years later, and I think she kind of got spooked by it because she finally admitted that she also felt creepy in that building sometimes. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia in the United States. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart from each other. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledge that any animals could stroll along by if they pleased. But I stayed there for about a week. My boyfriend and I sat outside on the front deck every night, very late, and at no point did we feel any danger. It was peaceful, with fireflies out and the sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night. It was eerily dark, too. The moon was heavily covered. It was about midnight. And all of a sudden, I didn't feel at peace like I had those other nights. The forest went completely quiet, and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life, but I can't explain why. I sat there in my chair, looking out into the dark forest, trying to rationalize and calm myself down, that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he felt unsafe. I told him I felt the same way, so we ran inside. The cabin has three floors, and we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof, because we still wanted to be outside and relax. It didn't matter how high up I was, though. I felt something truly evil, and I chose to stay inside. The only other time I have ever felt something so evil was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions a lot. Maybe a bear, but this didn't feel like an animal predator was around. It felt much, much darker. I honestly don't know how to put this or where to begin, and now that I think of it, I don't know who would believe this, but it's true. This happened two years ago when I enlisted into the army, and I did my basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. At the beginning of the cycle, it seemed normal, nothing out of the ordinary until white phase had started. 
I will only share four experiences to avoid this being too long. So hopefully you at least enjoy the stories. Whether or not you believe me is up to you. Experience one. One day, I was a battle buddy for one of my friends who had passed out due to the heat. So he had to stay at the bay for a little while. We were on the other end of the bay that has 55 bunks in it. My roster number was 340 and he was 342. So we were sitting by our bungs talking about random stuff when out of the blue, one of the locks on the 301's locker jingled out of nowhere. Now keep in mind, we're the only ones in the bay, let alone the entire company area, because the others are out training. We stop what we're talking about and he asks me to go check it out. I say no, so we check under the bunks and nobody's there. Experience 2 the second incident happened one night when I woke up at about one in the morning. I slept on the bottom bunk, and the way that I slept had my head facing the middle of the bay. In front of our bunks was a blue tape line, where we would have to line up for different purposes. So I woke up and looked toward the middle, and I thought I saw outlines of people walking back and forth. At least four or five people passed my bunk, or so I thought. I hopped up and threw on my boots and began to tow the line. Then the fire guard came up to me and asked me what I was doing. When I told him what I saw, he said that there was nobody else awake and I should get some sleep. Experience three. This incident happened a few nights after the second one. Again, I woke up at about one o'clock in the morning, but this time it was different. I didn't see anybody walking around Instead, I physically saw a shadow figure sitting at the edge of my bunk. I knew it wasn't one of the others because it was pitch dark. The shadow, I mean. The figure was darker than dark. I just kind of froze up and tried getting the attention of the guy next to me, but he wasn't having it. Eventually, the figure faded away right in front of me, but it was still pretty creepy. This last experience I'll tell you isn't too serious, but it's still weird. One day I was in the latrine and I was shaving and getting ready for the day before anyone else had woken up. Then, randomly, all the paper towel machines, which are motion activated, went off one by one. I checked to see if anybody had come in, but I knew nobody did. I would have heard the door and footsteps but I was just trying to convince myself that there was some kind of an explanation. These are four of the weird and creepy things that happened to me at basic. For disclosure, I'm not crazy, and I also don't know how to explain any of this. I mainly give credit to it most likely being the stress getting to me. I'm not the only one who had experiences though. These are just mine. Even the drill sergeants had experiences of their own that they told us. So, are there ghost recruits wandering around the training areas? Maybe. At the time that this happened, I was living in Georgia. My home was near Richmond Hill and I was working as a lifeguard near Hinesville, which is about 45 minutes away. It was the middle of summer, and I had a later shift, ending at around 9 p.m., and I had stayed in Hinesville until about 1 a.m., hanging out with coworkers before heading home. Now, to give you some context, at the time, I had a four-door Honda CRV. Also, between Hinesville and Richmond, there's pretty much only one road of nothingness, except for one creepy house that, according to some of my friends, was rumored to be a cult house or something where this really weird family lived secluded away from everyone. At night, that stretch of road gets really dark. There's not a lot of traffic or streetlights, and without a moon in the sky or the light of your car, you'd be pretty much blind until sunrise. Well, it was around 1 a.m. and I was heading home. Stupidly, I had forgotten to get gas before I left, and I was close to empty. I was nervous, but I figured I could make it home. 
I made it about five minutes out of Hinesville before I got the feeling that someone was watching me from the back seat. The feeling was so strong that I slowed down. I know I should have stopped, but there was no traffic except for me. I switched on my phone light and I physically turned around and looked in the back seat and in as much of the trunk as I could see, but it was empty. I turned back around, but the feeling stayed and worsened, like somebody was full on glaring at the back of my head, wanting me to notice them. Because I have the worst luck, at that moment my gas tank light came on and my tank hit the empty mark. I was still 30 minutes from home. At this point, I started freaking out. I can't tell you why I thought this, but I just knew that if I ran out of gas and was stranded on the side of the road, something bad would happen to me. It doesn't seem logical, I know, but it honestly felt like someone or something was in my back seat, staring at me with just this incredible hatred and will to hurt me. And if my car stopped, they would get their way. So I did the only thing I could think of I clenched both hands on the wheel and started praying, just begging God to let me get to my house before my car ran out of gas. Now I know this sounds insane, and maybe there's some kind of weird technical explanation for this, because I don't know much about cars. But I swear as I was asking to make it to my house, I watched my gas light go off and my gas tank meter go up to a quarter of a tank. I still felt like there was something in my back seat staring me down, but it felt less intense. The drive felt like forever, but I made it back to the town that I lived in, and the minute I passed the sign saying that I was now in Richmond Hill, my meter went all the way back down to empty, and my gas tank light came on, and it stayed like that the five further minutes it took me to make it to my driveway. The next morning, I talked to my mother about it. For some reason, she thought the thing in my back seat was my grandpa, who had passed away a year earlier and had Alzheimer's. She theorized that he was coming to check up on me, but had scared me because he was still confused in the afterlife. I really don't agree with that. My grandpa was a very loving person. Even when his memory got really bad and he couldn't remember my name, he still remembered me. Rather than saying my name, he said T-Ball because he'd been my T-Ball coach when I was really little. Personally, I feel like whatever it was, was attached to the road and was entirely negative. Either way, I never felt it again and my car never repeated the gas tank trick. Though after that, I started hanging a cross on my rearview mirror, just in case. My wife and I love staying at the Kehoe house. It's lovely, and it's also where we got married. It's also haunted by ghost children. It never fails. Every time we stay there, someone at breakfast is complaining about getting very little sleep due to all the children shaking the bed and pulling on the sheets. We have a friend who was one of the managers there, and while she never saw anything herself, she would often hear odd noises at night. One visit, I decided to leave a digital recorder going in the room while we were gone for the night. I caught a couple of odd sounds here or there, but later on in the recording, I got what was unmistakably the cries of a baby. At breakfast, we noted that no babies or children were guests in the house this visit. Odder still is what we discovered about our room. It seems the bathroom of our room and the neighboring room were once the day nursery for the house. Also, we did an overnight investigation at Moon River Brewery and caught some awesome EVPs. One member of the group had quite the scare in the basement. We heard his scream from upstairs and rushed down to check out the noise. He'd been checking out the back staircase used by the staff and he noticed the dark shadow of someone halfway up. He screamed when it turned and rushed at him. I had my shirt tugged down in the basement, 
My wife and I were taking a break in one of the rooms on the third floor when we were startled by a loud boom in the room across the hall. It sounded like somebody had thrown a brick across the room. We went in but found nothing out of place. Luckily, I had my recorder going and I caught the thunderous sound. Savannah is a place where there is much death due to war or disease. Many people here believe in ghosts, and if you live here long enough, you have plenty of stories to tell, either from your neighbors and friends or your own experiences. Most old places downtown have a tale or two. Heck, these are just a couple for me and I have a ton more. I've lived in Savannah for almost 25 years and I'll probably die here too. Maybe I'll join the ghostly residents and continue this city's paranormal history. One of my good friends in high school had this lake house. It was given to his parents by their grandparents, and they lived in this house from 90 to 93. One day in 1993, his mom woke him and his younger sister up and left the house. It was like two to three in the morning. They went to a restaurant that was open 24 seven and stayed there until sunrise. Then they went home packed all of their clothing and other important items and left the house. They never went back and his mother refuses to speak about what happened. They still own this property. It has two homes on it and it's lakefront, probably worth millions. The power is still on and his dad comes and checks on it every so often. In hearing this story, of course we went to the lake house. Pulling up, a motion sensor floodlight flicked on and stayed on. We unlocked the deadbolt, which requires a key to open on both sides, and walked in. Instantly you got that creepy feeling like somebody was watching you. We walked around for about half an hour, walking up the stairs and unlocking another door with a deadbolt on both sides. And man, was it eerie. All the furniture was set up. His sister's nursery was still intact, and a tea kettle was still on the stove. It was just straight up creepy in every way. Finally, we go to leave and we decide to go through the garage. I have the keys, and again, you had to have a key to unlock it from the inside. I'm trying to open the door, and I turn around to get a light, just in time to see a rock come from somewhere down the hall and hit my foot. Staring at all three of my friends and not seeing them do anything with their arms or anything else, I decided to try to unlock the door more rapidly. Finally, I find the right key and I put it in the keyhole. As soon as I do, the garage door opens about two feet, and thanks to the motion sensor floodlight that's still on, I can see a chair in the garage. The chair proceeds to be thrown against the wall with a violence that I cannot describe, and the garage door is slammed shut. I turn around to say, let's get out of here, and I see a rock come from the darkness and hit the wall with a lot of force, right next to my head. At this point, I'm done. We run back to the stairs and down to the basement, and for the safety of the door that we had come in the door, which requires a key on either side to lock or unlock. We had left that door unlocked, and it was locked. Freaking out, we hear what sounds like heavy running footsteps upstairs. I'm panicking to find the key. Finally, I find it and unlock the door. We run to the next door, and you guessed it, it was locked. I again find the right key as the footsteps are getting louder and coming down the stairs. We run out the door and it gets left open by the last person out. As we go to shut it, it's slammed and instantly you hear the deadbolt lock. At this point, we're only focusing on getting out of that place. We ran to the truck and all four of us piled in. As soon as the truck started, every light in the house came on at once. My buddy slammed it into reverse and we're flying down this very long driveway. 
and as soon as our tires leave the gravel and hit the pavement, every light in the house turns off, leaving it in absolute darkness. Something very, very bad is in that house. I'm not sure what, but I'll never go back to find out. And I absolutely believe in ghosts or demons now. Believe it or not, this is the short version of the story. The backstory of the house is even creepier. But suffice it to say, I will not be returning. Last week, my mother stayed at her friend's house in Florida on vacation. Her friend was out of town during that time, so it was just my mom alone in the house. Her friend is a little eccentric and artsy, but I'm not really sure if she is interested in anything paranormal. She does always insist that she doesn't believe in anything, that she's not religious or spiritual at all. My mom told me that when she first got to the house, she felt a little creeped out. Her friend is a super neat freak, so my mom believed that she probably had cameras around the house. My mom felt like she was being watched, and there were all these creepy statues and masks everywhere. There were also little artistic looking altars of bone and beads, but her friend is an artist also, so it kind of made sense. The first day in the house, my mom texted me a picture of one of the statues as a joke, saying, This guy guards the kitchen. He really stops the midnight snacking. I responded and we texted back and forth a little before we stopped. The weird thing is, about an hour after we stopped texting, she sent me the photo again with the same text. I ignored it, but then a couple of hours later, she sent it again. This continued at random for the entire length of the night until about 2 p.m. the next day. Finally, I texted her back and I said, cut it out, mom, this is getting creepy. She told me she only ever sent me the photo once. We even compared our messages after she got back into town. However, the really creepy part was when my mom was in the kitchen. She started to get really freaked out and couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, so she turned on her spirit box. That might be the wrong word for it, I'm not sure, but it's a thing that flips through radio channels really fast, and ghosts are supposed to be able to stop it on certain words. She stood there for a long time, not saying anything, and just listening. When her spirit box said, decompose, my mom asked if someone was there, and the spirit box said, Cooper. My mom didn't want to encourage it any further, so she didn't ask any more questions. But then, completely at random, the spirit box said, all alone. My mom turned off the spirit box because she didn't want to hear anymore, and she left the house. She told me at night she would hear footsteps upstairs, even though she was alone in the house, as well as voices and music but sometimes she wasn't sure if the voices and music were the neighbors or not. She was so scared that she planned an escape route through the back door if she ever heard the footsteps coming down the stairs, but thankfully that never happened. One of the statues stares out at the garden through the sliding glass door. She said she always felt like that one was watching her, even though it was actually turned away from the interior room. The other weird thing about the house is even though her friend said she wasn't religious, she had something called, I think my mom said, Mitsutsas on every single door inside the house. It's something from the Jewish religion. She's not Jewish and even if she was, I think you're only supposed to put them on your front and back door. It's something for protection. I don't quite have all the details but it was almost like her friend was trying to get protection at every single door. The friend is aggressively hospitable and she's been asking my mom to stay over at her house for a while. Like she'll be upset if my mom visits and gets a hotel. We have theorized that if there is a ghost in the house, maybe it truly is all alone. 
and somehow influences her to desperately want people to stay there. Or maybe it was saying that it knew my mom was there all alone. It was 1983 to 85 when we had moved from Japan to the Florida Panhandle. Fort Walton Beach, to be exact. The most beautiful community you could imagine. Even though the ocean was only one side of the Panhandle, it felt like we were surrounded by water. There were myriad of ocean-fed lakes and tributaries fed by the Gulf of Mexico, weaving their way around the area. Anywhere in the town was about five minutes from the warm sands of a beach. Okaloosa Island was a quick drive, and the entire length of it was like Peter Pan's Pleasure Island, dotted with huge water slides and pina colada scented surf shops. The beaches there were lined with snow white sand that melted into the bluest waters you usually only saw in movies. I loved it there. The ocean air, the many low bridges linking different parts of the town over parts of the ocean, the perfect warm weather. I absolutely loved it. The house was almost enough to make me forget that, though. Almost. It wasn't a big house at all, not like the typical haunted houses they make movies about. It wasn't huge and full of dark rooms and basements. It was just the opposite. It was a small, one-floor house with two bedrooms, one of which I shared with my younger brother, one bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. What we didn't have with money living a military lifestyle was made up for by traveling all over the place and experiencing life in a way most people never get to. So the house was small, but we were happy. It was also on a pretty major street that was fairly busy all day a stoplight only a block away from us. A very unassuming living situation. There was, however, one small detail my parents had kept from us until we were fully moved in. Across the street, there was an enormous brick wall that spanned at least 20 feet high, dressed in dripping green ivy and topped with ornate black iron spikes every 10 feet, the entire length of it that being at least five or six blocks. I had thought it was the private property of the wealthy. There were so many of them there. Old mansions owned by older money. They were everywhere. But that was not the case here. No, not at all. That monolithic wall housed not an antiquated home, but an antiquated cemetery, complete with archaic statuary wrought with vines and cracks and small mausoleums for the old money of the city. My brother and I were, of course, completely horrified. But the wall did its job and helped us to forget soon enough, and life continued. One night, we were all watching Night Flight together. I loved music and my parents, being very young for parents of two boys, were a huge influence on my love of rock and pop. Our couch sat in front of the huge living room window that looked out onto the busy street, only facing away from it. At this time of night, traffic was minimal and any noise was being drowned out by the yes singing, owner of a lonely heart anyway. Still, I heard something over the music, something coming from the street. I instinctively looked over at my mom and she just kind of shook her head no to me, like she knew what I was thinking. I turned around on the couch anyway, and pushed the curtain aside to see what it was. My mom did the same. I could see the stoplight clearly. The light was red, and there was a woman standing on the corner, looking panicked. A car had pulled up to her, and she started screaming bloody murder, struggling and yelling, while she was being pulled into the car. My mom just squeezed my shoulder. I pulled my head back in to see why my dad wasn't running out there to save her, but he was watching TV with my little brother, both completely unbothered. My brother was playing with some toy, clearly not hearing the screaming, 
and my dad was just sitting back tapping his foot to the song. I started to say something, but my mother's hand squeezed harder, and I whispered, But... And she said quietly, There's nothing to see. I looked back out the window. There was nothing. No car, no woman, nothing. It happened so fast, I was confused. Where did the car go? I didn't hear it peel out, and there wasn't enough time either. I didn't know when the screaming stopped either. It just stopped. I realized that when I was watching the car and the girl, there were no other cars driving by. In those few minutes, no one passed them. And now the street was suddenly very busy. I looked up at my mom and she said under her breath, I told you not to look. And gave me this look that said, don't tell your father you saw anything. So I didn't. That would be just the beginning of my experiences at that house. This is a story about my little sister's experiences with the entity that haunted our Florida home. I myself have never experienced anything in that house, but I think you'll find her encounters very creepy. For my sister's privacy, I will refer to her as Liz. This all took place in Florida when I was 15 and Liz was 11. Liz shared a room with me and our youngest sister. She slept on the top bunk while I slept across the room in my own bed. I liked to entertain my sisters by telling scary stories or reciting the whole script to one of our favorite movies. Liz always had a habit of calling me out whenever I told a scary story. She didn't believe in ghosts, which makes this whole thing 10 times weirder. The first incident was probably around July, as I remember it was pretty hot. I had been asleep maybe three hours when I was shaken awake. It was Liz. She asked me why I was standing by her bed and staring at her. Having just been woken up, I was confused. I no longer sleepwalked, so I had no idea why she would think that I was staring at her all creepy-like. I got her back to bed and sat with her until she fell back asleep. The second incident was maybe four weeks later. While eating breakfast, Liz asked Mom who the man in the hat was. Mom brushed her off, but I questioned her further. She told me that late last night, she woke up to find somebody standing next to her bed, peering at her through the safety bars. She described the figure as a man wearing a fedora-type hat and wearing all black. He was very shadowy and disappeared when Liz blinked. The third and most terrifying incident happened a few days after. I remember waking up after a particularly terrifying nightmare. I looked over to my sister's bed and I noticed that Liz was sitting bolt upright, staring at me. I asked her what was wrong. She answered with fear apparent in her voice, the man in the hat was watching you sleep. That was the last and most terrifying incident I can remember. I don't believe he appeared again. We had our house blessed twice, so that may have deterred him. What do you think it was? I know we don't have any dead relatives that wore hats like that, so I'm very confused as to what she saw. This story might be a bit long, but it's something that happened to me years ago, and I'm still very curious about what it could have been. When I was about 13, I was in a relationship with a girl that I visited pretty frequently, almost every day after school if I could. Due to me visiting her so often, I got to know her and her family, as well as her home. They were very kind people, but just a little off. 
At the time, I wasn't a very religious person. However, my girlfriend and her family were Satanists. When I first heard that, I thought it was a joke, but soon I realized that they were being serious. I wasn't too surprised or bothered by it. She later told me that the house was haunted and me being the biggest skeptic kind of just brushed it off and showed interest so we could keep talking. After a while, I started to notice things in the house that were a little bit unsettling, but I was quick to dismiss them. I figured anything had a logical explanation behind it, so why try to claim that it was something paranormal? At first it started with small tapping sounds. To be honest, at this time, I thought it was just the house settling or creaking due to the wind. We live in Florida, so it wasn't too hard to believe that some weather could have caused the house to make noises. That's what I believed, since it was the most logical explanation. That was until we heard scratching, coming from inside her closet. We thought it was her cat at first, especially because he would constantly bring her into the room and she liked to explore. We also thought maybe she had snuck in and we had closed the door on her, oblivious, and it took her until just that moment to try to get out. Obviously, we got up and opened the closet door, but nothing was there. This was very peculiar, but I shrugged it off and figured that maybe it was a mouse or a rat in the walls. She pointed out, though, that there were scratch marks all over the closet. They weren't high up. If anything, they were about level with a common cat or a small dog. But like I said, the cat wasn't in the closet. It wasn't even in the room. Needless to say, I was weirded out. I wasn't scared, but I was starting to believe that something wasn't right. I don't know exactly what was wrong, but I was starting to feel off after this. Weeks go by and even months go by some minor things keep happening. Mostly just the scratching, which has pretty much torn up the paint in the closet entirely at this point, but also other things like the cat acting strangely and a weird sense of unease when you're in certain parts of the house, particularly the restroom, the garage, and the master bedroom. I just assumed that it all had a rational explanation, of course. I wasn't sure of what it was, but I was stubborn and dumb. One day though, something was especially creepy. So creepy to me in fact, that I had actually started to question whether or not there are such things as gods, demons, ghosts, etc. Something that will stick with me forever. One day, my girlfriend had invited me over, so I asked my mom and she dropped me off. I noticed that there weren't any cars in her driveway, which wasn't really weird since her family did work often or we're out shopping a lot. My girlfriend opens the door after I knock and lets me in. First thing we did was head to her room to watch Third Rock from the Sun. While we're sitting in there, we make some small talk and go to the kitchen to grab some food. And then we go back to her room to keep watching TV. At some point though, hours later, we end up shutting off the TV and just start talking. Out of nowhere though, we hear her older sister yell her name from right outside her door. We assumed they were finally home from wherever they went and we went out there to check up on them. Weirdly enough though, we didn't see her. We checked everywhere around the house and didn't see her at all. We even yelled back but got no response. We chalked it up to us maybe hearing something else and just assuming that that's what we had heard instead. Like maybe there was a noise and we thought we heard her name. Like I said, stubborn and dumb. We head back to the bedroom and sit down, but this time we leave her bedroom door open just in case her sister really did call for her and attempted to do it again. After a few moments, we hear her sister call for her name again. However, this time it didn't seem like it came from behind the door. It sounded as if the entire house had called her name. Not only was it so loud and so clear, but it didn't change its tone or pitch. It sounded like it was a repeated audio recording from the last time she had called for her. Once again, we quickly bolt up and search around the house as fast as possible. 
We thought if it was her sister trying to play some kind of prank, we would find her. But we didn't see her. We couldn't even trace where the sound had come from, so we checked in all the areas where somebody could easily hide. Being dumb, we once again said it was probably nothing to worry about. About an hour or so goes by and we hear her dad's truck start to pull up to the house. We check out the window to watch them and the rear passenger door opens. It's her sister. We were baffled to say the least and wondered when and how she had left so quickly. We met them at the door and asked her what it was that she had kept calling for and how she'd gotten out and ended up with her family. She looked at us with confusion and concern. What she and her dad told us makes me anxious to this very day. She said that she'd been gone since six in the morning doing some shopping. We immediately tried calling her bluff, but her dad doubled down and seemed to get a little bit annoyed by this and told us that they were indeed out shopping all day. Right after he told us this, we told her sister that we had heard something that sounded exactly like her voice calling for my girlfriend. And we tried finding whatever it was, but we came up with nothing. Something about this must have really alerted and worried her sister, because after we told her this, she immediately went pale and looked sick. She told me that she would like to speak to my girlfriend in private real quick and brought her to the back porch. I went back to my girlfriend's room and just sat on her bed waiting for her to come back. After about five or 10 minutes, she came back and looked a little concerned while also downplaying what had just happened. I asked her if everything was all right. She said, yeah, she asked if we had gone into her room. I told her I did and she got mad. She told me though that if we ever hear her voice while she's not home to not go in her room. I guess right above her bed is an attic and she told me how one time she was sleeping, she'd woken up in the middle of the night and saw the attic right above her bed was cracked open and she saw her own face staring back at her from inside the attic. This story is entirely true and something that has stuck with me for years. I'm 24 now, and though it's been a little over 10 years, it still feels like it happened yesterday. My boyfriend and I are camping at the Fort Pickens campground in Pensacola, Florida. Last night was a full moon and around 9.30 or 10, we went for a walk down to the beach with our husky to look at the ocean and check out the moonlight. We sat there for maybe an hour and just talked about life in general. But toward the end of the conversation, we started talking about how the ocean can play tricks on you and how strange the energy can be sometimes. We were swapping stories about how we've seen people who we thought might not really be people before. And I understand that when you talk about things like that, it puts you in a very specific headspace. All night, I tried to justify what happened to us as a trick of our minds and us hyping ourselves up. But we both saw the same thing at the same time, and there's absolutely no way that it wasn't real. We started walking back to camp and it was maybe a quarter mile from the beach down the little boardwalk thing to the main road. Once you get to the main road, you see the entrance to the campsite, and there's a small parking lot there, a stop sign, a picnic table, and a building that looks abandoned and out of business. This building is one story tall and doesn't have any signs out front, and I don't believe the doors and windows are shuttered, but they're definitely not accessible. I wouldn't even be able to press my face against the window and try to peek in because it's kind of boarded up around it. I was sitting on this picnic table while Shane was standing and telling me a creepy story about something he saw in the ocean when he was 11 years old. We were there for maybe 10 minutes and we were talking about his story. I was trying to debunk it and figure it out with him. When all of a sudden a girl comes walking out of the campsite area towards us and stops at the building. 
We both thought nothing of it because we had already seen two people walking that night and we knew people were active because it was a full moon and wanted to make the most of the campsite. But this girl walks up to the abandoned building and it looks like she's trying to peer in the windows or open the doors on the right side of the building. I almost even remember her standing on her tiptoes. She obviously doesn't get in and then she decides to walk all the way across the length of the building right in front of us to the left side. This is when I started to get uncomfortable because she doesn't look at us or address us, even though we're both loudly standing there talking. And the way that she was walking, all I could see was her side or back profile in a long brown ponytail. I know it doesn't really make sense, but it's just like, how can somebody walk from right to left in front of you and you don't see the side of their face? All I saw was her hair. It's not like she had her head turned either. It just doesn't make sense. So she rounds the corner on the left side of the building and doesn't come back. At this point, I'm actually invested and I'm kind of grilling the location she went to the whole time. I don't take my eyes off of it. I don't really know how to explain this, but it didn't seem like she walked back behind the building. It seemed like she was right there, just waiting for us to do or say something. There's a little edge, like a ledge on the side of the building that looked maybe three or four inches wide, kind of like a gutter hanging off. And I swear on my life, it's like she went behind this little four inch ledge and flipped herself sideways and was just frozen watching us. Shane has this spotlight for hunting that he uses as a flashlight, and he shined it on the little ledge area of the building that she went behind. We kept seeing something low to the ground on the side of this ledge, and it made us think that she was just standing there doing something. So Shane shines his light in that direction and yelled, Yo, what's up? Are you good? After this, he kept his spotlight pinned where we thought she would pop out, and after a delay of four or five seconds, we literally saw her spring out of the shadow and leer forward facing right. She had her back hunched over so she wasn't standing as tall as she normally would be. I can't explain how scary it was to be sitting there watching this whole thing take place. And once we shine the flashlight, have this person's face pop out from the side of this building. It would have been less scary if she had never come out and we had circled the whole building and nobody was there. Her movement was incredibly unnatural. It was as if no human being would respond with their body language that way after having a flashlight shining on them. It was like she couldn't figure out what to do and showed herself only because we made her and then couldn't get all the parts right in the meantime. Almost like she was scared of getting caught for doing something wrong, not scared of us. The way she popped out, her face was turned toward us, and she had her arms kind of sprawled out, almost like a praying mantis. I know this sounds ridiculous, but there's literally no other way to explain this. The best part about this whole thing, though, is something that neither of us figured out until we talked about it later. We never saw a face. It was just smooth skin or clay colored, rounded, with no eyes or facial expressions. I want to say that I personally almost saw divots or pits where the eyes should have been, but there was nothing substantial there. We were still trying to figure out this encounter, so we weren't super quick to get scared at this point. We honestly thought that it was our minds playing tricks on us, but I think since both of us saw it, we knew that was probably unlikely. This is where the story starts to differentiate a little bit. After she pulls her body back behind the ledge, Shane turns off his flashlight when I asked him to because I felt like we were being rude. At this point, she's back behind the ledge and the light is off, and I see her extended body about three feet off the ground. It's like she's crouching and reaching at the same time like she was going to take an over-exaggerated step and almost tiptoe off like a cartoon character or something. She leaned forward one step to the right and then pulled herself back behind the ledge. She stands up straight 
and then starts walking back to the right side of the building in front of us. Shane has his flashlight on her the whole time. And now she just says, oh, I just wanted to change without having to go all the way back. But it's like, all the way back to where? She literally just came from the campground. She could have changed right there if she was heading to the beach or something. Was she going to swim at 10.30 at night? It just didn't make any sense why she needed to change in that specific spot. The strange part is I specifically heard her talk about changing, but Shane heard her say something about having to pee. I'm not sure if one or both of us just misheard her or if Shane just assumed that's what she was doing because that's what I thought at first too. But as she walked from the left of the building across to the right and back down the trail toward the campground, she kind of scurried away quickly, as if she was embarrassed. And the crazy thing is that I didn't see her face the entire time she did this. It was like when she walked across the first time. All I saw was her long brown ponytail. After she slowly walked down the road back toward the campsite, Shane and I were talking about how messed up that whole interaction was and how we needed to get back to our own site. He told me that this person had a short, blonde, bob-style haircut. He couldn't believe me when I said that no, she had a long brown ponytail because he hadn't seen that anywhere on this person. There's no way that either of us could have mistaken these two specific haircuts and colors for the other. It's almost like she was showing each of us what she wanted to. As we walk back to our campsite, we walk past a handful of good dark trees that I, as a female, would definitely have peed behind or changed behind if I needed to. This building was so far out of the way, and I would never think to go to the distant right side of it by myself late at night in order to change clothes. It just didn't make sense, the choices that she made. And trust me, we've spent enough time in the city that if we were in New York or New Orleans or Denver or wherever, and we saw somebody doing stuff like this, we probably would have just chalked it up to the person being high and just laughed it off. But this is a random, quiet family campground where everyone's super happy and peaceful. Of course we tried to justify that maybe it was just some drunk chick being sloppy and not knowing what's going on. But even that doesn't hold any weight in comparison to those body movements and that smooth face that we saw staring back at us. Nothing about this person's body movements were natural. Not when she came slinking up. Not when she didn't notice us sitting there. Not when she looked in the window. Not when she walked across the building or dipped behind the ledge or peered out or crouched down or replied to us and definitely not when she scurried off. This is one of those situations that left me with tears in my eyes. I was absolutely shaken, but I was incredulous at the same time. I couldn't believe that it really happened to me. It's like I almost couldn't even be scared because it had already happened. And I just had to sit there and process that we really saw what we did. We talk about NPCs sometimes and joke about people making us uncomfortable and maybe not being real. And we really believe that sometimes we cross paths with angels. But this was something else entirely. This was something that seemed like a lower form or something less intelligent than us that was just pretending to be human. I feel like I should add this as a side note, but I'm Native American and I'm super familiar with all kinds of witches or bad medicine or shapeshifters. And in a lot of our stories, these are humans who are incredibly intelligent and powerful and have this human urge based on jealousy or anger or evil to target individuals and appear as another living form. I'm telling you right now that nothing about this encounter felt like that. This didn't seem like something smarter than us. It didn't seem like something with an emotional intention. It didn't seem quick or cunning like it wanted something from us. It was the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It seemed like it was mimicking or mocking human movements. I have no idea what its intentions were, or why it was here of all places, or why it presented itself to us that night. But I guess I just have to move forward with the knowledge that this definitely happened, and I don't have any answers.
Growing up in Jacksonville as a kid, I was living about a mile from a preserve and national park. Being that the area was known as a historic monument with Spanish forts and old naval bases, there were battles fought there, in which tons of Native Americans and Spanish died essentially in my backyard. Around the time of being six to eight years old, I had night terrors met with sleep paralysis events in which I would see a human-like shadow in my room. The latter only happened twice. During those two occasions, I remember seeing it emerge from the corner of my room. And during the first event, it just stayed in place. It had no remarkable features, with only the outlining of its body being a darker barrier that defined a human outline. Head, torso, legs, arms, and maybe hands. However, the second time this happened, I immediately had an elevated heart rate and I started panicking out of fear. Most likely, I had woken from a nightmare. I was positioned on my left side with the shadowy guy facing my peripheral on the right. And this time it started walking toward me, getting in my bed and holding me with its hand on my chest. From that, I was in a total panic attack to the point that I could hear my blood pumping in my ears. After a while, I guess I just fell asleep. Maybe I passed out, I honestly don't remember. Even with all of that, I don't think I told my mom at the time. Though now I tell her about both of these experiences all the time. She kind of just says, well, maybe that did happen. Or maybe it was just a vivid nightmare. Nowadays, I look back on that with a sort of mystified perspective. Growing up, our household was really stressful for a child. There was a lot of parental fighting on a daily basis, especially with my dad being an alcoholic. He didn't abuse me, not physically, but all of that torment did lead to a divorce when I was about 13. I've never spoken with a therapist about this or anything, but I do feel like those events were likely a product of the stress. As a bonus, whenever I would talk to my dad about it later, he confirmed to me that he saw a squatting human figure up in the rafters while we lived there, well before he went through DTs. Rest in peace to the man. I live on a 20-acre horse ranch in the panhandle of Florida, about a half hour from the Alabama border, and 15 minutes ago, I heard the strangest animal sound I've ever heard, if it was an animal. It happened almost right outside the property, which is only about 50 feet away from where I am now. It was a very loud whistle. I heard it four times spaced out by like 15 to 30 seconds, and each whistle was different, no repeating tunes or notes. It was loud enough to sound like it was echoing across the property. After the four independent whistled tunes, it was followed by a sound that almost sounded like a frustrated sigh, then nothing. Then the whole thing would start all over again, I sat there listening to this, like somebody was just facing the property outside the fence line, whistling four different tunes, huffing in frustration, and then doing it again. What's even stranger is that it was dead quiet while this was happening. Shortly after the silence, I could hear a pack of coyotes in the distance, which happens all the time. The owls over the lake, which is also frequent. But while this was happening, I didn't hear any of that. Also, to be clear, where the sound was coming from is an open field. It's so dark I can't see my hand in front of my face when I go out there. The weirdest thing is, we're more likely to hear gunshots than other people out here. The closest neighbors are like a half mile away in the other direction. This sound came from the road side of the property. 
the closest neighbors in that direction are over a mile away. We also have two donkeys on the property to ward off predators, and I didn't hear either of them warning the herd, which would mean that maybe it was a human I was hearing. But like I said, the property is fenced and gated, so they would have had to hop the fence. And whistling is a really weird thing to do when you're trespassing in an area where shooting is common. Update. It's now 30 minutes after the initial thing happened. I hear the horses running fast away from where the sound originated. Then, about a minute later, I hear their hooves heading back to where the sound originated. This happened several times. I am really confused. On May 3rd, 2017, my life was pretty similar to how it is now. I'm a bartender in a smallish beach town in Florida, so I know most people who frequent the bars in our downtown area, either as other service industry workers or patrons. I also have always lived within walking distance to work and the strip of bars and restaurants. That being said, I was 23 at the time and constantly hung out with a pretty large group of friends and coworkers and going out almost daily after work. Although this absolutely made no sense from the beginning, I thought for a while that there might be an explanation to what I experienced. If there is, I never got one. And I'm 100% sure that I do not know the person who this mystery item belonged to, but let me back up. I was going through my trunk before a camping trip one day with a guy I was dating, who lived in the apartments across the street from mine. As we're clearing things out, we find a large black duffel bag stuffed in the very back of the trunk. Upon opening it, I discovered it was full of various soccer gear, cleats, socks, safety pads, and a jersey with a name I didn't recognize on it. I had zero recollection of anyone putting anything in my trunk. I don't have any friends who play soccer, and I never have. The name on the jersey is one that I've literally never heard of, even now and searching on social media didn't yield any results. The guy who I was dating at the time thought that I was lying and thought that it was from another guy I was hanging out with or had hung out with and dated in the past. He didn't believe me that I had no idea how it got there, who the person whose name was on the jersey was, and didn't hang out with anyone who played soccer. That drove me even more insane because I literally didn't even discover the bag in the trunk on my own previously. This was the first time I had ever seen it. I asked every person that I was around regularly as well, as well as pretty much anyone I'd seen in the past month. No one had any clue what I was talking about or recognized the name on the jersey. Please note that there are no spare keys for my car and I never let anyone drive my car. I always keep it obsessively locked and my car has never been broken into. I ended up throwing the bag away a couple of years afterwards. I kept it in my trunk forever, hoping that the mystery would solve itself eventually, but no. This will forever drive me nuts. To this day, I have no idea who that person is or how that stuff got into my trunk. from a small town in the middle of Denmark, and my grandfather used to live about 10 kilometers from us. He was what you would roughly translate as a nature caretaker. He lives at the place and gets paid to take care of it. The place that he lived was in a protected area in the forest, just where Denmark's biggest river meets a huge lake. The place had a lot of old buildings, an old paper factory, and a water mill. It used to be run by the monks of the Benedictine order. They built the mill to utilize the water stream to power the machines at the paper factory. The place is basically called the Monastery Mill. Most buildings are from the late 1500s to 1700s, but some of them are from 1100. 
All the way up until the 1800s, the place was run by the monks. On the other side of the river lived the nuns of the Benedictine order, who were said to have a bad relationship with the monks. No one really knows what started this feud. Firstly, it was small. Food would go missing from the monk stock. Then the water mill would stop, and they would realize an insane amount of wood was blocking the water. Lastly, they would wake up to find cattle and chickens had been killed. And one night, the paper factory, which was built entirely of wood, was set on fire. Ever since that day, Nobody had seen the monks. Everyone thought that they had left the mill to go somewhere else, as the order had many monasteries across the country. Well, four years ago, when I had just turned 18, my granddad was going hunting in Sweden. He asked me if I could take care of his place and his dogs for a couple of days, and since I didn't have a car yet, I would just sleep there and take the bus to school in the morning. The place is beautiful, and I was so excited to spend some time there. When I went to sleep the first night, I was woken up at exactly 12 o'clock by what sounded like a small church bell. It rang for a couple of minutes, and then it stopped. A small bell the monks used to use to call mass was just outside my granddad's house, so I assumed that's what I had heard. But when I woke up the next morning and checked out the bell, it was tied tightly, so no wind or person could have made that bell ring. The next night, it happened again. It woke me up at exactly midnight and rang for a couple of minutes. I slowly made my way to the front door, which was made of glass, to look at the bell. And there were my granddad's two dogs, looking out while growling. I swear when I looked out, I saw a bald man wearing a long white dress robe type thing disappearing into the woods, almost like he was floating. I called my dad sobbing and asked him to come and pick me up, and he did. We both went back the next day, checked on the bell, and it was still tied up. My dad then confided in me that even though he doesn't believe in that stuff, as he put it, he had had many weird experiences as a kid there, and he still couldn't find any explanation for most of them. Fast forward to last year. My granddad was still living there, and the council decided to split the river and make it wider. Had something to do with the forest environment. I didn't really exactly get why. It took weeks for them to plan it out. And then, the day came when all the machinery to start the expansion got kicked on. They only got to work for a couple of hours though, until they had to stop, because as they were digging, they had found bones. Just a couple, no big deal. But what they soon realized was that by the river, on the monk's side, there was a mass grave. After specialists were called and weeks of digging commenced, they approximated that the grave had about 40 bodies in it, all from the 1800s. At that point, everyone realized that the monks had never left. What happened to them at that paper factory, though? No one knows. My family has been staying in Cripple Creek, Colorado on vacation. Prior to coming here, we had no idea that there was supposedly paranormal activity. So today my fiance and I decided to take a stroll through town, taking photos and whatnot. We heard this weird static noise that almost sounded like it was coming from a loud radio pretty far away. It would come almost in waves where you would hear it for a couple of seconds, and then it would just stop. This continued until we reached the casinos. Fast forward to tonight, we're laying in bed, listening to a video. 
and I hear what sounds like a scratching noise on the window for the second night in a row. I paused the video and listened for a few minutes. After not hearing anything, I continued the video. About an hour and a half later, I was almost between a sleep and awake state, but I couldn't really fall asleep for whatever reason. Then all of a sudden, I hear a scratch again that instantly woke me up. I sat there and listened. I heard it again. I yelled, hey, loudly, and I ran outside with a flashlight, but I didn't see anything. No person, no signs of somebody trying to get through the screen, nothing. After this happened, I was pretty startled and I am by no means one that believes in the paranormal. But kind of jokingly, I said, what if it was a skinwalker? But later this led me to do some research on the town and apparently it is filled with all things paranormal. I've seen several things about the casinos, the jail, but has anyone else experienced anything at one of the homes here? I'm really curious. At the time of this event, I was living in downtown Toronto and I had just moved in with my new roommates. One guy was my buddy. The place I moved into used to be a shoe factory years ago. So the new place was great. I was chilling with my buddy and our other roommates. Joe and I made a joke about how this place must be haunted because of how old it is. Joe kind of brushed off what I was saying though and joked that if he told me stories, I would move out. Joe's been living there for like 20 years, so I don't doubt that he's seen some things. Before I get into the stories, I wanted to clarify that I'm not sure if I believe in ghosts. My attitude has always been that I can't really prove or disprove their existence or of anything paranormal really. I've experienced quite a few strange encounters in my lifetime, but nothing to really sway my opinion that ghosts exist 100%. So it was a weekend night. I stayed up really late. It was like three or four in the morning and I went out to the living area to get some water. As I was filling my water bottle, the whole time I was out there, I felt like something was drawing my attention toward the TV or couch area. The TV was always on. I don't know why. I feel like my roommates were just too lazy to turn it off. So I'm stumbling toward the couches and I could make out the shape of somebody's head from behind it. It was kind of this white transparent color. All I can remember is that as I got closer, there was this static from the TV. It kept getting louder until the TV finally made a big pop noise. I ran back to my room. I just stood there in complete shock. I didn't move for like five minutes, just trying to comprehend what had happened. As I said before, I don't really believe in ghosts, but this scared me really badly. I've never felt an energy or something like that before. It's really hard to explain how I felt during that experience, but it gives me goosebumps just remembering it. The second story took place in the daytime. I was alone in the apartment, cooking some brunch. In the apartment, there was a section of walls that were covered in mirrors. Joe made kind of a makeshift gym in front of them. So I was doing my normal thing, just cooking, but the whole time I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me with a sharp glare. Like I said, the TV is always on. So when you're cooking in the kitchen, you can see in the mirrors, the TV area reflected. As I'm cooking, this like glitter or flash of light would pierce the corner of my eye, like somebody was trying to get my attention. This happened about three times. I'm starting to get more freaked out because the whole vibe of the apartment just felt really negative, which was odd. 
As I'm finishing up, the door to my room just shuts. It had been like halfway open. When that happened, I just left the apartment to get some fresh air. I didn't even touch the food I had just got done cooking. What really doesn't make sense about this is that the doors we had in that place were really heavy. They had soundproofing on them. So when you went to close them, you really had to pull on them. Those were the two really big things I had happen while I was living there. When I was living there, I had a girlfriend that would stay over all the time. I never mentioned anything about ghosts to her. We never talked about ghosts either when I was living there. It wasn't until I had moved out and we were on a date that I brought it up to her. All I asked her is if she ever saw or felt anything strange while I was living there. What she told me was pretty shocking. She told me about how she would have nightmares every once in a while, where something would climb up to where we would sleep and attack her. The apartment had like eight meter ceilings, so the sleeping area was at the top. This freaked me out because one time I had had a dream that somebody climbed up there and grabbed my feet. I actually woke up from that dream screaming. She also explained that she felt like there were multiple spirits there, some good, some bad. She's way more spiritual than I am. So I had a hard time wrapping my head around what she had said. She said she felt that there was a mix, like I said, good ones and also dark ones. Anyway, that was my experience living in this apartment that used to be a shoe factory. There were other instances of things happening, weird noises, doors closing, the normal. But these two events really stood out. My wife and I seemed to have a simultaneous glitch a couple of years ago at a hotel in Canada. It's not the most significant or interesting glitch, I guess, but we've never experienced such a thing before or since. We were spending the night at a random hotel in Toronto on an overnight layover before flying to Mexico the next day. We are not from Canada and I had never been to Toronto before. My wife had, but as a teenager, and only on a brief trip. When we walked into the lobby to check in, there was a small line of people waiting at the desk. We got in line behind a middle-aged couple who looked like maybe they were there for a wedding or a party. They immediately turned around and smiled at us as if we were all old friends. The wife of the partner said, Hey, so are you girls heading back to Winnipeg in the morning? My wife and I faltered for a moment. She was obviously talking to us and not anybody else, but we had no idea why. We had never met this couple before, let alone engaged in any kind of conversation with them. We had just gotten to the hotel. Plus, neither of us have ever been to Winnipeg. Uh, no. I replied uncomfortably. The woman looked confused and just said, Oh. She was called up by one of the attendants and we got the other, so there was no way to talk any further. My wife and I just kind of looked at each other and laughed, like how weird. We got our room keys and went over to the elevator. It was a large chain hotel and our room was on one of the higher up floors. The elevator stopped before our floor, and when the doors slid open, there were about four to five guys there, late 30s, maybe early 40s, holding beers. They saw us and acted pleasantly surprised. They all did the, hey, kind of surprised cheer, as if they hadn't expected to run into us. My wife and I just figured they were having some fun. But then they started talking to us as if they knew us too. Ah, we're having a party in Dan's room, one of the guys said. Again, my wife and I were unsure if they were actually speaking to us. 
but there was no one else in the elevator that they would be talking to, so they were. I said, oh, okay. Another guy said, you girls headed up to bed? My wife and I gave each other the side eye. Uh, yep, she said. Yeah, I'm pretty tired too. It's been a long day. The door slid open at what I was guessing was Dan's floor. Well, we'll all be down here in Dan's room if you change your minds. The guys got off the elevator, and when the doors closed, my wife and I started cracking up. What in the world was going on? Why did all these people seem to think they knew us? We made it to our room and got ready for bed. It was chilly, so I slept in my socks, which I almost never do. I fell asleep right away and I slept like a rock as we had already had a long first day of travel to make it to Toronto. When we woke up the next morning, I got out of bed and immediately noticed another weird thing. I was still wearing socks, but they weren't the socks I had worn to bed the night before. In fact, they weren't my socks at all. I was immediately grossed out, but my wife and I had a good laugh about it. I mean, how in the world did that happen? I've never been a sleepwalker, not once in my life. So weird. Since we had a flight to catch, we grabbed our stuff and made our way down to the lobby to check out. It was busy, and there was another line at the desk. We stood behind this woman who had two suitcases. She was standing with her body half turned toward us, so she saw us coming. She looked up from her phone when we got in line and then went back to minding her own business as we were. Then after a minute, she looked up directly at us and said, did Bob go to get the car or something? What in the world? Again, we had never laid eyes on this woman before this moment. We had no idea who she was and we certainly didn't know Bob. I have no idea, I said finally. Like the others, she seemed confused by my confusion. It's been a couple of years since this incident at the hotel, but my wife and I still laugh about it from time to time. That hotel was just full of people who were so sure that they knew us, but that's impossible. Our theory is that maybe there was an event at the hotel with guests who looked like us, but I mean, what are the odds of that? and that still wouldn't explain what happened to my socks. To this day, it's still the strangest thing that has ever happened to us. This happened a few years ago but my husband and I still talk about it. If he hadn't been there, I would have written it off as some kind of dream. My husband and I were walking around on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. We decide to stop for a drink at the hotel and soak in the ocean view. We walk up to the hotel and we didn't notice much until we walked inside. When we walked into the hotel, the entire hotel was empty. Nobody was there. There was nobody behind the counters. Not a single soul in the lobby. Just empty. But it also had this weird buzz of energy, as though people had just been there. There were papers on the counters, cups on the tables. We walked inside through the restaurant outside by the pool. No one. We walked back inside through the lobby. We probably spent about five to 10 minutes there and we never saw one person. We left because it was so creepy. Back on the street, everything was normal. People walking by, traffic, everything you would expect. I have no idea what caused no one to be there. It almost felt like the Truman Show where you go off the script and they don't have any actors ready. I would love any thoughts on what you think happened. Also, we were totally sober and we thought perhaps it could have been evacuated, but there would have been people on the streets 
I mean, it's a hotel. We asked around later, and nobody knew anything about anything that had happened that would warrant a hotel, so... To this day, we still don't know what happened. My story may not be the most exciting, but it's a personal experience that I have felt compelled to share. This incident took place in the summer of 2017, when my family was on vacation in California. It happened on the last leg of our journey, when we were on a road trip from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our flight back home. We had spent the day exploring John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas and were en route back to LA. The afternoon sun was setting over golden vineyards that graced the valleys we were passing, casting a warm glow over the landscape. Packed into a rental van, my family was mostly sleeping, apart from my father who was at the wheel, my grandmother occupying the passenger seat, and me situated in the rear of the van. As we curved around a bend in the road, my father's voice rang out, what is that? Being at the back of the van, I could only catch a glimpse through his side of the van of a dark figure crossing the road from the left. I anticipated seeing the figure on my side of the van within moments. As we got closer, however, the figure shifted from an upright posture to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill. I strained my eyes to spot it reappearing from behind the hill but there was nothing. Given its size, equivalent to that of a man, there was no logical place for it to hide, leaving me bewildered. Both my father and I were puzzled, as he'd only ever seen the figure upright while focusing on the road. My grandmother, despite being at the front, seemed oblivious to the entire incident, perhaps lost in her own thoughts. My dad and I, both believers in the paranormal, have our theories about the figure. While he leaned toward it being a Sasquatch, I have contemplated the possibility of it being a skinwalker. This event remains my sole encounter with the paranormal to date, and it lingers on my mind. I still wonder about the identity of the figure we saw crossing the road that day. This isn't my story, but it is my parents and two incredibly close family friends who told it. Before I was born, the four of them used to hang out a lot. They would often drive far out into the Mojave Desert, just to party and to drink around a fire and have a good time. For this story, I'm going to call my dad Conrad and my mom Stacy. Their friends, I'll call Brad and Gina. So they drive all the way out into the desert and have a fire. It's summertime and it's hot. Although it's the middle of the night, it's still warm. My mom, Stacy, and her friend Gina were starting to get scared about tarantulas and decided that they didn't want to camp out there after all. So all four of them started driving back. It was like two o'clock in the morning and they were on a dirt road that went for miles and miles with nothing on it. Suddenly, up ahead in the headlights, they saw the silhouette of a man in a long black trench coat with a wide brimmed hat. The collar of his coat was pulled up. He was walking alongside the road, going the same direction that they were driving. My dad grew up hitchhiking a lot, and he used to pick up hitchhikers as well. So my mom knew that my dad would consider stopping and talking to this guy to see if he needed a ride. But they got this terrible feeling about him. My mom always said that just in the way he was walking, 
the way he looked and how he was dressed, and how he was just out there in the middle of nowhere with nothing. He just emitted this really messed up energy that felt absolutely terrifying and even evil. Gina felt the same way. My dad starts joking, hey, let's pick this guy up. And my mom and Gina immediately start screaming and crying and begging him not to. They were in the back seat. My dad was driving and Brad was in the passenger seat. Gina was even kind of punching my dad in the back, screaming, no, don't stop, don't stop. I guess my dad slowed way down as he passed him though. And they all turned to look at him as they went by. But the moment that they passed him, he was gone. He disappeared into thin air. It's not like there were rocks or trees or anything to hide behind. The weird thing is, I grew up hearing this story from my parents, but living far away from their friends. When I was very young, we moved up north and they lost touch. Although whenever we would come back to California to visit, we'd always get together with them and it was like nothing had changed. I moved back to California as an adult and I work for Gina now. One of our first conversations when I came back was about the hat man. She brought it up, not me. And word for word almost, it was the exact same story that my parents had always told me growing up. To be honest, I've always secretly feared, yet been very intrigued by this entity because of their story and then so many more stories that I have now read online. I couldn't believe it was such a big phenomenon when I first found it on the internet, because I was growing up just hearing my parents' story long before the internet even existed. To this day, he fascinates and terrifies me. I grew up in a small California desert tourist town called Joshua Tree, home of the Joshua Tree National Park. Those of us that are older call it the monument, as it was that before it was national parkdom. I was in my early 20s at the time, which was approximately 15 to 16 years ago, and I was the only one with a car and a license. Growing up in a small desert town leaves you with limited options for fun, and we would always make use of the park. Occasionally, maybe once a week or so, a group of us would pile into the station wagon with beer, smokes, and a mixtape, and drive through the park late at night. An empty road, so dark and quiet, other than the loud group of guys in a red Mercury driving fast from one entrance to the other, was just the kind of vibe we liked. Hours would go by each time as we drove along the desolate road and stopped at various rocks that we liked to climb on. I cannot overstate how desolate it was, how alone we felt. No other cars, no other lights, except the occasional lonely unmanned road work sign when warranted. That's exactly what we thought it was at first, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This trip started like every other, except maybe more of us than usual. Crammed in that car, windows down as I chain smoked and drove a good 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, gravel was spitting up as we were driving along having a great time. Shortly into the trip, I saw a light, a blue light. Possibly. It was miles and miles ahead. But that's the thing about the dark. Dark like you get out in the desert. The light can shine for miles. I remember saying something about having to slow down at some point ahead. Must be some kind of construction sign left up, I thought. Had to be a sign. The light hadn't moved. We continued for a few miles to one of our favorite stops and got out. We climbed for a while, maybe 45 minutes or so. 
We drank a little. We joked a lot. The norm. Then we piled back in and continued. To be very clear, this light never moved, and we'd already been about an hour into our adventure. A question that I kept thinking, though, was why would a sign have a blue light? It's very unusual. But we still figured it was a sign because it was so stationary. As we approached the light, I started to slow down. I slowed more and more as we approached the source. It wasn't a sign. It wasn't a car. It wasn't even a UFO. Standing on the side of the road, facing toward us, unmoving for over an hour at this point, was a man. A pale white man with a white beard, dirty old miner clothing, and an old mining helmet. He was holding a pickaxe, period appropriate for a time long before the park was anything other than desert with some lonely mines. His light was giving off this unnatural and bright blue light. His face was blank, but he stared at us, directly at all of us. We sped up, and as we drove by faster, his head turned to keep pace with us as we left. His light was visible, unmoving once again, facing us the entire trip out. It never flickered. It never moved. He wasn't translucent, but the saying as white as a ghost applied to everything about him other than his clothes, pickaxe, and light. I remember looking at the car clock shortly after passing him. It was almost exactly 1 a.m. when we passed. We never saw a car. We never saw a horse. We never saw any way for this old, sickly, pale miner to have gotten into the park. There was no reason for him to be there. Any means of transportation would have been visible, if nearby. Worst of all, we estimated that this miner had to have been standing there, facing us, for at least an hour and a half, never moving. The eeriest part, by far, was how still he'd been the whole time, waiting, perhaps, to see us. Not once did that light flicker, as if he looked down for a moment or turned his head. He just stood there, staring down a road at a car full of idiots. Even when we were parked, headlights off and climbing on some rocks while balancing a beer in hand, he stared from miles away into the darkness, in our direction. We would have been no more than darkness to any human that far away without our headlights. We never saw him again. However, a few years ago, I decided to check to see if anybody had ever experienced something similar. I found one other story of a couple that saw him almost in the same place that we did, standing there staring down the road late at night. Then I found another story of some people who were camping out in the dark away from the standard campsites, and they saw the silhouette of what they thought was a miner walking by very close to them. I wish we would have stopped. Even if it would have been the most horrifying thing ever, I wish we would have stopped because I honestly believe there was a ghost of a dead miner out in that park. And I would know for sure today. I wouldn't have so many questions. There are plenty of unexplained things that I've encountered in my life, but the visage of the miner still sits fresh to this day. This happened almost 30 years ago. And I cannot forget about this person, if it was a person. I was spending the night at my boyfriend's mom's house, which I did almost every weekend while he was away at sea. Usually I slept on the couch in the family room, which was quite comfortable. Mrs. D always left a nightlight on in each room in case anybody needed to get up during the night. I awoke for some reason, and standing right before me 
was a fellow who looked like he was about to die of thirst. He was terribly sunburned, and his hair looked like it was sunbleached, almost like hay. He didn't say a word, but looked at me with such sorrow and hopelessness. He was dressed in worn clothes that I later found out were identical to some of the old 1860s photos of miners. This all happened in Santa Ana, California, just for some added context. His cotton shirt was collared and buttoned down, but very soiled. He had a cotton jacket of some sort as well. His boots were also of leather and very dirty and worn. His eyes were light and clear, but also very sad. His skin was creased and cracked looking. He didn't answer me when I asked if he was okay, so I said that I would go and wake Mrs. D. At this point, I genuinely didn't think he was a ghost. I thought he was alive and maybe an old friend of the family's. It would have been totally natural since this family had many friends and relatives that regularly came to visit. Anyway, I got up to go toward the hall where Mrs. D's bedroom door was. But when I turned to him as I passed, he was gone. There is absolutely no physical way that he could have gotten out of the house in that amount of time without me hearing it or noticing. He literally disappeared in front of my eyes. I never saw him after that, but to this day, I feel a deep sadness and compassion for the man who might have died trying to find some gold or silver after the gold rush was already over. The look of desperation on his face is one that I will never forget. This happened to me a few months ago. My two friends and I decided to take a trip to Los Angeles for fun. Keep in mind that we're from the East Coast and we don't know anybody in LA. On the last day of our vacation, we had to check out of the hotel by 11 a.m. The night before, we had gotten back to the hotel really late, so we ended up sleeping in. We knew that it would be difficult to get completely packed up and ready to leave by 11, so we decided to go to the front desk and request a late checkout of noon. We had done this at another hotel before with no issues, and this place wasn't really at capacity with guests, so we figured it was a reasonable request. I drew the short straw and was tasked with going down to the front desk. The elevator in this hotel was really old and quite small, and I found it to be very creepy. I also have mild claustrophobia. So I avoided the elevator and walked down the three flights of stairs instead. I asked the receptionist if we could have a late checkout and gave her the room number. She looked at me surprised and said, yes, we approved your late checkout already a few minutes ago. I was very confused and I asked her to elaborate. Apparently, a girl had come down a minute or two before me to ask for a late checkout for our room number, and then had walked out of the building. At this point, I figured that maybe one of my friends had, for whatever reason, decided to take the elevator down and ask before I did. I grumbled a bit at this because I had just walked down those stairs for no reason at all, and it didn't make any sense why they would ask me to go and then beat me to it. But I got back to the room, and to my surprise, both of my friends were there. One of them was taking a shower, and the other one was packing. It didn't look like either of them had left the room. So, I was kind of like, alright, which one of you's the prankster? They were pretty confused and asked me to explain. So I told them what the receptionist had said, and they were shocked. Neither of them had left the room, and it seemed too big of a coincidence that somebody would have the same request as us at the same time and just make the mistake of giving our room number. I have no idea who that girl was that made the request, 
They started joking that maybe it was me from another dimension or something. But yeah, whatever it was, the whole thing was kind of eerie. Although I've always held an interest in the paranormal, I've remained largely skeptical, favoring evidence-based explanations. I enjoy watching ghost hunting videos on YouTube and browsing through paranormal-themed subreddits. I have visited many supposedly haunted locations in the United States, such as the Omni Parker House in Boston, the Molly Brown House in Denver, the Whaley House in San Diego, Alcatraz at night, and the Winchester House on multiple occasions. Despite all this, I have never encountered any tangible evidence, leaving me to oscillate between curiosity and skepticism. That was until a few months ago. I had arranged a surprise party and weekend getaway for my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She wanted to go skiing, and so I organized the trip well in advance, inviting some of her closest friends. We ended up staying in a large Airbnb cabin in Tahoe, California, nestled amidst numerous similar cabins. It had enough rooms to accommodate all of us, a basement level with two beds, a room on the first floor, and three rooms upstairs. As it was her birthday, my girlfriend and I took the master bedroom upstairs. On the first night, we celebrated with drinks and games. Balloons that we'd set up in the living room kept popping at strange intervals. Someone suggested it was the heater vents causing the pops, but I was doubtful. Yet, I didn't want to stir up any unease, so I simply observed. Later that night, we could still hear balloons popping downstairs intermittently between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. On the second night, after a day out in the snow, the strange occurrences intensified. As we were all quite tired, we decided to call it a night earlier than before. It was then that I had my first eerie experience. It was so cold, so I went downstairs to adjust the thermostat. As I walked down the dark stairwell, I heard the floor creaking behind me, like someone was following me. The noises continued until I reached the thermostat, then stopped abruptly. I felt watched and called out to who I thought was my friend. Turning around, I found no one there. I was a bit unnerved, but kept it to myself and returned upstairs. About half an hour later, I decided to crank up the thermostat again. As I went downstairs, the only creaks I heard this time were from my own steps. However, as I was adjusting the thermostat, I heard the ball from the foosball table nearby roll across its surface and hit the side wall. Startled and unable to explain the phenomenon, I hurriedly returned to bed. On our drive back home the following morning, the topic of the popping balloons came up. Seeing an opportunity, I shared my experiences. As I finished, my girlfriend's friend, who had been staying across the hall from us, turned pale. She revealed that the previous night, she'd seen a shadowy figure at the foot of her bed. Upon waking her boyfriend, the figure had vanished. My girlfriend's cousin, who stayed in the next room, then admitted that she'd heard what sounded like breathing in her room. Alone, these incidents could perhaps be rationally explained, but when considered together, it was hard to deny that something unusual had been happening. This experience has turned me from a skeptic into a cautious believer. As for future encounters with the paranormal, I'd prefer if this was my first and last. This story is real. First off, my whole life, I've been a tad perceptive. Not psychic, but just aware. I can feel energy. That feeling you get when your body tells you to run or fight. 
that feeling in your stomach, hundreds of knots at once. A true scare. I got that today, at work. I had been working on a house in Palos Verdes, its beachfront country in Southern California. We're taking down the garage to the studs. I can tell you that whatever is in this house was furious about it. Banging, knocks, catching figures out of the corner of your vision, disembodied voices, and just that feeling. There were only two of us there. I'm pretty big, so I can tear stuff down pretty easily. The guy I'm working with was wearing wireless headphones, so he couldn't really hear the things that I did. Whenever I would hear something, I would say, you didn't hear that? He would just shake his head. I don't really know the history of this house. The family living there is currently living somewhere else while we remodel. It's just day two, and I'm already starting to get freaked out. We started finishing up, putting all the tools away, and then I hear it. It sounded like something terrible was happening to someone. It was just a horrible scream. Even my partner heard it this time. Now do you hear it? I asked. He gave me a stern look and said, Why do you think I brought headphones? We both started to laugh nervously. I started to wonder because this is daytime. Why are they so prevalent? And if any of you were like, Pics or it didn't happen, I get that. It sounds strange, but it did happen and I was really scared. I didn't want to make things worse. I was already worried that we were basically destroying the spirit's place. I think homes have memories. They remember energy. I could feel it. Look, believe what you want. I'm not here to change minds or force ideas onto you. I just wanted to tell this story. We still have a few days left on this project. I'm wondering if anybody else has had experiences like this on site. Day 2 Hey, I'm just posting this update. We came back. Last night I had nightmares about zombies eating me, so there was that. I don't know what that means, if anything, but it was horrifying and unusual. I dreaded coming to the house. We opened the locked door to access the rest of the remodel. Now, I always lock up super tight because I have a lot of tools, but when we walked in today, my stuff had been thrown everywhere. I was furious, thinking kids had gotten in and stolen my stuff. I looked around and there were two windows boarded up solid with thick plywood an inch thick, probably ten screws in each. Both were still boarded up solid. And then came the confusion, trying to figure out what was taken but nothing was missing. It was just all thrown around on the ground. It's funny, we didn't think to take a picture until after we had cleaned it all up. Today I will keep my eyes open for more activity. I just want to get done with this as soon as possible. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to buy alcohol. As we each threw in suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, which is a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 at night. First. We stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest, and then we began to head toward the lake. I began to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning, right behind the tree, I noticed a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat, a red coat, and this figure was extremely short. This sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. It looked a little bit like a doorway. I didn't really want to stick around. I played it cool as if nothing had happened and returned to my group. And of course, I never mentioned it to anyone. 
but I'm pretty sure I saw a gnome at Stowe Lake. I once booked an Airbnb cabin nestled in the mountains of the Gold Coast with a group of friends. This cabin, with a history stretching back 100 to 200 years, was the backdrop for a series of eerie, inexplicable incidents that happened over our weekend stay. From the moment we set foot inside, an uncomfortable vibe permeated the air. The ambience seemed to tinge our moods leaving us feeling unusually drained and edgy. The house was peppered with odd objects that only amplified the unsettling feel. Scissors pinned to walls, antiquated nails and farming tools repurposed as decor, unnerving masks, a heart pierced with nails mounted on the wall, rosary beads and more. The odd occurrences commenced on our first night as two of us lay downstairs, sleep eluding us due to an intense feeling of being watched, we were startled by a resounding crash. The door leading to a small foyer, which in turn led to the living area and rest of the house, had been hit with such a force that it trembled on its hinges. On the following night, as we relaxed on the deck overlooking the forest, we tried to mimic the loud bang to our friends, who had slept through the incident. After we had thumped the wall three times in demonstration, we heard three heavy thuds echoing from the balcony's corner, followed by the eerie sound of a spare chair being dragged. Feeling increasingly unsafe, we opted to consolidate our sleeping arrangements, moving a mattress into a single room so we could stick together. When three of us were in the room, a window slammed shut with a loud bang. In the early hours of the night, as everyone slept soundly, I found myself awake at 3 a.m. I noticed a shadow moving across the same window that had earlier shut so abruptly, and I started recording it. In the video, a white figure entered and exited the frame, which I didn't notice until the next day. It was a clearly visible face, the final and most terrifying event happened just as dawn broke. I woke up to find a man standing at the foot of the bed. He was adorned in traditional indigenous attire, wearing a skirt and sash in red, black, and white, and brandishing a spear. His face was drawn into a severe scowl. In my initial panic, I assumed it was one of the Airbnb owners, and I shook my friend awake. She saw no one, and when I turned to look again, the figure had vanished. Overwhelmed, I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, and I asked my friend to leave the place early with me. Strangely, as soon as we were about a kilometer away from the cabin, I felt my normal self again. My mother married an older man about nine years ago, whose previous wife had died from cancer several years beforehand. We moved into his home, and I was about 13 years old at the time. I had always felt an odd feeling in this home, as my room was in the basement. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here, besides the odd being watched feeling that I would always experience in that home. My mom had hired my biological father, who I'm close to, to remodel the downstairs bathroom in my stepdad's home. My dad told me he had several of his tools moved around while he was alone working at the place. My dad finished the job and never returned. Fast forward to when my stepdad, mom, and I moved to Washington State. He and my mother began to have a lot of issues and were arguing frequently. 
I won't go into it, but I came to learn that my stepfather had a certain type of addiction that led him to having many women in our home that were not his wife, many of whom were professionals in this trade and were younger than his own 30-year-old children. I found this very concerning for a number of reasons, and there are some other details that, like I said, I won't go into. But let's just say it was evident that this guy had some very serious issues. He really gave me the creeps. I told my mother, and she was dismissive of it. But she gave off the vibe that I wasn't telling her anything she didn't already know. I wanted to get away from him and everything he was doing. And he bought a vacation home in western Arizona. I was 18 at the time, and I moved down there and I was living on my own. He had most of his items and furniture from his old home in this house that I was staying at alone in Arizona. A couple of weeks go by and I'm lying in my bed in my room. I heard footsteps that sounded like somebody wearing slippers, scuffling along the tile floor in the living room. I was totally scared after that and I couldn't sleep. About a week after this, the hall bathroom shower was having problems so I used the master bathroom shower. I had an awful feeling that I was being watched in the master bath as well as the master bedroom and the closet. It was such a bad feeling that I no longer went into that bedroom and I was frightened to even be on that side of the house. When I was done showering, I was near running through the bathroom and bedroom, shutting the door behind me. The same week, I was playing computer games in the office and the desk was facing the living room. I was sitting in my chair, and I just felt like I was being watched again. I felt something touch my right shoulder. I jumped and looked behind me, but nothing was there. I was pretty spooked, but I sat back down and continued with my game. Then, maybe an hour after feeling something touch my shoulder, while still playing my game, I suddenly heard a very loud slam near the side of the house where the master bedroom is. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds after the slam, I heard several knocks along the wall on the same side of the house. I was frozen in fear. I stood up at my desk and all I could do was let out a scream. I called my mother hysterical and explained to her what had happened. Two days later, she drove over a thousand miles to come get me and take me back home. When I returned home, I found out that she was divorcing my stepdad, sending him to live in the house in Arizona that I had just come from. After he was gone, I didn't experience much in my mom's house, beside that feeling of being watched. I opted to stay upstairs. It was a split-level home with the living room and kitchen upstairs and my bedroom downstairs. I was upstairs in the living room when my mom's dog stood at the top of the stairs, staring downward at the base of the stairs, growling, frozen still. Soon after that, my mother sold the house and I moved out of state, and I've never experienced anything like that since. I'm still wondering if there are any explanations as to what might have occurred. I believe this might have been paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything like this since, nor had I ever experienced anything until living in the same home that my mom's ex-husband lives in. So, my partner and I have been dating for about a year and a half. This February, I was given tickets as a birthday gift to finally visit him. I live in Scotland and he lives in Arizona. Experience number one. So I spent the middle of February over in Arizona visiting my partner. While we're both interested in the paranormal, I believe in it all, having had multiple experiences. Whereas he tends to just humor me not believing much of it himself. He's never mentioned anything odd happening in his apartment, but I saw, I heard, and I felt small things the first couple of days I was there. One morning in particular, at about four in the morning, 
I was on the sofa playing on my phone, jet lag, you know, when I looked up and saw a figure standing over him as he slept. It was similar to a shadow person phenomenon. It was just dark, humanoid shaped, but it felt nasty. When I saw it, it turned, almost as though it was startled to see somebody else in the room, never mind somebody who could also see it. It did a sort of double take and then disappeared, but the room felt off. I performed a cleansing ritual that I have come to rely on when negative energies are bothering me. For the remainder of my trip, the apartment felt light and airy, with the exception of later that day when I was taking a nap. I felt what I thought was my partner standing over me, watching me sleep. I opened my eyes and nobody was there, but I felt that negative presence over me, as though it was trying to work out who I was and why I was there. It was told in very clear terms that it was not welcome, whether I was there or not, and it cleared out. No more issues, so that was fine by me. Experience number two. My partner's friends, another couple, really helped in making me feel welcome, and the four of us went out on road trips a couple of times, once to Jerome and another to a recreation spot by a lake. I felt a little funny any time we were driving around or near the reservations, as though the native spirits were very much aware of us traveling through their land. Nothing felt bad, just a sort of curiosity but one instance in particular sticks out. While driving toward Phoenix, after a day at a lake, we were all chatting away in the car when we got into reservation territory. I got the not alone feeling again, but still it was curious, though this time it was more intense. There was a lull in the conversation and I was just admiring the landscape as the sun was going down when in the middle of the center embankment on the road, there was a figure that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. I know it was male, and I know he was a Native American. Nothing felt wrong, but when I asked if anybody else had seen him, they all said no, despite the fact that, as far as I was concerned, you couldn't miss him. He was old, tall, and completely in white, clothes and hair and everything with an aura of hazy light around him. He simply stood, watching over the road. I don't know who he was, but it felt like he was watching over the people traveling through his land. It was comforting. I don't really know why I'm telling this story, other than the fact that I thought maybe a lighter story would be better to put with a spooky one at the beginning. In any case, I hope you enjoyed these stories. And if you've had any similar experiences in Arizona, let me know. In the fall of August 2013, I was set to begin my first semester at Arizona State University in Tempe and I had to attend an orientation in the middle of campus. After making the 30 minute drive earlier than anticipated, my grandma pulled into the parking lot of the First United Methodist Church where we exchanged conversation for about 15 minutes just to kill time. There was a gardener in front of us tending the flowers and only one black sedan parked directly next to us that I hadn't noticed earlier when we pulled in. As we unceremoniously prepared to get out of the car, something caught my grandma's eye in her periphery as she reached for her seatbelt button in the direction of my passenger seat. She quickly gasped, placing her right hand on her chest as she chuckled and then quipped, wow, I thought I saw a ghost. Looking directly at her without turning as she let out another nervous chuckle, I asked her what she was talking about. The parking lot at this point was dead silent, and the gardener was busy tending the flowers in the building opposite of the Methodist Church. Not expecting much, I slowly and nervously turned to my right, where a four-door black sedan was parked to the right of us, only to come in direct eye contact 
with what seemed to be a woman of Asian heritage with a bob haircut, pinstripe suit business attire, staring at us for no discernible reason. With the dead stare they were giving us, it could be assumed that they had been staring for longer than we had noticed them. What made this individual terrifying was the lack of life in their eyes. I only looked for what felt like five seconds, but I could feel that glassy, uncanny valley, lights are on but no one's home look. It's one like a corpse might have before their eyes were closed. The color of this entity's skin was a pale color that I could only associate again with a corpse at the time. Their mouth slowly developed into one of the most unsettling half-smiles I've ever seen, as their dead eyes looked at me and my grandma, unwavering. In this deafening silence, similar to a panic attack or a fight-or-flight feeling, my grandma and I turned back to each other, chuckled uncomfortably, and slowly got out of the car refusing to look at the terrifying entity or person in the car next to us. While my grandma claims she forgot about this incident, she believes it probably did happen when I bring it up to her. If anyone can help me with identifying this type of entity, or if you've had any experience with something similar, let me know. I know that certain areas of the Tempe campus are haunted. I couldn't find any information on an incident like this, though. In 2013, I worked as a baker in a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It was a super old building and had a reputation for being haunted. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, but also curious. I spent a week or so inquiring fellow co-workers about their experiences. I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4 a.m., unable to get the lights to work until the 5 a.m. barista arrived. Other stories included things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience, and I felt energetically open to inviting something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other coworkers to dust the air ducts. We were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks, a tall portable shelving unit. It was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There was no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how that bottle had managed to get on top of the tarp that I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled, and so were my co-workers. However, I wasn't convinced that it was a ghost. The next night, I was scheduled and I told everybody about my experience. Eventually, it was just me and one other co-worker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room. I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal stuff and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter, I bent over to get a trash bag out of a cabinet beneath the sink when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice, but a combination of a growl and spoken words. It had texture to it. I have never heard anything like it before. It was like somebody speaking from another dimension. Almost staticky. I immediately froze and spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I had just heard. I knew it wasn't the song playing on the radio because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my coworker behind me. 
But after finding no other explanation, I turned around and faced her and said, what was that noise? My coworker looked at me and said, I thought that was you. We were both frozen in disbelief. At the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. After a couple of seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on the top of the espresso bar moving, and we looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple of inches into the air, wiggled a little bit from side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm what we had just seen, and then we ran to the bathroom on the side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was just so utterly in awe of what had just happened. I remember saying out loud something like, okay, I get it, I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever, but to this day, the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I have ever witnessed. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the boys and girls club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10 minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart, but I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the board settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated. The same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. 
It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. In that digital camera my twin was playing around with, there was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk, filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, 
My mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. The weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil, like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. 13 and 3. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. So this is a true story that happened to me, which I'm weary to share, as there have been many times where I've opened up only to be met with ridicule. But I hope you take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off of Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there, and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings. Bryce, the residence hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two, I'll share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was me, my girlfriend, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with an anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left and then a quick right and you're in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand and my camera in the right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom and shined the light that way. 
nothing. I moved the camera and light, thought I saw it again and shined it back, nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white, illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of just two frames, she's behind the door halfway, and in the next frame, she's gone. My heart felt like ice water had run through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger one, maybe ten, hair parted in the middle, an unusually large forehead, and was deformed in some way. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. This is where it gets even weirder, though. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that windows grow back, and if you do any damage to them, spirits will follow you home. I broke a window on accident. I was laying in bed one night at about 3 to 4 a.m. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was, and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing, tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless, as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of maybe 20 seconds. Once it covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. I cringed tightly, and for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped, and the whole incident left me on the verge of tears. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to legend, it makes sense. I used to live in this old house with my grandparents out in the middle of nowhere in the south of Alabama. The closest town was maybe 30 to 40 minutes drive away. The land we lived on was my pop's family land, and it was passed down through many generations. I was in middle school when all of this took place. I have always had problems sleeping at night, so my grandparents let me stay up at night. This one night, I remember to this day, because my best friend, who is basically my sister, was with me at the time. We were in the second living room, what I call the family room, and we were just having fun talking, girl sleepover type stuff. The family room connected to the dining room. We had the windows open because it was a hot summer night in this old house that didn't have air. My friend and I were playing, and out of nowhere, I felt this unknown energy. For some reason, everything went dead silent. I looked at the open window, and I saw the curtain blowing. I thought it was the wind, but I was so wrong. The wind wasn't blowing, not at this time. None of the other curtains were billowing. Out of nowhere, I see the silhouette of a woman. The description I would give of her would be like a 1950s housewife, with her dress and straight hair but the end curled out. I looked at her for so long, trying to wrap my brain around what was going on. I was a little scared of her, but I didn't feel like I was in danger. She disappeared, and when she did, the curtain quit blowing and everything went back to normal. I thought I was crazy, but then my friend looked at me and said, you saw that too, right? I nodded yes. Both she and I went to the window to see if anybody was out there and to see if the wind was blowing, but no to both. What really freaked us out was how far out in the middle of nowhere we were. There's no reason that anybody else would even be out there. And after that, I have never seen her again.
When I was a kid, I lived in Alabama, way out in the country. My best friend at the time lived about a mile away, and my older brother and I would go over there daily during the summer. Near his property is a dead forest. All the trees are there, but they never have any leaves. It's pretty darn creepy to begin with. Sometimes we played in there, but we never went very far. One day, my brother and my friend, let's call him Sam, wandered off while I was messing with a turtle, and they disappeared. Once I was done playing with the turtle, not hurting it or anything, I went around the property looking for them, until I thought I saw one of them head into the woods. By this time, it was late afternoon and getting darker. I ran to the woods, but I couldn't see them. Then I heard what sounded like them talking, deeper in. I followed the voices, and they kept seeming farther and farther away, as though I should have been getting closer. And then, they stopped. And suddenly, I felt really scared. At that moment, I realized that the sun had already set, and it was starting to get very dark. So I ran all the way back to Sam's house. My older brother and Sam were playing Nintendo in his room, and thought that I was still in the backyard playing with the turtle. I never did figure out what I was chasing in those creepy woods, but I'm kind of glad that I never did. Back when I was 18 or 19, I had decided to go to church. It was a church in Cherokee, Alabama, and I went with my once friend, we'll call him Joel, and his family. I had gone in, and Joel and I were directed to the basement with all of the other people who were under 20 to do something. Some kind of class, maybe. I forget what it was. But maybe five to seven minutes in that basement, I get the most blinding headache and excuse myself outside to get some air. I wait for everybody to get done and we head back to where Joel and his parents lived. The whole ride, this headache is just not going away. I stayed at their house maybe an hour or two while this headache gets worse and worse. I decide to attempt to drive myself home to Crooked Oak. As I'm driving, the headache becomes all but blinding and halfway home, in the night, on this dark road, I stop at this tiny little backwoods church. The pain is so immense I can't focus on anything, at which point I was pretty much wishing to be struck dead just to escape it. I stumbled out of my Jeep, and I landed on the first bit of grass I could find, and I pretty much passed clear out. After a good stretch of time, the pain left me, I went to drag myself to the jeep, and with my senses returned, I realized that I was laying on someone's old grave. I don't know why it helped, and of course I didn't do it intentionally, but there it is. To this day, I refuse to go near that church. I don't know what's in that basement, but I don't want to encounter it again. This is a true story that happened to me, which I am weary to share, as there have been many times where I have opened up about this, only to be met with ridicule. I hope you'll take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off Highway 82 in Alabama, called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends, like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings, Bryce, the residential hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. 
I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two I will share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was my girlfriend, me, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, then a quick right, and you're in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand and the camera in my right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left, at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and the light, thought I saw it again and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction, over the course of two frames, she is half behind the door, and in the next frame she's gone. My heart felt like an ice cube ran through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody that I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger girl, maybe younger than 10, hair parted in the middle, unusually large forehead, and some apparent deformation or disorder. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. I know, I know, but it's the truth. This is where it gets weirder. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that the windows grow back. If you do any damage to them, they'll just grow back over and spirits will follow you home. Well, I broke a window. I was laying in bed one night at about three or four in the morning. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of about 20 seconds. Once it fully covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. It gave me shivers. And for some reason, I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped and it left me on the verge of tears. I don't know what possessed me to say that, but it was really emotional and terrifying. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to the legend, it makes sense. Either way, it's the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. This started a few years ago, and so far, there's been no explanation of the things that keep occurring. I live in the southern United States near a national park in a fairly rural area. So our first guess was that this had to be some sort of wildlife, something that was scaring us for no reason other than us getting into our own heads. However, after a ton of internal explanations, we finally came to the conclusion that we had none. The first thing that occurred was fairly brief. It was shortly after the death of my uncle, who was fairly close to us before he passed. He was a veteran, and while in the army, he had volunteered to have shock treatments that altered his personality greatly. This had occurred during the Vietnam era while he was stationed in Germany. My grandmother was in the bathroom and I was in my room just playing a game. When out of the blue, the wall sounded as if somebody was beating on it, 
trying to get our attention. Three loud knocks, then nothing. We were worried that something had happened to our neighbor, an elderly woman, and that she needed our help. But after we went outside to check, there was nobody there. Fast forward a few months, we started hearing footsteps on the roof. They started out light and easily explainable, something along the lines of a cat walking on the roof. We had seen it happening a few times, so we thought nothing of it, until they started to get a bit heavier. Eventually, it sounded like something that weighed a lot more than a cat, even more than I did, was sprinting across the roof every night from one end of the house to the other. Things got worse after that. We started to find dead animals around the property. And while some of it could easily be explained as roadkill, we do have a lot of problems with people speeding due to a lack of police presence in the area. There was also a ton of random things that we would find dead nearby. We would find crows and ravens laying in our backyard, the occasional snake, and one time, we found a deer that apparently walked onto our property and dropped dead. There was not a single sign of a wound or anything when we found it. We started to hear things inside the house soon after, seeing things out of the corner of our eyes that would vanish before we could turn to get a good look at it. Scratching mainly, we've put rat traps and every kind of poison we could think of in our walls but there's no sign of vermin. We would hear whispers at night, like somebody was trying to talk to us. We're rational people. We checked to see if there were any cracks in the windows or door frames that could make the wind blow in and sound strange. But from everything that we've checked, there doesn't seem to be any opening that could make that noise. One of my old friends, who before this story was as skeptical as I was, was sitting in my living room playing something on our PlayStation when he thought he saw somebody walk past the window. It doesn't sound too scary, right? Well, no, until you consider that my windows are nearly 10 feet off the ground. Our house is raised to allow water to pass underneath it to prevent any water damage. And the place that he claims to have seen the man wasn't near any stairs. He came to visit another time about a month later. We were sitting and talking to one another when he said that he needed to use the bathroom and he left to do his business. He goes and when he comes back, he's pale white and terrified. When I asked him what was wrong, he was evasive. So we just got in the car and drove down to Sonic to grab some food and talk. That's when he told me that he saw somebody staring at him from my room as he walked back smiling at him, and that it had yellow eyes. He doesn't come around anymore. At least he doesn't stay after nightfall. I don't know if what he claims is true or not, but it still scares me to think about just how scared he was. He's just not the type, so I'm inclined to believe. I've tried cleansing the house with sage. We've got a crucifix in every room now. Near the front door, we have three. We've even duct taped the back door shut and we have it locked to be absolutely certain that nothing can get in. We just don't have any explanation. I've always been a believer in the paranormal, but I've also been a skeptic. I'm not one to jump to paranormal conclusions right away. With that said, this event messed me up, and it still keeps me up at night to this day. This happened almost a year ago. My girlfriend and I visited her parents' house, which was her old home in Alabama, specifically in Crenshaw County. For those that don't know, that's basically right in the middle of nowhere. The boonies, the sticks. Being from a large city myself in Southern California, I'm completely out of my element. I've already visited her parents once before with her. She has always told me that her house was haunted, 
and that the woods were sketchy at night. But when I visited the first time with her, nothing happened whatsoever. So I chalked it up as some tall tale to creep me out. You know, freak out the city boy. That is, until we visited her parents the second time. Her father works in Montgomery for the weekdays, so he's gone a lot, and her mother had to be in Atlanta for three days due to a job. We were home alone for those three days, unless you want to count her cats as well. The one-story house is in the middle of absolutely nowhere, with the nearest house well down the road from us. One of those nights around midnight, I'm sitting in bed with her completely asleep. I'm scrolling through Facebook and my Twitter and YouTube notifications when I began hearing what sounded like my girlfriend's voice. I turned to look at her to see if she was sleep talking. Nothing. She's quiet. I continue going through my notifications for a bit and I hear her again. But this time it doesn't sound like it's coming from her. It sounds like it's coming from outside, behind the bedroom wall, toward the same direction as my girlfriend, but much louder and echoey. I get up and I look around to see if there's a TV on or if the cats are making noises, even though the TVs aren't in the direction that I heard the voice coming from. But nothing. The TVs are off and the cats are asleep or just lazing around. I even checked her phone, which was on the nightstand, to my right, in case it was playing audio or something, but it was just charging. I go back to bed with her and I continue going about my business, but this time I'm kind of looking out for the voice. This time I hear it again, but much clearer and louder, and it sounds exactly like my girlfriend's voice. It was for sure coming from outside this time. I know this because she was sleeping on my left, and toward my left is also the wall. On the other side of that is a clearing, and it's all dense woods. After this, I focused all of my attention to the loud voice to see if I would hear it again, and I'm looking at her to make sure that it's not her. This is the part where I internally started saying, I am not finding out what you are. I have seen way too many movies and YouTube videos and I'm not about to go out there and find out. I heard the voice one more time, yet this time it didn't sound closer, but just a little farther, which leads me to believe that it's something physically moving around the clearing bordering the woods. The scariest thing about the voice that really had me freaking out is that it was still clear enough that I started making out human speech, but it was messed up. Like it was speaking in phrases using my girlfriend's voice, but none of the words were making sense. It's almost like it was trying to speak English, but it was reversed. At that point, I did one final check around the interior of the house to see if all the doors were locked. My rational mind was thinking it was probably just some lost person in the woods, definitely not a skinwalker or whatever else. I made sure the curtains were closed and I just went to bed. I told my girlfriend the very next morning and she seemed rightfully freaked out, but we ended up just cracking jokes about it to cope. I posted this experience to Facebook about a week after and a lot of my friends threw around the thought that it could very well have been something paranormal. A friend of my girlfriend's who studies cryptozoology as a hobby asked me a ton of questions relating to the incident and basically flat out said, yeah, that's a Wendigo. I don't know how credible of an opinion that would be. I'm inching into believing it though, because what I heard that night was exactly my girlfriend's voice. I swear I could make out my name in that garbled speech. I'm not too sure on that much, but it was like it was luring me into the woods. Whatever it was, it got my girlfriend's voice, pitch, tone, patterns, everything, just right enough for me to listen, but not enough to get me to go out there with it. Of course, I was looking at her, so I knew it wasn't her. Who knows what I might have done, I guess, if she hadn't been in the room with me. I haven't been back since, but we are planning to go back in October and go to Disney World with her family. 
I'm hoping that whatever it was isn't there anymore. This happened when I was little, and I recently remembered it when talking to my parents this weekend about strange things we did as a kid. They told me that this one spoils them to this day, and after talking, I actually have one or two vague memories of it. This story took place when my family and I still lived in a small neighborhood in Alabama. We had moved into a small house that had a backyard, which connected to a small forest. I believe I was six at the time, and my younger brother had just been born. My parents got the house for less than expected, and were excited to start a new life in this quiet neighborhood. The first night at the house, my parents said they heard scratching coming from somewhere in the house. My dad said that he brushed it off as being an animal from the forest nearby, or maybe a mouse, and went back to sleep. It continued for several nights though, and my dad eventually grew tired of it. One night, he decided to look and see what was causing the scratching noise. He found me kneeling at and scratching the door that led to the basement. He tried talking to me, but I would just continue to scratch. My dad watched me for a minute before I finally stopped scratching and walked back to my room. The next morning, he asked me about why I was up and according to him, I didn't know what he was talking about. My parents took me to the doctor, and they told them that the most logical cause was that I was having night terrors, since it appeared to occur nightly. My parents accepted this as an answer, for a while. The thing was, I would only have night terrors in that specific house. Whenever we would spend the night at my grandparents, or I would have a sleepover at my friend's house, I never had these night terrors. And then there came one part that I somehow remember. It happened when I was a little older, around 9 or 10. I remember waking up in the hallway where the basement door was. I didn't remember getting up, and I was confused as to how I got there. I remember turning my head to see what looked like an elderly man. He had a kind of yellowish glow to him, and he was staring right at me. I don't remember feeling threatened by him though. I think I might have fallen asleep again, because the next thing I remember is waking up in the hallway again, but this time it was morning. After the night where I saw the old man, my parents said my night terrors stopped. We moved out of that house several years later, when I was getting ready to go into the third grade. My parents brought up this story because they told me that recently, one of our old neighbors had done some research on the house. What they found out was that an old man had unalived himself in the basement of that house years before my family had moved in. Our neighbor didn't tell them the full story over what led to that, but my parents believe that that might have been the old man that I saw that night. I'm now 20 years old and I'm enrolled in college. Neither I nor my parents have been back to that house since we moved out of it. In a way, I kind of want to visit, just one last time, to see if maybe I could find out about the old man. I'm just really curious about him. Either way, it was an experience I doubt my parents will forget anytime soon. My husband's parents live in a tiny town in Alabama. They've lived there a long time. We went to visit them a few years back, and we were excited to get out of town for a bit, see some different scenery. His sister was graduating college, and we were going to celebrate. She is also an avid ghost hunter and believer. So when I told her about some of my experiences, she was excited to take me to some of the haunted locations around town cemeteries, old abandoned houses, 
and even a Hell's Gate, which we didn't actually end up going to, as I told her I had a bad feeling and refused. We drove around almost all night, just looking at different locations and talking about the history of the town. A lot of residual energy and weird feelings as we went to all these different places. We came to a cemetery in a new portion of town. Fancy houses surrounded it on three sides only. On the third side was a small canyon area of land. Nothing really felt off. The cemetery was new and didn't have many headstones yet. It was fenced off with ornate wrought iron fencing. We didn't see anything lurking, no shadows darting from tree to tree or headstone to headstone. It was just there. After walking around to the open side, where there were no houses, I asked his sister, let's call her Beth, how come there were no houses on this one side? She shrugged and said that they had stopped building months ago, even though this was supposed to be a new subdivision. They had purchased all this land and probably needed to figure out a way to build upon it since it was very canyon-like. We decided to get a closer look at the canyon area, although we couldn't see much since it was dark and our only lights were the street lights. We had walked far enough to be outside of what they illuminated. Far off in the distance, I saw what looked like a campfire. I pointed it out, but no one else saw it. Beth began to have a sinking feeling, and before she could say anything, I started getting a massive headache. I heard pounding like drums. I got flashes of images in my head of Native Americans dancing around a big fire. The night sky seemed blacker and darker than it had before. Beth grabbed my arms and said we needed to leave. My husband was already halfway back to the car. As I turned my back to the canyon, it was almost as though I had a twinge of fear run up my spine and a shiver, like I was somewhere we weren't supposed to be. So we ran back to the car. As we drove away, I could feel a black mass following our car as we drove the winding streets back to the main road. It felt big and foreboding, like it was flying behind us. I started to panic and I felt my throat and chest tighten. Once we crossed the main road, it was almost like it couldn't follow us past that point, but I could feel it, watching us as we continued back to his parents' house. I asked Beth if she had seen anything, but she refused to talk about it. None of us slept that night, and my headache didn't subside until morning. I did some research on the area the next day and found that it was home to the Chickasaw Indian tribe back in the day. I have Blackfoot and Choctaw blood and later thought that maybe, since I was a neighboring tribe, they didn't want me there. Regardless, we have never spoken of the incident since. In the summer of 2008, when I was 13, my encounters with the unexplained began. I spent my days at home, alone, and everything was normal, until our dogs kept ending up outside. Then things escalated. I began hearing unexplained sounds in the house, like footsteps pacing the hallway and faint whispers. My mom confirmed she heard them too, but warned me not to tell my religious stepdad. The rest of that year went by without incident, but 2010 marked the escalation of paranormal activity. That year, my twin sister and her friend captured a strange smoky presence in a photo. My mom even heard a voice whisper, ouch, in her ear. But the most extreme occurrences were yet to come, and they happened to me alone. My first brush with sleep paralysis was relatively calm, but a series of inexplicable events followed. All in a row, in one event, a cup in my room tipped over on its own, a bird hit my window, my light bulb exploded, and the cup fell again. I was spooked, 
but I tried to brush it off. The final and most haunting incident occurred a week later during my second episode of sleep paralysis. As I lay immobilized, my room darkened, and then it turned blood red. A robed figure appeared in my doorway, its eyes piercing into me, radiating evil. The numbers 13 and 3 appeared, and then the paralysis ended. Later at church, we read Psalm 13.3. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. I was chilled to the core, and to this day nothing has disturbed me more than that shadowy figure and those words. These events have left a lasting impact, and although I've had some mild paranormal experiences since then, nothing compares to the terror of that year. Even after losing my faith, the mystery of what I saw and felt still lingers. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves of his slaves. Now, in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields, basically a cleared out area where there are no trees, just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is like a tree house that you sit in to wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on Greenfield One, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normal enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes, and my dad tells me that he's going to go for a short walk to see if maybe he can see any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm about 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before, and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was pretty light out. I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things started to get strange. I sat there for an eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing, because he was still not back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him, or he had gotten lost. But he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot. But the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight and dusk hour of the day in, because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out on the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then, a girl 
floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I wanted my dad back. A short time passed and now it's pitch dark and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was turning into panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch dark woods where I had just seen a ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted like he hadn't been gone at all. I asked him where the heck he'd gone, and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. The timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was unlike him to leave me alone for that long. But he was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. Was the ghost I saw an old slave or slave owner buried in the woods behind me? Something else entirely? Did my dad go through some time warp where time sped up? I don't know. I never went hunting there again though, and I don't plan on ever going back. In Ivory Coast, West Africa, my friends and I walked into the biggest hotel and palace in the capital at 3 p.m. And it was completely empty and silent. There were no cars, no taxis outside, no customers, no employees. This hotel is an enormous complex with a mall, dozens of shopping stores, pools, tennis courts, restaurants, conference rooms, it's always busy, 24-7. I needed to withdraw money from the ATM, and all the doors were open, so I walked inside. It was the eeriest experience of my entire life. It was like the place had been abandoned. But why the open doors? And everything was okay. It was clean. Just all the people were missing. There were no lights on just the emergency lights. But since all the doors were open, the natural light was shining through. So at least it wasn't too dark. The only noise came from my steps on the marble and there wasn't even an echo. My heart was pounding in my chest because the situation just didn't make any sense. At one point, I saw some light on in a store about 50 meters away from me with people inside and I breathed a sigh of relief. But once I arrived in front of the store, I noticed that I couldn't really distinguish the shapes or the faces of the people, even though it was clear glass. They were fuzzy for lack of a better word. Panic started to kick in but I still needed that money, so I hurried to the ATM that was closest. I was afraid the ATM would be dead, but surprisingly, it was functional. I withdrew the money and ran out of the hotel using the first exit I found. Still, no one in sight. After walking a few meters, I exited on another street, and suddenly everything got noisy again. It was full of people and activity. I came back later to the hotel on another day and it was totally back to normal. It's been almost 20 years since this happened, but I will never forget this experience. I still think about it from time to time and every time I return and I walk past it, it still makes me feel weird.
In 2012, I found myself stationed in North Kandahar, standing guard one night just shy of midnight. My attention was drawn to some unexpected movement in a nearby rubbish heap. Initially, it seemed to be just a dog rummaging around, but to my astonishment, it rose on its hind legs and walked away nonchalantly in a disturbingly human manner. Fear gripped me. Upon inquiring from the local villagers, we were told that it was a yeti, part of a family that had resided in a nearby cave. They ominously shared how these creatures occasionally kidnapped and ate villagers. The chill that ran down my spine at this translation was palpable, and it was clear I wasn't the only one affected. This spectacle was witnessed by everyone in our combat outpost, or COP, and it earned the humorous moniker, Man Bear Pig. Although we all laughed it off, when the opportunity arose to track the creature, no volunteers stepped forward. One midnight, as I was about to drift off to sleep on my cot, the crackle of gunfire from the Afghan army side of the camp startled me awake. Accompanied by the master sergeant, we quickly armed ourselves and went to investigate the commotion. The Afghani soldiers explained they had spotted the Yeti and opened fire, but it had managed to escape. The master sergeant turned to me and proposed, with a jovial glint in his eye, you want to rally the troops and hunt this creature down? We could become famous. I simply shook my head in silent refusal. We shared a chuckle and retreated back to our cots, leaving the Yeti to its nightly escapades.